two, one. Good morning. My name is Kenyon McDuffie and I am a member for Ward 5 and chair of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. Today is Wednesday, June 3rd, 2021, and we're convening this hearing virtually via Zoom. The time is 9.03 a.m. and I'm calling to order this budget oversight hearing of the committee. Today marks the first of the committee's budget oversight hearings for the fiscal year 2022 budget season. Uh, this is the second time the council will consider a budget under pandemic conditions. We convened last year's budget process in the shadow of a global pandemic that ravaged our nation and upended the lives of residents across the District of Columbia. Since the first case of the coronavirus was detected in the United States in January of 2020, the disease has infected almost 33 million and killed over 585,000 Americans, including 1,135 um, 1, Washingtonians. In addition to the costs in life and health that we've suffered, COVID-19 also impacted our local economy. Economic disruptions, business closures, and unprecedented levels of unemployment have caused many individuals to turn to unemployment and businesses to experience serious financial instability or permanent closure. Unsurprisingly, systemic racism and economic insecurity, which predate this public health emergency, put low income individuals and communities of color at greater risk of exposure to both the harmful physical and mental health consequences, as well as the adverse economic consequences of the coronavirus. Low income and communities of color have not only faced higher rates of infection, hospitalization and death, but also higher rates of unemployment and lack of access to necessities like food, housing and healthcare. We are in a different place this year as we begin to consider the fiscal year 2022 budget. The effects of COVID-19 continue to be felt throughout the district to be sure, we we're also beginning to find our way out from the shadow of this pandemic. Improved local revenue projections and an unprecedented level of federal funds will help us navigate our way to reopening through recovery and ultimately toward a better, more equitable DC. But only if we are intentional about making transformational investments in communities that were underserved prior to the pandemic and have disproportionately suffered because of it. The fiscal year 2022 proposed budget is $17.5 billion which is a 3.9% increase over the current budget. The local portion of the budget is $9.1 billion, an increase of 4.9% over current levels with most of that growth coming from federal funds that must be spent over the next four years. We cannot squander this opportunity. We must ensure that the fiscal year 2022 budget makes smart, targeted investments to make our residents better, our community stronger, and to ensure that the future economic growth of our city is more inclusive. So I welcome your insights on how this committee and the council at large can best serve you, the residents and businesses that call the district home. How can we ensure this budget provides meaningful assistance that will enable you, your families and your businesses to navigate the recovery? What investments can we make to support our workers and businesses hardest hit by this pandemic? What resources are needed to build an inclusive economy that ensures that we do not simply return to normal? I'm looking forward to discussing this with you all how we can use this budget process to chip away at the district's racial wealth gap and build a stronger, more economically inclusive city for all of us. Thank you for being here today. And for today's budget oversight here, we're gonna hear testimony uh, only from public witnesses on the following agencies. Events DC, the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, DC Lottery and Charitable Games, the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, the Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking, the Department of Small and Local Business Development, the Public Service Commission, the Office of the People's Council, and the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration. As a reminder, this hearing is reserved only for public witnesses. Public witnesses will all have three minutes to testify. Council members will have three minutes for opening statements and five minutes for uh, questioning to public witnesses. I ask that all participants please mute their microphones when they are not speaking. First, we're gonna hear testimony about Events DC. Events DC is the official convention and sports authority and the premier host of conventions, sports, entertainment, and cultural events in the District of Columbia. Events DC owns and manages some of the most visited venues in the city, including the Walter E. Washington Convention Center, the Fields, Festival Grounds, and Skate Park at RFK Campus, National Park, and others. The agency works to drive investment and growth in the district's hospitality and tourism industry which has been significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
With that, I'm gonna call up our first panel of public witnesses. And again, I ask that participants please mute their microphones when you are not speaking. Uh, first witness uh, we're gonna hear from is Kavi Hollinger, who's the president and CEO of the Restaurant Association in Metropolitan Washington. Elizabeth Falcon, executive director, DC Jobs with Justice. Angela Franco, president and CEO of the DC Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Donnie Carford, I also see, who's a senior policy analyst with the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Uh, let's start with let's start with those four, and I'll, I'll just call witnesses as staff uh, add them into the panel. Uh, good morning to each of you. I, I really appreciate you joining us, being the first panel uh, for this uh, oversight hearing. Uh, we're going to begin with Kathy Hollinger. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie, Council members, and staff. My name is Kathy Hollinger. I'm the president and CEO of the Restaurant Association, Metropolitan Washington. I am here today in support of Events DC, which under the leadership of its CEO, Greg O'Dell, is a key anchor in the district's hospitality community as they build, create, and host premier events and experiences that enhance the lives and jobs across all wards. REMW and Events DC have been key marketing partners for nearly eight years, fostering a mutually beneficial cross-promotional partnership where both, both organizations align locally and regionally in positioning Washington, D.C. as a premier dining and hospitality destination. We also create customized programming and activations throughout the year designed to push diners stakeholders and influencers to our local small business community of restaurants. This symbiotic partnership is truly full circle as the local marketing that is part of our collaboration drives traffic to the restaurants, bolsters tax dollars to the district and directly impacts the success of both Events DC as an organization and REMW. More specifically, this past year, when both the restaurant industry and the events industry faced uh, government mandate shutdowns and devastation revenue challenges, Events DC further demonstrated its commitment as an industry ally and supporter in critical ways. Greg and his team worked through COVID in the same way that our industry did, shifting gears and areas of focus over and over again and remaining open while reinventing critical functions to support real-time needs. Mr. O'Dell and the Events DC board recognized immediately that the devastation would be monumental for our industry and for hospitality overall in our city. The authority helped ensure that operators had access to vital and immediate funding so the district's unique restaurants many of whom are small, independently owned and operated, survived a devastating year. So together, our organizations created the Restaurant Operator Relief Fund as a way to extend the DC Small Business Recovery Microgrants programmed, Program. Thank you to you, Chairman McDuffie, um, which was eventually housed in the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. This critical funding assisted more than 1,000 restaurant operators, putting north of $4,000 in each operator's hands at the most critical time while we were waiting for federal relief and funding through PPP to come down the pike. DC's restaurants prior to the pandemic brought in over $4.4 billion in revenues, collected over $400 million in sales tax, and employed over 65,000 people. We hope to return to and exceed those numbers once we have proceeded through reopening and recovery. Events DC support is significant to our industry every year, but this year uh, it was paramount. A portion of the tax dollars which support Events DC became a direct investment back into the industry in the form of business support, as well as industry-wide marketing recovery efforts that generated businesses, uh, that generated business for restaurants struggling to stay afloat. Ms. Oliver, I'm gonna have to uh, ask you to summarize. I know a lot of folks are used to getting five minutes. I always run out of time with you, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Uh, 
the authority is also an important supporter of charitable and community programming that we do as an organization. We have a job fair coming up in two weeks that we're hosting with them. I appreciate your willingness to hear my testimony today and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Elizabeth Falcon, good morning. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie and members of the council. Thanks for the ability to testify today. Um, my name is Elizabeth Falcon and I'm the executive director of DC Jobs with Justice. I'm testifying today regarding the DC CARES program administered by Events DC. I'm intimately involved with the advocacy and implementation of the DC CARES program, working with all partners and members of the Excluded Worker Coalition and am a member of the Excluded Worker Coalition leadership team. DC CARES has been administered by Events DC since April 2020. Events DC has been a strong steward of these funds appropriated by the council last year, and I am confident they will continue to do so. We are glad to see that they are the recipient of funds to continue the program in the proposed budget by Mayor Bowser. I'm here to talk about the great value of the program as it is designed and also to encourage the council to increase funding. The goal of the DC CARES program is to provide cash assistance to DC residents who've been prevented from accessing federal assistance throughout the pandemic. This includes undocumented residents, returning citizens, and workers in the cash economy. Virtually all recipients are people of color. These funds are some of the only cash assistance available to these communities. Every eligible person has been locked out of unemployment benefits, including supplemental unemployment, and most have been prevented from receiving stimulus checks. The $9 million allocated in last year's budget will serve 8,100 DC residents. To date, 6,600 of those recipients have been identified and notified, and we expect all funds to be committed by the end of the month. At that point, the DC CARES program will have identified 13,000 unique individuals in need of cash assistance. The greatest need that the excluded worker community have identified for more assistance is for to is more assistance to the, those people who have already received funds. Nearly half of the first round of DC CARES funding uh, recipients applied again in the second round, but due to the need to serve a wide range of new applicants were ineligible. The $15 million allocated in the proposed budget would allow us to provide another $1,000 to current recipients and serve virtually no new people. The level of assistance does not come close to bringing the resources the U.S. citizens and others who are eligible for unemployment received. The Excluded Worker Coalition is asking for $200 million for this program because it would allow all current recipients and about almost 2,000 new recipients to access $12,000 in assistance per person. This is only about a third of what people who could access unemployment were able to receive, but it comes much closer to making residents whole. We're also disappointed that this funding came from the DC Paid Family Leave Fund. DC Jobs with Justice has long advocated for a robust paid family leave program where additional funds from the very modest tax could be used to improve benefits to our working families. I encourage the council to look closely at the federal funds that were not committed in FY21 and 22 budgets as opportunities to meet pressing needs for our residents now. I wanna thank Events DC for their thoughtful leadership on the program and the council for the opportunity to testify. I've included a lot more information about the DC CARES program in my written testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you uh, for your testimony. We do appreciate uh, you providing that. Uh, we're gonna turn next to Angela Franco. Good morning to you. And you, you Good, know, morning. Good morning. Good um, morning, Chairman McDuffie and members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. I'm Angela Franco, President and CEO of the DC Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the proposed fiscal 2022 budget and financial plan and the Events DC partnership. I'm pleased to be here today representing our board of directors and over a thousand members and their employees. Every day, the DC Chamber works hard to make our city a great place to live, work, play, learn, start, and grow a business. This past year has been tough in our local businesses and the overall economy. However, through this economic downturn, employers have displayed enormous strength, pivoted and showcasing innovative solutions to remain viable and sustain opportunities to support residents and our local communities. But still much is needed to ensure DC jobs and those hardest hit fully bounce back to where we were pre-pandemic. It is widely known that when the public health emergency began, the district suffered job loss like many areas. Most of these job losses were felt in the leisure, retail, 
and hospitality sectors, but it was the local and federal support programs that provided much needed cash infusions for struggling businesses and workers in need of support. The DC Chamber is a partner of our events DC for over 15 years uh, to promote conventions, tourism, and leisure travel in the District of Columbia to DC Chamber members, businesses, and beyond. This partnership is an important business alliance between the DC Chamber of Commerce and Events DC, and annually we work together in developing a, a detailed strategic plan that is according to the actual circumstances that we live in. Some of the highlights of the 2021 plan includes distribution of information and marketing materials for Events DC and its affiliate organizations. We do this to our, mom, our members, our partners, and also to our international partners. We leverage our relationship with larger businesses and developing a sales direct campaign for Events DC venues. We support the growth and promotion of Gather by Events DC, a virtual digital platform. We leverage our international initiatives and programs and showcase Events DC and distribute information on contract and procurement opportunities to our DC small business community. This is very, very important for us as well. We're always inquiring into how to create innovative initiatives and solutions that will support both organizations and our businesses move forward. We respectfully ask you to maintain the funding allocated to the Washington Convention and Sports Authority for the agency's proposed budget. We look forward to working collaborative, collaboratively with you as you review the agency budgets under your purview. As always, we're here to be a resource to you and the committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Yeah, and I keep eight seconds. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and thank you for that. <laughs> a lot of witnesses behind you who I'm sure are thankful for that as well. I timed it before. <laughs> Perfect. Perfectly, thanks. Uh, next is Donnie Crawford, and, and good morning, and you begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Donnie Crawford, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute and a member and supporter of the Fair Budget Coalition. DCFPI supports Events DC's ongoing efforts to provide assistance to DC workers who have been excluded from unemployment benefits through the establishment of the DC CARES program and applauds the council's supplemental investment in the program for a combined total of $14 million. While we are happy to see that the mayor proposes support for excluded workers in her supplemental budget, the 15 million allocated is simply not enough to meet the needs of workers who have only received a one-time payment of $1,000 over the past year. We join a campaign led by excluded workers and supported by over 50 organizations in calling on the DC Council to invest a total of 200 million in cash assistance to support excluded workers and also provide support for program outreach and administration and to also follow other states in devoting federal relief to excluded workers and providing cash assistance that is on par with unemployment insurance. In this pivotal moment, DC policymakers must spend federal rescue funds in a timely way with a laser focus on addressing the racial inequities that have excluded black and brown communities from economic gains and left them more vulnerable to COVID-19. Within DC's hardest hit industry of leisure and hospitality, employment is still down by 48% or nearly 40,000 jobs and occupational segregation within that industry has exposed black and brown workers to the worst job losses. These workers, many of whom are excluded from federal assistance, faced elevated levels of unemployment and lacked high paying job opportunities before the pandemic due to a long history of structural racism, discrimination and economic exploitation. A coalition of DC's excluded workers have called upon the DC council to provide a total investment of 200 million in cash assistance for them to support their ability to pay for basic needs. This direct call is supported by research, which has shown that having flexible cash assistance is crucial to provide stability for individuals and children, reduce stress, and avert extreme hardship. And new research from the Economic Security Project in the context of guaranteed income programs demonstrates that unrestricted cash is care for Black women and mothers. Cash enables them to provide safety, security, and choice for themselves and their families. And providing that assistance helps reject the way that society prescribes a strong black woman trip on them, demanding strength, caregiving, and resiliency from black women without positioning them as needing the same. The Treasury Department 
encourages states to use the American Rescue Plan to serve the hardest hit communities and families. The district should follow the lead of other states such as Washington, Oregon, and Colorado that have used federal or a combination of federal and local dollars to fund cash assistance for excluded workers. Additionally, New York recently was the first state to provide cash assistance to undocumented workers that is on rough par with unemployment insurance. DC should learn from these state models and leverage the one-time federal relief dollars to fulfill the demand of 200 million in cash assistance from our excluded worker community. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, thanks to each of you for your testimony this morning. Um, Ms. Crawford and Ms. Falcon, you, you both uh, testified about the DC CARES uh, program, which which is I mean, um, what was really one of the the requests that that advocates had made last year, and 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 was was fulfilled um, um, with millions of dollars. Obviously, the challenges still exist, and in some cases, are probably you know, worse than they were last year for some people. There is money in the budget uh, that the mayor proposed. Uh, it falls far short of what you all are asking for now, which is $200 million. Uh, where in the mayor's budget would you all uh, direct the council to identify that, that amount of funding to try to get to that level? Go ahead, Donnie. Okay, I would just say that I would like to see um, the council use more of the ARP relief. Um, yeah. The mayor didn't include any federal funds for excluded workers. And so um, in FY23 and FY24, there's still about $800 million in ARP funds that we could use in either the supplemental budget or in the FY22 uh, budget this year. Um, so I would try and look and see if there's areas um, specifically a federal relief that we can use to fill this fund. So, so federal relief in the out years, see if it can be uh, used now and, and figure out what I guess uh, precisely it's being used for and see whether that can be replaced. Okay. Yeah, um, we're, we're open to that going in either the supplemental or uh, fiscal year 22. Well, so, got it, okay. Okay, and uh, Ms. Franco and, and Ms. Hollinger, um, do you all feel that, I mean, I, I get the testimony you all obviously want of SDC to be able to maintain the, the budget that's been proposed by the mayor, but, but do you feel that the, the funds are sufficient as proposed by the mayor to, to, for SDC to be able to carry out its mission and duties given uh, its relation to uh, some of the hardest hit industries in our city, restaurants, um, you know, tourism, hospitality, leisure, uh, hotels, um, uh, you think they have enough resources as proposed? I can, Angela, I can take a crack at that. Um, I mean, I would say that, you know, we were never, just as our industry, we're never going to recoup what we lost, right, over the last year and a half. Um, we are confident and hopeful that we're going to rebuild modestly, but we will rebuild and recover. I think for um, Events DC, you know, they are positioned to, succeed and support as they have been. Um, I don't know that I'm in a position to state whether it's enough or not, but I know that their task is pretty daunting as they're trying to bring people back to the city, um, drive traffic to all of these businesses and industries as a larger hospitality unit. But um, I will say that, you know, they have a strong team, they have a good team, they have a great leader and um, they are positioned to succeed and hopefully succeed where they're also helping all of us in the industry to be able to recover going forward. Okay. Right, and I would like to add to that, that that's why it's so critical that we work together and we use every opportunity to support them and to support each other. This is really a time where we have to use every single opportunity that we have to promote the city to bring people into the city, not only from the local communities, but internationally, and really work together to make that happen. And that's one of the greatest things about working with Events DC. We really work as partners and really looking into what we can do to make it better, to bring more people or to grow. Okay. Well, I appreciate uh, each of you testifying this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we're gonna hear from, uh, <clears throat> Andy Fink, Chief Operating Officer, DC Central Kitchen, Lisa Amore, 
more marketing and public relations, Elizabeth Racheva. Waiting for staff to transition some folks in. Uh, Steve Shulman. I think I see Andy Fink, Lisa Moore, Elizabeth Achieva, Steve Shulman, Judy Este. Okay, we're going to begin with Andy Fink. And good morning to each of you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, you can begin your testimony. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Chairman McDuffie and members of the committee, on behalf of DC Central Kitchen, I'm pleased to submit this testimony in reference to the proposed budget for Events DC in this upcoming fiscal year. As you well know, the past year has been particularly devastating for our local hospitality and tourism industry and the DC residents who count on this industry for their livelihoods and career pathways. Supporting DC events continued efforts to reestablish this vital high demand industry sector is critical to our city's ability to foster an inclusive and equitable economic recovery. DC Central Kitchen is grateful to have a partner like Events DC bringing grounded leadership and strong community commitments to its work at this pivotal moment. Our partnership with Events DC and specifically the Washington Convention Center is longstanding. Over the years, we've collaborated to recover hundreds of thousands of pounds of surplus foods and celebrate dozens of graduations of DC Central Kitchen's culinary job training program for district residents who face systemic and personal barriers to achieving economic security. Events DC and the Washington Convention Center's food service provider, Aramark, have both shown a consistent commitment to creating high quality training and employment opportunities for our culinary graduates, along with making meaningful financial investments in our program's growth and viability. Since October 2020, we've also told anyone who would listen about the incredible generosity of Events DC and the Washington Convention Center in hosting our fast growing emergency relief efforts. When citywide demand for our fresh locally sourced grocery bags outstripped the limited capacity of our existing facilities, the Convention Center and Aramark wel welcomed us with open arms, empowering our staff and graduates to assemble and distribute up to 6,000 bags of nutritious groceries to food insecure district residents each week, including displaced hospitality workers. This work continues today because Events DC and Aramark know thousands of our neighbors are counting on us. Now more than ever, the district needs to rebuild its national and international profile as a destination for dining events and entertainment. We have the homegrown talent and we need to take a systemic approach to putting our residents back to work, revitalizing our hard hit businesses and ensuring that this industry's recovery does not leave anyone behind. Based on our many years of mission-driven collaboration with the leadership and staff at Events DC, we are fully confident that Events DC will be an effective and thoughtful steward of its fiscal year 2022 resources in achieving these shared goals. DC Central Kitchen is just one of the community institutions that DC, Events DC has woven into its efforts to support DC's continued development and growing profiles, as we are pleased to continue this partnership long into the future. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today, and I welcome to the chance to answer any questions about our partnership with Events DC. And thank you for your testimony. Next thank you. is Lisa Amore. Good morning. My name is Lisa Amore, and I'm the owner of Amore Marketing and Public Relations. I'm here to testify on behalf of Events DC as a neighbor. I'm a consumer lifestyle and technology publicist who works from home even before the pandemic. I live in the Whitman condo building at 9th and M Streets Northwest across the street from the convention center with a bird's eye view of its loading dock entrance, which has allowed me to witness countless presidential motorcades arriving into the building through the years. I've been an active member of this Shaw neighborhood since 2007, working closely with many businesses and restaurants, and I've witnessed a lot of the very positive change and development of the 9th Street corridor. I strongly believe that Events DC has played a very large role in the community's success. Early on in my move to the neighborhood, I was introduced to a number of people in Events DC leadership who have since become friends. 
I've been involved in more community meetings that I can possibly count, where Events DC invited in neighbors to speak, to, to seek their opinion and support for activities that pertain to the community, as well as the most recent meetings that sought feedback on the design, safety, and new business elements and kiosks that neighbors wish to see as the convention center is going through a refresh, especially along its 9th Street side. We're thrilled to see that Events DC truly cares about our opinions and has indeed incorporated many of the community's designs and safety ideas into the new aesthetics, which are being constructed as I speak. From new brighter lighting in the M Street Tunnel that also illuminates the pedestrian sidewalk which leads to the Metro, to beautiful mini shop fronts that will house new businesses in the convention center facade along 9th Street, to a new roof deck on N Street for the neighborhood to enjoy. All of these elements will do so much to enhance the community thanks to Events DC. However, in addition to the physical aspects that Events DC does to enhance our Shaw neighborhood, I want to speak about some things that are perhaps even more significant. Events DC's commitment to give back to the community through a number of great programs and events. I've personally witnessed, participated in, and even volunteered to help alongside Events DC in the following. Support for local restaurants, encouraging convention goers to patronize the businesses in walking distances. A number of my clients have been the beneficiary of the Events DC signage and maps for convention goers to go out and explore the neighborhood for a great meal and walking around in walking distance to the to their own meetings. Events DC's Thanksgiving Day Feast of Sharing, providing a warm meal and a lively celebration for more than 5,000 people who otherwise might not have had a turkey dinner. Though this obviously had to be adjusted this past year due to the pandemic, in years past, I've proudly volunteered with Events DC staff to help with this incredible event that truly put smiles on, the, on many people's faces, as well as filling their bellies with a warm meal. Nationals World Series pep rally on the grounds of the Carnegie Library. It's always thrilling to see how Events DC embraces all our sports teams by lighting up the convention center in red lights when our teams are participating in championship playoffs. And it was even more fun when Events DC quickly assembled a spectacular World Series pep rally on the grounds of the Carnegie Library, complete with the Nationals running presidents, mascots, prizes, and even World Series playoff tickets for lucky winners. On it, it, Ms. Ms. Maury, I'd hate to cut you off while you're talking about the World Series, um, but your time has expired. Uh, one, just very quickly, I want to talk about the vaccination site that was put on by Events DC. I, I can't, I, we've got up more than 100 witnesses. I'm sorry about okay. that. Um, thank um, you very much for your time, and I, I truly support Events DC. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn next to Elizabeth Rashiva. Good morning. Good morning, Chair McDuffie and members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. My name is Elizabeth Lachiba and I serve as the Chief Advancement Officer of Washington Performing Arts. It is my pleasure today to provide testimony on behalf of and in support of Events DC, a generous funder of Washington Performing Arts programs that have supported youth across the district through arts education as well as performance opportunities. Sustaining support for creative expression for youth has been more important than ever in this pandemic. And we have continued our work alongside Events DC on Dante. At Washington Performing Arts, we are thrilled to meet young people wherever they are in their journey of artistic expression, whether discovering an instrument or a dance for the first time, or honing it year over year via a school program like Capital Arts Partnership, or offering them a chance to share their gifts on stage through a platform like Mark Arts DC when artistry and initiative align. This year and for many years, Events DC has been a key partner by providing the necessary resources for our programs that support youth across DC and their creative development. In the process, they help us to bring to life our mission to champion the arts as a unifying force in vivid ways. This fiscal year, Events DC provided essential funding to two of these five programs, Capital Arts Partnership, or CAP, and a performance on our Dance in DC Showcase, a highlight of our Mars Arts DC virtual lineup this season. The Capital Arts Partnership Program one of six programs offered by Washington Performing Arts in over 100 DC public schools each year in all eight wards and serving nearly 30,000 students each year, introduces students of all ages to live and virtual performances as audience members, provides opportunities for active participation as performers and removes barriers to full participation in the performing arts. A long-term partnership between Washington Performing Arts and DC public schools, CAP supports the development of ensembles in jazz, strings, vocal music, and dance. And this year, Events DC's funding helped us be present in 10 schools throughout the year. 
Many of these schools we have partnered with in the past enabling continuation of long-term residencies. From Langley Elementary School in Ward 5 with special education and general music students in fifth grade, Bruce Monroe Elementary in Ward 1, Capital Strings with fourth graders, Merch Elementary in Ward 3, where elementary school students experience dance and creative movement, and middle schoolers at Stuart Hobson Middle School in Ward 6. We focus on team building and growing creative expression. Of NCC's grant also provided critical support for an arresting performance by Matthew Crittenden, a student at Duke Ellington School for the Performing Arts, through a free online showcase. He had a platform to share his artistry and also to advocate for bullying against boys in dance. His voice was compelling and true, and we were thrilled to introduce him to a local, national, and international audience. His performance has been viewed more than 1,000 times. We are so grateful for Events DC's generous support, and we urge you to continue to fund their work for these programs that impact so many children and youth through transformative work in the arts and athletics. Thank you for allowing me to share my testimony. I encourage you to read more detail in my written testimony. And I will do that. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Steve Shulman. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie and council members for letting me testify today. My name is Steve Shulman. I'm the Executive Director of Cultural Tourism DC. I am here today in support of Events DC and its work Cities hospitality and tourism industry. As one of its longstanding marketing partners, Cultural Tourism DC is grateful to have Events DC as its primary funder and presenting sponsor of two signature events, Passport DC and Walking Town DC. We are a 501c3 organization founded in 1999 to celebrate and support the multi-ethnic character, cultural diversity, and neighborhood vibrancy of the District of Columbia. We engage in the local, national, and international parts of what makes Washington, D.C. unique. Our major programs, Passport D.C., Around the World Embassy Tour, Walking Town D.C., and Porch Fest, are inclusive, enjoyable, and appeal to multiple generations as they enlighten and empower people to explore, understand, and appreciate the District of Columbia. Cultural Tourism D.C. is like the tiny engine that could. With the financial support of Events D.C., as well as a cadre of sponsors, the efforts of hundreds of volunteers each year, and donors who make modest contributions when we ask, we can, could, we can collaborate with others to offer an impactful schedule of programs as well as publicize the good work of other nonprofits in the arts and humanities. We were fortunate during the past 15 months when Events DC needed to withdraw $50,000 from our annual agreement to meet other needs we obtained a payroll protection program loan from the federal government and kept our full-time staff of DC residents intact. We received forgiveness for one of those loans so far. We look forward to ways to support our community. Like many, we were crushed last year when the pandemic forced us to cancel Passport DC and Around the World Embassy Tour. This year, we produced Passport DC at Home which offered unique online learning experiences and served as a bridge to our future programs that feature Washington's diplomatic core. When we saw greater activity at local restaurants, we encouraged people to savor the flavors of Passport DC by visiting restaurants and entering a contest to win gift cards to participating restaurants. Embassy staff members recommended many of those dining establishments. Last year, we presented Virtual Walking Town DC via the Zoom webinar format with guides from the Guild of Professional Tour Guides of Washington DC. We tapped into our Passport DC following and drew 1,450 registrants from 11 countries, including the United States. Participants came from 16 states in the District of Columbia. And from our surveys, we found that 35% learned about a new neighborhood and just about 50% plan to visit and dine in neighborhoods that they toured. There's a lot more I can tell you, but the impact of um, the big takeaway is that Cultural Tourism DC could not bring people to the district's neighborhoods, discoveries to their minds, and smiles to their faces without the year after year financial support of Events DC and the promotional support of Destination DC. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mrs. Schumann. I'm gonna move next to Judith. I don't wanna uh, butcher your last name, is it Estee? Judy Estee, but close. Got it. Thanks so much. 
So good morning, my name is Judy Esty. I'm here representing the Platform of Hope, which is a nonprofit initiative based in Word One that engages with cohorts of economically vulnerable families of color to define and pursue their goals across the spectrum of housing, health, education, finances, and employment. Our goal, along with our strategic alliance partners, Mary Center, Jubilee Housing, Jubilee Jumpstart, and Sitar Art Center, is to center the voices of families so that we can build an equitable neighborhood and eventually an equitable DC. Thank you for allowing me to testify for Events DC. I'm here to testify for the Events DC DC Cares funding, which has been providing cash assistance to excluded workers. This funding is essential, but it has been insufficient to meet the full needs of DC's hardest working residents. The Coalition of Excluded Workers, which includes those in the cash economy, those who are undocumented and returning citizens, all of whom have been excluded from public support throughout the pandemic, such as the federal stimulus and unemployment insurance, has asked for $200 million from DC Cares to truly match the need of the past 14 months. The DC Cares funding, which to date has provided $1,000 to over 13,000 excluded workers, is the only public support we have offered to some of DC's most vulnerable citizens. To be clear, these are people who are actively participating in our society and our economy. We rely on them for hospitality and childcare, among other jobs, and they pay taxes. Imagine you had lost your ability to work in the pandemic but couldn't access any unemployment insurance. Imagine you lost your job and your kids were home for school all day and you had to stay home and you didn't receive a dollar of the federal stimulus. And then imagine that while you received nothing, most people around you did. It's not just that folks have received almost no public support to acknowledge the public health crisis and trauma we've all experienced, it's that the rest of us have. These folks have watched as neighbors and friends and quite frankly, more privileged people have received up to $42,000 in unemployment insurance and the federal stimulus. Well, they've received a one-time payment of $1,000 from Events DC. What message does that send? And let's be real, how far do you think $1,000 stretches in DC over 14 months of unemployment and economic instability? With the families we work with last year, 58% of the families had been excluded from public support. 69% had lost their job or were working less, 85% had lost some or all of their income, 36% lacked access to household internet, and 51% of households needed another computer or tablet to connect to the digital world. I've heard that one of the reasons that officials have for rejecting the excluded workers direct ask for what they need after 14 months of the pandemic with minimal, minimal support is that they have rental assistance they can apply for. How many of you here today can honestly tell me you don't have any other significant household expenses for over a year other than rent? Are we really pretending that folks who live here don't have to pay for food, childcare, transportation, health, et cetera? And how many people here could operate on a budget of zero dollars for all of those things for over a year? And yet, because these are excluded workers, somehow they're not supposed to have these needs. They've asked for $1,000 per month of the pandemic, $12,000 per household, hence the 200 million. And so the idea that the mayor's 15 million is in any way close to responding to that need is insulting. And then to pretend we don't have the money, I wanna offer the comparison of New York, which recently approved 2.1 billion for excluded workers, including recurring monthly payments. Now I know that choosing Events DC as the home for these funds might be confusing, but honestly, it makes a lot of sense to me. Excluded workers are serving us at restaurants. Excluded workers are watching people's kids so we can go Ms. Jesse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to interject. I apologize. That I'm, All right. Well, excluded workers deserve to be included in this recovery, and they deserve what they ask for. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your testimony as well as all the other witnesses, and I'm going to apologize. I, I don't it, – it is good to see you, Judy. Uh, I butchered your last name, and I'm so sorry about that. You know uh, me as Miss Judy. It's all good. I, I'm Miss Judy. I'm usually used to seeing your name and then followed by Dan's place. I know it's been a while, but, but it's good to see you. And thank each of you for your – for your testimony here uh, this morning. Next, uh, we're gonna go to Diana Mayhew, President and CEO, National Cherry Blossom Festival. Tripti Patel, Commissioner, 2AL3. Nicole Preston, President and CEO, Special Olympics District of Columbia. And the final witness for Events DC, I have is Alana Eschner, lead organizer, DC chapter of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Testing. Uh, I think that was that Diana Mayu testing. I think we've got all the witnesses on the panel. We're gonna start with Diana Mayhew. 
And if you, right. so if you intend to the camera on or not, but we, we definitely can hear you. Okay, I don't know why the camera's not on, sorry. Um, uh, good morning, Chairperson McDuffie and members of the committee. My name is Diana Mayhew, president of the National Cherry Blossom Festival. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Events DC, an important organization that supports so many city functions. The National Cherry Blossom Festival is among the DC organizations they support annually, not only through financial investment, but also leadership involvement and service on the NCBF Board of Directors. The Events DC marketing team provides guidance and collaboration to the festival's marketing efforts and brand experiences. The past two unusual springs and unprecedented challenges demonstrated the importance of Events DC's support as well as the council's support. Although the festival has been different and large gatherings were not possible, NCBF was committed to carrying out this iconic DC tradition. The festival's creativity and adaptability led to an exciting lineup of virtual and in-person experiences while prioritizing public health protocols. The festival ignited community pride and participation more than ever from all eight wards of the city while also engaging national and international audiences. Events DC provided the strong foundation for the festival to introduce reimagined programs, including the NCBF Celebration Show, a nationally syndicated entertainment program showcasing the highlights of the 2021 festival and the vibrancy of springtime in the district. The show is also available on demand on Gather by Events DC, reaching an even broader audience. The festival engaged an audience of hundreds of thousands and garnered nearly 3 billion impressions through earned media and other communications efforts, spotlighting the district at a time where we needed it the most. Bringing the blossoms to the living room and mobile devices, the Bloom Cam received more than 1 million visits from more than 150 countries. As Events DC took the lead in the district's economic recovery, NCBF worked closely with them and other organizations to play a role. The festival incorporated programs encouraging residents to support DC restaurants and businesses. With the support of Events DC and others, the festival generated more than 1,000 dinners from local restaurants through the reimagined Pink Tie Party, as well as special hosted dinners for senior villages in Ward 7 and 8. We branded the city in pink and blossom decor and brought the celebration to the homes and lives of the residents and delivered the ability to engage anyone from anywhere. Events DC's and the council's investments help support greater exposure and awareness of the district as the springtime destination. NCBF is a DC organization that uses a festival to showcase the district to the world for the benefit of our local economy. The district benefits annually from its investments in the festival. It is through this support that the festival is able to continue its reach into Ward 5 and all eight wards. We greatly appreciate the support from Events DC, the council and the mayor. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Next is Tripti Patel, commissioner. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie. My name is Tripti Patel, and I am DC's first Union American woman ANC commissioner. I represent the historic Foggy Bottom, and I am testifying in regards to the plight of many excluded workers who have kept the city running literally on their backs, but who have been treated as expendable. I weigh that great responsibility of trying to be eloquent, articulate, and succinct on experiences that are intensely emotional and deeply personal for myself and others. Until March of 2020, I was a ticked worker. Like 65,000 hospitality workers, I lost my job. However, unlike many of them, I did qualify for unemployment insurance, stimulus checks, and programs such as Medicaid and SNAP. Excluded workers should feel the same sense of dignity, security in having their needs met. Everyone wants to survive with dignity and is why I stood in solidarity a year ago and fought for $30 million a year ago for the DC CARES Fund. We were awarded $9 million from the DC Council and $5 million from Events DC for a total of $14 million. This amount only allowed for recipients to see, receive a one-time payment of $1,000 for the last 15 months is woefully inadequate. Excluded workers will need frequent, frequent and systemic support, which is why I'm amplifying the ask for $200 million. This amount assumes $12,000 per person, which is $1,000 a month for a year, up to a 10% overhead, which is $20 million, $157 million in checks to applicants who are currently approved in the program, which is 13,000 people, and $23 million for new applicants, which could be 1,900 more people. This pandemic has decimated not only businesses, but workers as well economically. It will be a long road to recovery and one that is filled with setbacks. 
tax. Millions of our taxpaying dollars have been poured into businesses so they can recover and they will receive it for quite a few years. Yet our excluded residents are not discussed, we are, we're not discussing them in the same way. There's no point in dumping millions to save businesses if the people who are now without homes and food can't afford to buy the products. The reality is we need not we needn't have this discussion if the city invested in its residents and we prioritize their needs over businesses. It's simple. Make sure this is a safe, safe and just economic recovery for all in service and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner, and for sharing that, that personal story. Uh, next is Nicole Preston. Good morning. Good morning, um, Chairman McDuffie and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the Events DC grant program. Special Olympics is DC is the sole provider of year round sports training and athletic competition in a variety of Olympic type sports for children and adults with intellectual and closely related developmental disabilities. We offer health education and inclusion programs which are essential in helping participants lead healthier lives and develop valuable skills that help them succeed in school and become self-advocates. The Events DC grant program provided critical resources to Special Olympics, help Special Olympics DC fulfill our mission and provide our programs for district residents with intellectual disabilities. This was particularly needed as we lost donations from businesses hard hit by loss of revenue due to the pandemic. In 2020, the COVID-19 restrictions forced a population that is often more isolated than other citizens into an either, even deeper isolation. Like most organizations, we pivoted to providing online training and fitness classes until we were able to restart in-person activities. However, many of our athletes are uh, in low income households and lack the technology as well as the ability to use it to participate in online fitness. So the grant helped us deliver uh, kits um, delivered to athletes home containing fitness equipment and our Fit5 program guidebook with exercises and tracking sheets, as well as nutrition and hydration information. When COVID-19 gathering size limits began to increase, we returned to our in-person sports activities that were greatly missed. They helped our athletes rejoin with their friends and regain a sense of normalcy and community. The grant funded uh, facility fees, coaching costs, and equipment. Events D, the Events DC grant program has helped Special Olympics DC provide a vital service to our athletes, helping us unite the district in an environment of equality, respect, and acceptance. We ask the council to continue support of the Events DC grant program and thereby its support of an underserved community of children and adults with intellectual disabilities in the city. Thank you. And thank you uh, for your testimony. I want to thank each of the witnesses for their testimony. Ms. Preston, do you feel like Events DC's budget as proposed by the mayor is sufficient to continue to allow and support with grants the activities of your organization? Uh, we sh would always request for additional support. Um, we had a um, small grant in, in the amount of uh, 7,500 um, against a budget of more than a million dollars to support more than 2,500 children and adults with intellectual disabilities in the city who have very few other options in the city, very few other programs. So uh, if the budget is increased at Events DC to allow us to expand our programming and provide more for this very vulnerable population. Uh, are the activities that you all are, you know, have been engaging with uh, before the pandemic, are, are things starting to open back up in terms of some of those activities that perhaps were curtailed during the, the height of the pandemic? Correct. Um, things are starting to open up slowly. Um, we are able to get permits from the Department of Parks and Recreation for some facilities, um, but we're not able to go back to full, uh, full activities yet um, as many facilities are still restricted and, and closed to outside uh, people. So um, yes, additional funding would help us greatly to uh, increase the number of opportunities that this community is 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 often asking for. Okay. Uh, next is Alana Eichner. She's a lead organizer of the DC chapter of National Domestic Workers Alliance. And good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie. As you said, my name is Alana Eichner, and I'm a Ward One resident and an organizer 
the DC chapter of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And as many of my colleagues also in the leadership of the Excluded Worker Coalition have come here to say, I'm urging the council to put 200 million into the DC CARES program through Events DC to meet the ongoing need of excluded residents who are not able to access unemployment or stimulus funds. The DC chapter of the National Domestic Workers Alliance is a group of women who provide essential services as home care aides, as nannies, and as house cleaners. Many of our members are undocumented or work in the informal economy, and for these reasons, we're excluded from federal assistance. Data from the Economic Policy Institute shows that domestic workers are disproportionately likely to be immigrants. More than a third of the domestic workforce are immigrants, compared with just 17% of the overall workforce. While other workers, as you've heard, received up to 42,000 in unemployment insurance to keep them afloat or up to 3,200 in federal stimulus payments, so many domestic workers in DC received next to nothing. With her permission, I wanna briefly tell you about Reina, a Ward 4 DC resident and one of the members of our chapter. She's a single mother, an immigrant from Honduras and an active leader in our efforts to meet the financial need of excluded workers. As an undocumented person, Reina has talked about how difficult it is to find work. And when she did secure a job as a home care worker caring for seniors, she only earned $10 an hour. During the pandemic, Reina lost most of her work. She said that it felt like starting from square one all over again, like when she first came to this country. She struggles to have enough money to feed her son and to purchase the other things that her son needs. She received $1,000 from the DC CARES program in the first round of funding that was administered, but her expenses have piled up. So you can imagine after more than a year of not being able to find enough work, $1,000 is completely insufficient. Domestic workers like Reina take extreme pride in their work. They know the care they provide to seniors, to people with disabilities, to children, is the work that makes all of their work possible. As Reina has told me, through no fault of her own, this pandemic has taken this dignified work away from her. Excluded workers are an essential part of our community and DC both has the funds and an existing mechanism through Events DC to distribute these funds. I agree with what Donnie shared about where these funds can come from. I would also add that we can allocate money for excluded workers by raising taxes on DC's wealthiest residents who by and large have not been economically harmed during this pandemic and many of whom have actually increased their wealth during this time period. Domestic workers in the district are really counting on the council to step up where the federal government has cruelly excluded these members of our community and to start to ease some of the de deep financial need born out of the last 15 months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. And thank you for your testimony as well as the other witnesses. Uh, just quickly to Commissioner Patel and, and Ms. Eichner, any concerns uh, about the administration of DC CARES program uh, or has everything to your knowledge uh, after any initial uh, perhaps rollout uh, been going okay for last year's uh, administration? Go ahead, Alana. Go, no, go ahead, Tiffany, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Chairperson McDuffie, from what I've heard from recipients is that, you know, one of the biggest challenges was that it took a long time for DC CARES to actually, you know, get the funds and begin implementing it out to recipients. I believe that many of the recipients, when the money was awarded from the time that they actually received it in their hand, was about five to six months. I don't think most people got the money until the beginning of this year. And so, they spent the worst part of the pandemic really suffering. And so by the time they got their direly needed funds, which was woefully inadequate, which was $1,000, it was already gone. Got it. Got it. So that was the biggest challenge for me that I saw as an outsider. I didn't work. I didn't have the ability to work with any of the organizations, but I heard that feedback from recipients, sir. I'll just add very briefly that uh, my understanding from talking to folks who have been part of the administration of the program, like Elizabeth Falcon, is that there was a lot of work to identify duplicate recipients who had already applied in the first round and were not eligible for the second round. And so that took a lot of legwork to straighten out. I think that really demonstrates the need that so many folks applied again because they needed more funding. Mm -hmm. But because if additional funding was allocated, um, we already have now this database of folks who we could easily give the money to. Again, there's a successful existing mechanism and we know who many of these folks are now. And so it would make it easy to facilitate additional funds. Got it. Thank you each for your testimony this morning.
Next, uh, we have the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, or DEMPAD. Uh, DEMPAD supports the mayor in developing and executing the district's economic development vision by setting development priorities and policies, coordinating how the district markets itself to job creators, and leading district development, attraction, and retention efforts. DEMPAD will play a crucial role in helping steer the district through the economic recovery. Uh, with that, I'm going to call our, our next panel of uh, public witnesses. And again, I ask, uh, just as a reminder, that participants mute their microphones when they aren't speaking. Jennifer Kuyper, Senior Director of Policy and Evaluation, District Bridges. Donnie Crawford with DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Angela Franco, DC Chamber of Commerce. Parisa Naruzzi, Empower DC. And Yvette Banfield, who is with CNHED. And I've been joined by a council member for War Two, Brooke Pinto. Council member, while we're transitioning uh, the witnesses, I, I'm not sure if you wanna make a brief opening statement. Thank you so much, Chairman McDuffie. I've been following along on another device, so I don't need to hold us up. Um, happy to just hear from the witnesses and then we can get into some questions, but thank you very much for for all of your leadership and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Sure, we'll do a five minute round uh, after uh, the witnesses. Okay, uh, we got some of them who've joined as panelists. We're gonna begin with Jennifer Kuyper and good morning to you. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie and um, Council Member Pinto and staff. I'm Jennifer Kuyper We're from District Bridges, a DC nonprofit that supports small businesses to navigate government and private supports. My written testimony provides additional detail on our recommendations, as well as data on the impact of the pandemic on DC small businesses. Our suggested investments focus on the preservation and growth of districts existing brick and mortar micro and small businesses that are not only important economic partners and employers, but also the visible expression of DC's diversity, culture, and history. Of the 10 recommendations in my written testimony, I'd like to emphasize the following three. First, we recommend allocating DEMPED resources on programming for eviction prevention through rent relief, mediation services, and property tax rebates. To prevent widespread evictions or non-renewal of leases, we suggest the district provide rent relief services similar to what is being recommended to DC residents. Programming could include landlord-tenant mediation services, rent subsidies, and property tax relief that is shared with tenants under triple net lease obligations. Second, we recommend DEMPED facilitate small business property ownership. As Dr. Perry of Brookings has presented, the need for small businesses to own buildings is not only a matter of small business preservation, but also an equity issue. We encourage DEMPED um, pilot several strategies that have supported low-income families become homeowners. These strategies include seeding a commercial production trust fund, subsidizing down payments, increasing prosperity fund eligibility and uses, my written testimony includes more information on District Bridges Business Preservation Assistance Program that includes a pilot project and incorporates affordable commercial space ownership. Third, we support the mayor's investment of a one-stop service delivery through the Technical Assistance Hub. In developing in the design and implementation of this much needed initiative, we encourage the district to partner with community-based organizations that have high intensity and high trust relationships with DC small business owners. As I said in my written um, testimony, there's more detail and additional recommendations, but in conclusion, conclusion, District Bridges greatly appreciates Mayor Bowser, the DC Council, this committee, and most especially DEMPED's Director John Falcicchio and his hardworking team for its commitment to the district's small business community. The challenges of the past year presented by the pandemic have exposed the vulnerabilities, but also the tremendous value of DC small business community. We believe these budget investments are consistent with this committee's dedication to strengthening an equitable and thriving economy for all. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Donnie Crawford. See you again. You can begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie, Council Member Pinto, and members of the, of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Donnie Crawford, and I am a senior policy analyst at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Throughout the entirety of the pandemic, Black residents in DC have consistently made up 75% of virus-related deaths, and more than twice as many Black residents have tested positive for the virus than white residents. 
This is not by accident, this is by design. Racism, deep structural inequities, and wealth inequality shape our social determinants of health, the physical, social, and economic conditions in which we are born, live, and work. Over 160,000 mostly Black residents living in Ward 7 and 8 experience food apartheid as they are serviced by just three full-service grocery stores with long lines and empty shelves during the height of the pandemic. Ward 3, however, a predominantly white area of the city, has 16 full-service grocery stores with only about half the population of Ward 7 and 8, according to BC Hunger Solutions. For over 20 years, district government has offered tax incentives to supermarkets to decrease the shortage of supermarkets in food deserts. But the Office of the Chief Financial Officer de determined that the 29 million in incentives from 2010 to 2017 have not affected supermarkets locations decisions generally or produced economic or other benefits that would not have happened but for the incentives. These findings are in line with most evidence showing that tax breaks intended to encourage business behavior while popular often do not work well. The mayor's budget proposal slightly improves the current rules by changing some of the eligibility criteria, but it appears that her reforms failed to fully address the flaws documented in the OCFO's report, particularly the evidence showing that the incentive structure, not just the targeting, is not working well for residents in the highest need areas. In the BSA, the mayor proposed a variety of positive changes to this program. However, the mayor proposed to both broaden and narrow the definition of an eligible area in ways that don't go far enough to ensure that the tax breaks would be restricted to the wards with the fewest grocery stores, or wards five, seven, and eight. While eligible areas would include neighborhoods with over 20% participation rate in public assistance programs and use data to identify need, the mayor is proposing to expand eligibility to opportunity zones and also to give herself discretion to se select underserved areas with no transparency written in the bill. DC Council should reject her request for broad discretion because it would undermine public trust and accountability. A better proposal would be to more directly invest in efforts to bring new grocery store options to needed areas, strictly limiting support in wards five, seven, and eight. Because seven and eight face the highest needs, the council could ensure that a supermajority of the funding is targeted here. Additionally, the local food access grants program similarly includes two loopholes that would allow grants and loans to selected food businesses to go to the same proposed eligible areas of the supermarket program and provide grants for the provision of technical assistance to be awarded to any food business seeking to establish um, it, their location in the district. Eligibility should be narrowed again towards seven and eight. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Andrew Franco. Good to see you again. Good well. morning. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman McDuffie um, and Councilmember Pinto as well. Um, Angela Franco, President and CEO of the DC Chamber of Commerce. And thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. Um, on the fiscal year 2022 budget for the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. I would like to share our support for an inclusion of the many additional budget investments that would support local businesses as they recover to include the small business coaching and technical assistance hub. We really believe this is critical for the, um, uh, for the you know, to help businesses start and grow their businesses. Um, in the inclusion innovation equity impact fund, business retention and attraction. The DC Chamber of Commerce also supports many investors into business relief, recovery, and growth proposals, including the Tax Revision Commission. And um, as the committee and business and economic development continues to consider the proposed FY22 budget and the financial plan, we ask not to uh, establish any new taxes or regulations that can jeopardize the competitive positions of local businesses, but instead ensure that relief programs programs, fee reductions, and business support programs remain prominent throughout the budget deliberations this season. The proposed budget would authorize the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development to issue several grants, including grants to local business enterprise to support activities that would increase business revenue, help those hire more employees, and enhance the viability of those businesses and grants to support the reopening and recovery of arts and entertainment venues that were impacted during the pandemic. This is a perfect time to adopt the right policies to shape and strengthen economic recovery, even under adverse condition and post the public health emergency. The proposed funding in the budget to provide additional resources to businesses 
will help businesses rebound with additional technical support, working capital and incentives while rebuilding the private sector so that the district can rise out of the recession. Additionally, the budget will reduce the cost of starting, working and doing business in the district, further ensuring the district is a city that is more attractive, not just to companies, but working professionals. Jurisdictions across the nation are looking at ways to keep businesses and are offering suits of incentives to attract new firms and build their economy back up. Um, DC employers would likely be more inclined to reopen fully or even stay in the district if they're supported by programs that help them expand capacity and reduce the regulatory environment. Uh, we encourage to support of the subtitle language that will reduce licenses, endorsements, and professional licensing fee. In general, we support initiatives um, that are focused on ensuring our economy, our economy is resilient, supporting the start and growth of businesses, investing in our local businesses, and building capacity in firms that will turn remain in our local neighborhoods and recycle dollars in our city. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you for your testimony. We're going to turn next to Felicia Naruzzi. Good morning to you, and you can begin your testimony. Everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning. My name is Parisa Naruzzi. I'm a director of Empower DC. And every year I come before the council and testify about the historic Alexander Cromel School in Ivy City. Talk about the fact that this uh, property is not surplus, that it's much desired by the community to uh, be a community center and park. And I argue against uh, the city disposing of it for private use. And I urge the city Thanks to the strong leadership of Councilman McDuffie and the advocacy of IBC residents, we saw Mayor Bowser make a 180 degree shift in her position on Cromel School this year. Did I freeze? Are we? You froze. Am I we, with you? We got you back. Okay. <laughs> You're with us. Okay, sorry, my internet connection is. I was just saying we, we uh, saw a big shift this year thanks to your leadership. Um, with you now? Yeah, you've been with us. Okay. I'm going to try to plug my... Anyway, I was just saying that we saw a big shift this year thanks to your leadership and the, the ongoing advocacy of Ivy City residents. We're really thrilled that the mayor has abandoned that harmful development deal that she had selected in 2016. Um, and instead, uh, we'll move forward with the renovation of Cromel School as a community center in park. Um, of course, uh, Councilman McDuffie, we, we recognize that your strong stance on this really helped make that happen, and, and we really appreciate that. Um, over the last several months, with your help through the comprehensive plan as well, we've uh, managed to put changes in motion that prioritize the community members first. Uh, the plan now requires that community planning take place prior to a major new development, and of course, that the Clamell School be retained for, for public uses. So we're asking for your partnership um, to ensure that the funding for you may want to try to maybe just turn off your video, Ms. Neruzzi. To ensure that the funding that the mayor allocated for Cromel School in fiscal year 22 and 23 is secure. And of course, that, no funny business with that funding and it gets out the door and is used. And of course, full transparency and inclusion of the Ivy City community in every step of the planning and implementation for Cromel School and the small area plan. And just very, very briefly, I wanna also flag for you our concerns about the new communities initiative um, led by DEMPED. This is a, um, a program that has really failed over the last almost 20 years in providing better quality housing for public housing residents. It's largely led to the displacement of hundreds of public housing residents. And we really question how that money that the mayor has allocated 70 million in this upcoming budget budget will be used. Public housing redevelopment is a great opportunity for us to advance racial equity through resident ownership and equity in these properties. Um, but instead we've really used it to continue the displacement and harmful development patterns of our city. So we'd love to talk with you and work with you more uh, for oversight around the use of the NCI funds. Thank you so much. And thank you for your testimony. Next, we got Yvette Manfield. Good morning. You can begin your testimony. Uh, 
Good morning, um, Councilmember McDuffie and members of the committee. My name is Yvette Banfield and I'm the Vice President of Economic Development Policy at the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. CNHED applauds um, Deputy Mayor for planning and um, economic development for its responsiveness to sustain and support and strengthen small businesses in the district reeling from the effects of the pandemic. We're encouraged by the mayor's investment towards the recovery and rebuilding the small business ecosystem. In this phase of the district's recovery, we are confident that small businesses will rebound, but it will take time. We, we view the uh, Great Streets Retail, uh, Great Streets Retail Small Business Reimbursement Program, Grants Program as a vital part of the uh, small business recovery. At this crucial time, the value add of the Great Streets Program to small businesses and the district's neighborhoods uh, is why CNHED supports the mayor, Mayor Bowser's budget of 8.1 million to increase the fund, increase funding for the Great Streets um, Program for reimbursable uh, capital improvement pro, um, pro, grant program. Um, so I just would like to kind of draw a specific attention um, in my testimony to what we hope that the Great Streets will be able to do moving forward. Um, one of the things that we've learned is lessons through the pandemic is that eliminating barriers to um, small businesses to take advantage of grant opportunities and funding um, made available through the district. So a lesson learned resulting from the extended public health emergency shutdown is that recovery isn't always equitable. Additional efforts such as outreach and technical assistance are needed to help viable small businesses unable to meet the qualifications for the Great Streets program lacking clean hands, for example, lacking a clean hand certification. The recently introduced Clean Hand Equity Amendment Act of 2021 has the potential to open the Great Streets program to countless uh, numbers of small businesses that opted not to apply or were denied a great um, a grant due to issues with their clean hand certifications. Um, extend Great Streets to Main Streets outside of the program boundaries. CNHED recognizes the value of the capital improvement grants and the potential for the grant Great Streets um, to spur a, a excuse me, to spur commercial vibrancy in areas of the district that could benefit from additional sources, uh, resources and support. In FY 20, 2022, CNHED requests that council consider extending the designated geographical geographic areas to main streets adjacent to or fall outside of the Great Streets um, geographic footprint. Um, lastly, continued support for DCAP, for the DC Community Anchor Partnership. In FY 2021, council allocated 200,000 to support the DC Community Anchor Partnership, DCAP, a collaborative of anchor institutions advancing inclusive contracting and procurement with minority owned businesses. Ms. Becker, your, your time has expired. Um, and because we got so many witnesses, I'm gonna stop you short there. And obviously we want everybody to, to make sure they submit their written testimony if they haven't already. I know you're great with submitting your written testimony. Uh, I'm gonna go to Thank a Thank you. staff, a quick uh, staff five minute rounds. Um, and I will give you uh, in my five minutes, Ms. Banfield, just an opportunity to, to summarize the, the, the final part of your statement. It's, the anchor program is such an important program and, and the committee has been supportive of it uh, over the years. And so uh, I think it's worth getting that on the record. Thank you. You go ahead. So my last, actually my last sentence was that we asked council to make a second year reoccurring allocation of $200,000 to continue the support for the DCAP program. Okay, uh, but, but the, the program should, we, I thought we funded it for a couple of years uh, in a row last year, no? So I, the first round was 2021, right. yes, for the reoccurring. And so there was a second allocation for 20, uh, 200,000 um, for of FY 2020, 22. Yeah, okay. I, I just wanted to be certain. I know we wanted to make sure that there was a little bit more in terms of recurring the last year. And so we're able to work with the committee members to do that. And we appreciate the committee support on that in your- yes. And if you're able to extend that beyond the two years, that would be excellent. Okay. 
Uh, Ms. Copper, you, you mentioned something that's important uh, to me. And in fact, it was one of the things that, that I uh, requested uh, in my letter to the mayor uh, is funds uh, to allow uh, businesses, legacy businesses in particular, uh, to purchase their physical establishments. Um, you mentioned that in your testimony. I want to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you very much. And I also appreciate your leadership prior to the pandemic, really looking carefully at this issue. Um, we are trying to work with especially legacy businesses who've been in neighborhoods for a long time that are now gentrifying and they're at risk once their lease comes up for renewal of no longer being able to stay in their locations. So this is not, um, this is different from trying to attract a new business to an area that is underserved. These oftentimes are in neighborhoods that are actually rapidly gentrifying. So they aren't eligible for many of the support programs because the residents have higher employment rates, higher income rates, but our small businesses that have been there for a long time aren't experiencing the same level of prosperity. And so we really see ownership as a long-term solution for those, those tenants. So we've been experimenting, working with four minority owned businesses on Georgia Avenue um, in the gentrifying neighborhood of Parkview to move to an ownership model through redevelopment of the space. So it includes six adjacent properties that would move into a multi-use development with residential up top taking advantage of the airspace that is currently not being utilized and converting the lower level retail to commercial condos. So this is a um, recommendation under District Bridges Business Preservation Assistance Program or BPEP. Uh, we are finding that, that there is a need for gap financing that the government could um, play a role given the policy priority of establishing ownership opportunities for small And, and, and uh, just before my time wraps up, that would the legacy businesses actually own their businesses and the physical establishments? That, that would be the objective through a condo arrangement. So the upper levels residential could be either apartment or condos, but the lower level would all be ownership based. And that's working with existing businesses, not attracting new businesses to that space. Got it. Okay. Love to hear more if you could reach out to the to the to our office to talk a little bit more about that. Um, um, I'm gonna actually stop it right there. Uh, I did want to, Ms. Crawford, I did not take a note. You had mentioned something in your testimony that I wanted to, to highlight. Um, I thought I made a, a quick note. Oh, you were talking about the need to, to focus on um, you know, certain areas, five, seven, and eight. Uh, and I think you said in particular uh, that uh, the supermajority of the funding uh, in, in, in which program are you referring to specifically? I think it was a grocery store program that that's in the mayor's budget under Dempid, uh, that those a some majority of the funding to serve residents in Ward 7 and 8. Correct. And um, for the food access program, I think that should still be narrowed to Ward 7 and 8 and not include 5. Just to be, yeah, um, just so that they could have as much assistance as possible. But for the larger supermarkets, um, I think it should definitely be open to Ward 5 because we know that Ward 5, 7, and 8 have the least amount of grocery stores. Have you all looked at any of the, the, the larger, the, the model that, that would need to attract <clears throat> grocers in these areas or food deserts, but, but you know, in, in some cases, the larger supermarkets are, are, have a model that, that is not conducive to locating in, in, in areas that don't have the density and, and incomes to support uh, you know, uh, their model smaller models, co-op models. Um, I'm running out of time, but, but if, if you have thoughts on that, I'd love to hear from you all because I know I've worked with uh, Council Members Gray and, and Trayon White and Council Member Che as well, frankly, who's been extremely supportive uh, both um, in policy, but also with funding from her committee to try to uh, really think through innovative ways to bring healthier food options to, to War 7 and 8. 
Yeah, we've been ramping up our research in this area. So we haven't deeply um, dived into this issue, but our partner at the Capital Area Food Bank has done a lot of research on this and we've been providing some technical assistance on that. So I don't know if they're testifying today, but I know they have a lot of recommendations on that model and um, basically the answers to the question that you just asked. All right, All right. thank you. And, and my staff's gonna get me for running over my time. Um, I'm gonna turn next to Councilmember Pinto. Thank you so much, Chairman McDuffie, and thank you all for testifying. I think as has been highlighted, this has been such a terrible uh, year for so many of our residents and our small businesses. And the fact that we've lost um, and seen closures of almost 300 brick and mortar businesses is something we all need to keep front of mind as we uh, work to get our city reopened. And I want to thank you all for all your support for our residents and small businesses throughout the year, because I know and I hear from them all the time that they couldn't have done it without your many of your uh, leadership and partnership. <clears throat> um, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Cooper, I'm sorry, I always mispronounce your name, um, as well, you know, that we've talked a lot about funding needs. What other kind of needs are you hearing now from, <clears throat> excuse me, small businesses um, that we may not be anticipating, whether that be permitting needs or uh, space needs. What, what what are you hearing on the ground now? All right, that's, I appreciate the question. I also appreciate all the support. I know you've provided to the Logan Circle Main Street and small businesses in your ward. Um, the Some of the other recommendations that are in the written testimony are more about waiving of fees and reducing costs for our small businesses. Um, which the mayor has included some of options in that. And I think that's very important. Um, grant program, oftentimes you'll hear policy makers talk about access to capital, which involves typically debt. All um, our small businesses are expressing anxiety about being overextended and are not as interested in loans, really interested in grants and reducing costs. Um, the nice thing about reducing fees is that it doesn't require the um, complicated and sometimes expensive grant review process and can be tailored to a targeted community. Um, very One in particular I do want to highlight is the sidewalk cafe permit. It was, I think, an oversight in the last two years that that fee was not waived. There was um, free access through the streetery programs for many restaurants, but those restaurants that had um, existing patio permits did not have their fees waived. If we could reimburse those and waive those in the coming year, that would immediately restore thousands of dollars into the pockets of a very hard hit industry, which is the restaurant industry. So I, I could go on, but out of respect for your time, I do want to highlight that as measures that do have budget implications, but are very important for our small businesses. Okay, thank you so much for, for raising that important point. Um, Ms. Crawford, I wanted to ask you around your the process by which uh, your data is collected. And I know that this is the Dem Head panel, and I um, wasn't able to ask you questions for the Events DC panel, but you know, in the context of the um, healthy foods program that you mentioned, but also the 200 million that you mentioned on the last panel, how do you all collect the data for what the need is? Um, and how are you kind of reaching residents who may not be uh, responding to those types of questions through technology or, or other more traditional means? Can you repeat the last part of your question? Sorry. So the, the question is, how are you collecting the data on what the need is and how are you reaching residents who may be harder to reach? Oh, okay, gotcha. So as far as the data on needs, we do have a brief coming out soon um, just showing that the actual need for excluded workers is more than 200 million when compared to um, workers who already received assistance from the federal government from both formal unemployment insurance program as well as the federal stimulus payments. And they're, we're a part of a network of a bunch of state groups. Um, and there are other fiscal institutes that have put out models um, determining the need. 
um, and looking at the number of excluded workers, of course, and this includes not only undocumented residents, but returning citizens, um, day laborers, um, people who, uh, you know, have just not have access to the formal um, unemployment insurance program, and then just uh, compiling all that data over a year's worth of the pandemic, we looked at the last 12 months, not 14 months um, where we're currently at right now. And we saw that on average, people who receive uh, formal unemployment insurance have received around $42,000 of, assist of assistance at most. And so that's why we said the need is actually greater than $200 million. And what I really like about our ask this year and um, the fact that on the last part of the question, when you asked about people in need, this was demanded by excluded workers themselves. And so it wasn't like paid advocates like myself saying, here's how much money you need. They have meetings um, twice a month, um, every like in the evenings um, after work, if for those people that are back in work, and they say that this is what we need as excluded workers. And I'm just really um, excited that we're supporting their demands and raising that um, to you as the council. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. I'm out of time. Um, if I might just say in closing that Ms. Banfield, I'm thrilled to hear your support of the expansion of Great Streets programs. I absolutely agree. I've introduced legislation to expand Great Streets um, to four major corridors throughout Ward 2. and I'm absolutely supportive of continuing to expand those programs throughout the city and make sure we increase the funding um, so that it's not diluted as we expand. So thank you and thank you all. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Pinto and to the witnesses. Uh, we're gonna turn to our next panel of witnesses. If we could have Karen Kasten, it's Warman Hotel Strategy Team, War 3 Housing Justice Working Group. Obadiah Black with the same organization. Ted Hallinan, Vice President, Property Group Partners, Meg McGuire, Warbin Hotel Strategy Team, and I'd like to add Nick Deladon to that panel as well if he is available. Okay, uh, I think Black is not available. So let's let's just add staff up to James Shabazz. If you could have up to that 12 witness. Okay, let's see some folks have been transitioned. So we'll begin with Karen Kasten and good morning. Good morning. You've been here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Karen Kasten. I'm testifying as a member of two key groups, the Ward 3 Housing Justice Working Group and the Wardman Hotel Strategy Team. The Ward 3 Housing Justice Working Group is dedicated to fostering genuinely affordable mixed income housing that includes DC's workforce, low and moderate income, senior and fixed income citizens with a special focus on Ward 3. Mayor Bowser has emphasized the importance of providing more affordable housing, particularly in Rock Creek West, our Wardman Hotel strategy team sees the now vacant Wardman Hotel as a golden opportunity for Ward 3 to go a long way toward meeting the mayor's affordable housing goals. Thank you, Council Member McDuffie, for urging Mayor Bowser to invest $140 million to acquire the Wardman Hotel. We really appreciate it. Our focus is on converting the Wardman to nearly 500 units 
approximately a quarter of the nearly 2,000 affordable housing units the mayor has asked Ward 3 to provide by 2025. So just that one building would get us a quarter of the way towards the mayor's goals. There's no way that goal can be met without bold housing initiatives that are unlike IZ, IZ+, plus, and small percentages of affordable housing set-asides. We ask Deputy Mayor Falciccio to please help with this conversion of the Wardman Hotel to affordable housing by orchestrating all the needed sources of funding. Moving in this direction with the Wardman would enhance the value of the Woodley Park neighborhood, which would become a model citywide for far-sighted economic and community development. Some have talked about converting the Wardman into housing for residents with a range of incomes, zero to 80% of median family income. Another housing model to consider for the Wardman conversion is social housing. Social housing is an affordable housing model that's been hugely successful for decades in European cities including cities with large multi-ethnic populations. It has proven to be a flexible instrument for increasing housing affordability and equity with different versions responsive to local needs and economic conditions. Social housing benefits from local government investment and is managed by the tenants whose red Rents are limited to 30% of their income. Ms. Kasten, I'm going to have to interject. You've gone over your time. Do you have, uh, if you submitted your testimony in writing to the committee? Yes. Great. I have. Can I just go to my last paragraph? Um, I'm going to have to say not yet. Maybe if, if there's time on the other end, we just got so many witnesses today that we want to be able to get through them. Yes, people are very excited by the topic. I'm <laughs> sure they are. You know, I, I know I am. And so. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ted Hollinen, uh, Vice President of Property Group Partners, is next. Uh, good morning, Chairperson McDuffie and Council Member Pinto, uh, members of the committee and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the fiscal year 2022 budget for the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. I'm Ted Hollinen. I'm a VP with Property Group Partners. We're proud to have contributed to the development of the Central Business District over the past 40 years, including most recently Capital Crossing. I'm testifying today to request your support for the mayor's proposal to extend and strengthen PGP's partnership with the district on Capital Crossing through the fiscal year 2022 Budget Support Act so that this project can be completed while growing local businesses and bringing lasting benefits in the once divided core district neighborhoods in the city as a whole. Capital Crossing is one of the largest and most ambitious development projects ever undertaken in the District of Columbia. The three block mixed use project, which broke ground in May of 2015, is built on a deck constructed over I-395 that will repair gap in the Lenfont plan, bridge neighborhoods from Gallery Place to Union Station, create more than 2.2 million square feet of mixed use space in five buildings, two of which are complete. The project supports 4,000 local construction jobs it is expected to increase property tax revenue by more than 40 million per year once completed. The district has long recognized the ambitious nature of the project and that it's an investment in the district's future. In 2010, the council adopted the Center Lake Freeway Pilot and Air Rights Amendment Act, which authorized payments in lieu of taxes to help finance the project ending in fiscal year 2023. Now, through the fiscal year 2022 Budget Support Act, the mayor's proposed to extend a modified version of this pilot through the redevelopment of the Center Lake Freeway Amendment Act of 2021. Under the amendment, 75% of the real property taxes on the center and south blocks of Capital Crossing would be abated for 10 years, beginning in October of 2027, up to 100 million. For PGP to receive the abatement, we have a residential building that must be completed by September 30th of 2027. Additionally, PGP and the district must amend the land distribution agreement to require a hotel on the site to be completed by September 30th of 
of 2030 and all buildings to be completed by September 30th of 2033 to expand economic and to expand economic inclusion requirements. This extension is needed because capital crossing incurred about 150 million in additional costs for reasons beyond anyone's contemplation when the project began. The already ambitious project scope increased to address deferred but peripheral maintenance needs and to meet the evolving design standards for the new I-395 tunnel. We've been in regular communication with the district about challenges the project's costs and timeline, yet we opted to proceed expeditiously to mitigate the impact of construction and disturbance in the neighborhood and transportation network and to deliver the district more than 300 million improvements to the public infrastructure and public space. Mr. Holland? Yes. Your time has expired. Uh, just okay. make sure you submit your written testimony uh, for the record. Oh, thank you very much. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, no worries. Um, we're going to go next, though, to Meg McGuire. And good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. You have three minutes. You are. Uh, Council members McDuffie and Pinto. I am Meg McGuire, a resident of Ward 3, testifying on behalf of the Wardman Hotel strategy team. Thank you, Councilmember McDuffie, for asking the mayor early in this process to purchase the hotel. You really get it. I'm just gonna to cut to the chase here. Our architectural advisors have produced concept studies showing the potential to transform this huge eyesore into a handsome, highly sustainable building with housing, a green roof and revenue production. The large ballrooms, meeting rooms and kitchens can be transformed into classrooms that serve the overcrowded nearby schools, offices for social services, culinary training facilities, a small business incubator, reduced rate spaces for nonprofit conferences and meetings, and active recreation courses, courts. This is a huge opportunity. It's not to be missed, and we cannot dismiss it based on simplistic and unexamined assumptions that it is too expensive that would be a grave mistake. So let's run the numbers. We are asking you to work with Deputy Mayor Felicicchio in a rapid response, time limited marathon to estimate both costs and revenues under at least two different scenarios. One is social housing and, and the other is mixed opportunity housing for residents earning zero to 80% MFI. The city will provide five experts, your best construction cost estimator to make educated get estimates about acquisition, repurposing of existing wings and construction of two additional wings to nearly double the number of units. Expert number two, a real estate lawyer to develop a unique ownership structure by dividing the building into tax lots serving different housing and business owners. Uh, some of these tax lots might be owned by a land trust or limited equity co-op or the city. Others by a business incubator or, uh, or, or even a long-term lease to the public schools. Expert number three, a property management consultant to estimate expenses of a well-run building. Expert number four, a business consultant to estimate revenues from businesses and rents. And expert number five, a financing expert to recommend funding options, including grants and bonds, city and federal subsidies. Surely if DC can find a way to finance a ballpark, a soccer stadium, the wharf, and many more projects, we can find a way to fund acquisition of the wharf. Our team is contacting schedulers in your offices to set up a half hour Zoom presentation and discussion of the visual concept study. Or if you can make it in this busy season, we'd love to have you actually visit and uh, have a, a meeting on site. Time is of the essence. Let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Just really quickly, have you heard, uh, have you reached out to the deputy mayor's office? And if so, have you heard back? Have you communicated your ideas to the deputy mayor's office? Yes, we have reached out and we are um, hoping to have a, a, a meeting with them. Um, we think that your continued support could elevate the opportunity here. And I think that's very, very important. This has been dismissed too quickly. Let's 
let's figure out what we can really do with this building and sure. make it a national and international model. Right. No, I appreciate that. It's very intriguing. Uh, I, I think it's uh, innovative and it has not been dismissed by, by, um, by certain members of the council for sure. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. Next is Nick Deladon. Good morning. You can give me your testimony. Uh, good morning, Council Member McDuffie and my own uh, Council Member um, Brooke Pinto. Um, I represent this morning the um, Wardman Hotel Strategy Team, and uh, we're dedicated to uh, helping the mayor reach her goal of affordable housing, which has been a stubborn uh, so far uh, in reaching its goal. Uh, there is more and more uh, recognition that the mayor's ambitious program uh, is not being reached and cannot be reached. And uh, since the announcement of the bankruptcy of the Wardman Hotel, a grassroots effort has begun across the city and in Ward 3 to utilize the Wardman Hotel in converting it to useful housing for mixed uh, incomes and um, and to help the mayor uh, reach her goal. Um, so far, we've had uh, uh, a response from Council Member Gray. Council Member Bonds last week called it a dream project. And of course, uh, you, uh, more than the others, have stepped forward and asked the mayor for 140 million. Um, and she turned us down. She turned you down, she turned us down. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It has many, uh, uh, many, um, uh, positive um, features to it, uh, as uh, Meg has already uh, pointed out. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about social housing. Uh, our organization that I lead, the uh, DuPont East Civic Action Association and TENAC, we're responsible for inserting into the comp plan, which was recently passed, the option of social housing and uh, that it should be taken seriously as a viable option in affordable housing. Uh, it is uh, really groundbreaking and it needs to be addressed. Um, it would be, uh, under the uh, social housing model, the property would be owned by the city, the buildings would be constructed by the city, and the uh, tenants would uh, manage the property as a co-op. Uh, rents are limited to 30% of your income so that you'd automatically get a mixed income uh, group and um, uh, it seems to me that it's a serviceable um, option. I, I invite, I join uh, my uh, collaborators in inviting you to a tour and uh, my own ward uh, council member, Brooke Pinto, if she's uh, available, it would be an, an eye-opening opportunity and we're glad to share our materials with you. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Next. Um, how do you pronounce your name? Last name is Lai Fong. Good morning. My name is Pai Yang Li Fong. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. I'm a DC res resident testifying on behalf of several, several members of a DC cooperative stakeholders group. We are a collective of individuals and organizations committed to establishing co-ops in DC. For the past four years, this group has identified a number of issues that co-ops in DC face. This testimony is intended to educate DC government agencies about the importance of supporting co-ops and a local co-op ecosystem that will make them grow and thrive. At the turn of the 20th century for poor and working class communities, co-ops served as local self-help business organizations that created and maintained local jobs. As businesses owned and controlled by the people who use their services, co-ops have helped their members increase their income and build wealth. Black farmers have relied on strong co-op systems to sustain and thrive amid prejudice and racism. Black civil rights organizations and leaders have promoted and implemented co-op self-help models. In DC, Mayor Berry was a strong proponent of co-ops and many black co-ops thrived under his, his leadership. Nowadays, DC is more than just a black and white city. Many different communities have made their homes in DC. Today's DC workforce include Latinos with limited English, US vets, people with different mental and physical abilities, LGBTQs, 
justice involved people, Asians struggling with anti-Asian hate, and a bevy of gig workers filling in the work filling in the workforce gaps of big companies not willing to hire more employees. For all, co-ops offer good tools and good models for self-help, enabling DC residents to succeed and thrive together as members of a more racially and economically just DC. Furthermore, lasting bonds between co-ops will forge solidarity and promote mutual benefits across different racial and economically marginalized communities. However, co-ops require a supportive environment that provides technical and financial assistance tailored to their unique structures, goals, and needs. At the present, DC lacks sufficient density of co-ops and first secondary co-op institu institutions as well. For DC to realize the potential of co-ops, strong networked secondary institutions must also be created. After the pandemic, and race-related unrest, DC and the rest of the country are looking at rebuilding the economy stronger and better. Co-op models are excellent tools to meet those goals. We have three key recommendations. One, to provide seed funding to research and, 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 and analyze DC's co-ops and co-op ecosystems needs, such as funding, financing, technical assistance, like legal and business development. Two, to provide seed funding to support pilot projects for co-op startups that will develop business models for specific industry sectors and targeted worker communities, and three, to establish a co-op trust fund where funding partners, private sector partners, and private citizens can add to city resources. Right Thank on. you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm available to answer questions. And thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, final witness on this panel is James Shabazz. And good morning, I see your name on the screen. If you could turn on your video and unmute yourself to provide testimony. Going once, going twice. Okay, uh, staff, let's leave James Sebastian there. Uh, I don't have any questions for this panel. I'm sure there'll be some follow-up and you all, if you have not already provided written testimony, please do so. Uh, I want to thank each of you for taking time out of your mornings to provide witness testimony to the committee. We're going to move next to, you can leave James Abbas and the participant panel just in case. Well, it looks like we may have lost them. Um, Leona Agordis, who's executive director of Golden Triangle Bid. Christina Noel, executive director of Anacostia Bid. Jerry Whittacom, director and of Economic Development, Downtown DC bid. Richard Lake, Founding Principal, Roadside Development. Doug Fristenberg, Principal, Stonebridge. Jair Lynch, President CEO, Jair Lynch, Real Estate Partners. I think we've got some folks who've, who've transitioned in. We're going to go ahead and begin with Leona Agordis. Executive Director, Golden Triangle Bid. And yeah. good morning to you. Good morning, Cal uh, Chairperson McDuffie, Council Member Pinto, and members of the staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on DEMPED's FY22 budget. My name, as you said, is Leona Agaritas, and I'm the executive director of the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District. Um, the BID is an award-winning nonprofit that enhances the Golden Top Triangle neighborhood from DuPont Circle to Pennsylvania Avenue by providing a clean, safe, and vibrant area and attracting and retaining businesses. I'm testifying in support of the COVID-19 Robust Recovery Initiatives Act of 2021, which the mayor has proposed in her FY22 BSA. 
This act will enable the launch of a new innovation district centered on Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House and Washington Circle. COVID-19 has highlighted an issue that the bid has long recognized. The district cannot afford to have a CBD that is a monoculture of office uses. This is why we've been working with GW on an innovation district since long before the pandemic. The Golden Triangle now has 7 million square feet of vacant office space. Vacancy along this section of Pennsylvania Avenue tops 23%. Unfortunately, failure of the CBD will have an impact way beyond the Golden Triangle borders. It's time to diversify the district's office sector and transform this key area of the CBD in, so that it can help support the district's equitable and resilient recovery. Um, an innovation district, according to Brookings, is a geographic area where leading edge anchor institutions and companies cluster and connect with startups, business incubators, and accelerators. The Penn Avenue Inno District would attract established companies to anchor the ecosystem, encourage our startups to remain in the city, and attract new tech companies to grow here. The district already has a vibrant early stage ecosystem, but many startups relocate to other jurisdictions, um, including our neighbors in, in Maryland and Virginia, with stronger incubation, acceleration, and funding resources. By keeping our startups here and bringing in new entrepreneurs and businesses to the city, we will help drive job creation and bring employees back to the Central Business District. The mayor's proposed investment in her FY22 budget will be vital in launching the Inno District. The bid is already taking the first step in by formulating, formulating an action plan to identify specific needs, establish the inner district structure, identify catalyst, catalytic projects, and intentionally and thoughtfully plan for inclusive innovation, including investments in minority and women-owned businesses and workforce development through apprenticeship and entrepreneurship training. The mayor's proposed investment will support the initial implementation of the Inno District so that it will grow and promote a more resilient, equitable, and diversified economy during the recovery and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Yeah, and it appears at the time it disappeared. I'm not sure what that was about, but I, I do appreciate you summarizing thank you. the end of your testimony. Uh, I do appreciate it. Um, we're going to go next to... Christina Noel, Executive Director, Anacostia Bid. Actually, I do not, see. not present. Okay, uh, Jerry Whitcomb is present. Good morning, good morning, Council. Good morning. Um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to testify today on the uh, fiscal 2022 budget uh, for DEMPED. Um, my name is Jerry Whitcomb. I'm the Director of Economic Development for the Downtown Business Improvement District, and I'm a Ward 1 resident. Uh, Neil Albert, our president and CEO, expresses his regrets as he could not give testimony today, as he is involved, as you know, with the DC Housing Authority board matters today. Um, I will address the DEMPED budget after a few general economic development and overall budget comments, hitting the highlights of our written testimony, which I won't read verbatim today. Uh, downtown is a significant and economic fiscal contributor uh, to DC. Over the past few weeks, there's been more activity in downtown and DC. Um, as of April, our jobs are down only 57,000 uh, from pre-pandemic, which is better than the 70,000 they were down in April of 2020. I'm cautiously optimistic that the downtown and DC economies will strong, show strong signs of an accelerating recovery and higher revenue estimates for the city over the coming months. A major concern is the office market's record high vacancy rates that Leona mentioned and its impact on the budget. In the February estimates, the CFO pointed out that they were reducing the assessments of the large office buildings, which means that the fiscal 2022 revenues will be down by 121 million. It should be noted the 9.7% reduction uh, compares to stocks of publicly traded uh, office companies like JBG and Boston Properties that are down 15 to 20%. So this could continue and, and should be a highlight 
uh, should be a focus of any economic development strategy. The bid is also greatly troubled by the Zoning Commission's exploration of the expansion of inclusionary zoning to all building conversions uh, and into the de-zoning areas. And my testimony has more information on that. Overall, the mayor's budget is a strong budget for the city social contract, addressing many existing inequalities in the city. Um, in addition to the DEMPED budget, there are significant economic development investments being made in other sections of the mayor's proposed budget. I'll highlight the K Street Transit Way and the 67 million to purchase some buildings for permanent supportive housing and other affordable housing needs. Um, now on to DEMPED. During the pandemic, DEMPED has risen to the occasion. Our testimony lists many things that show their strong performance during that period. I would say strong community engagement has been a highlight of that, whether it's disposition of buildings or property, uh, but it also engaging on programs such as their grant program. Now to their 2022 budget, there's a dramatic increase in funding, which is mainly due to one-time investments. And I think our testimony includes a list of those. And um, importantly, the FTEs only increased by one from 90 to 91. So we think that's a reasonable um, FTE request and the bid supports the mayor's current budget proposal for DEMPED. However, the downtown DC bid feels that downtown deserves additional investments in three areas to encourage a return to the office by office workers, to reduce the record high levels of vacancy in the downtown and to support the hotel industry. Our testimony includes more information on that, but when dealing with the office vacancy rate, there's two ways to deal with it, reduce supply and increase demand. And I think we should deal with both of those. Uh, reducing supply would be supporting the conversion of office projects uh, to residential or other uses. And the hotel industry, as you pointed out in your May 2021 letter to Mayor Bowser, uh, needs some uh, additional support. Their revenues continue at about 20% of pre-pandemic levels. Mr. We look forward to working with you, um, the Mayor, Ward 2 Councilmember Brooke Pinto, and finding additional funding uh, for these important initiatives and other needs such as the Wardman Park uh, uh, proposals that you've heard about. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much for the... And thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, Christina Noel is with us and so we're gonna turn to you next. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie. Thank you so much for your patience and council members and staff. Um, I'm Christina Noel. I'm the executive director of the Anacostia Business Improvement District. I'm honored to have this opportunity to testify regarding the fiscal year 2022 budget. As we all know, last year was unprecedented in so many ways. Moreover, the coronavirus pandemic and the civic engagement surrounding inequalities and injustice have drawn acute attention to the economic disparities that disproportionately affect primarily communities east of the river. Our businesses and residents in the Anacostia Business Improvement District in Ward 8 have lost significant revenues due to COVID-19, along with the highest unemployment rate before the shutdown. Our communities have been and continue to be the most negatively impacted, whether we are considering the pandemic medical impacts, the pandemic shutdown, economic impacts, or the continued impact of inequalities and, the, and, and inequities. It is amid the challenge, uh, this challenging landscape that the Anacostia bid has continued to prove itself to be bold by recognizing, defining, and responding to needs of our communities. We continue to work with what we have. However, as the council considers the district fiscal year 22 budget, it is imperative to acknowledge that the East of the River was not strong prior to COVID and the meaning of recovery is different for us. Returning to a normal state would be more of the same prior to COVID. We require additional investment to become strong. This is a powerful opportunity for the district to facilitate impactful change. We call upon the district at this time to demonstrate its commitment to our communities by committing more investment dollars east of the river, east of the river for fiscal year 2022. The Anacostia bid and its, and its executive committee implore the council to truly stand with us by providing increased funding in fiscal year 22 to create real opportunity to sustainability and to maintain and enhance the rich fabric of Anacostia and Ward 8. We stand with our East of the River businesses, owners, communities, and our neighbors in, the, in this call to action. We must be intentional. 
uh, we please know that we're encouraged by the fiscal year 22 budget to name a few line items, the creation of new technical assistance hub that is urgently needed. And when that is built out, please keep our East of the River businesses in mind. Um, it's it's uh, imperative. The increase in funding for great streets, we're very interested in and applaud. The uh, bridge fund for arts rep venues to support their successful reopening is key. The development of action, an action plan to overhaul the license and, license and permitting system, uh, very important to our businesses to help keep them running and to keep them sustainable. Uh, support for improvements in the business districts to promote placemaking and vibrancy and waiving all DC government fees for community organizations to host um, events across the district. Very important at this time. And of course, attention to the need uh, to focus on streetscapes. This is just a, uh, a small listing. Um, there's a lot more that we like, but wanted to point these out. The Mr. Anacostia Robert, bid has the, pro oh, sorry. Your time has expired. Okay, well, thank you. I did submit my information, uh, additional information, um, and I hope you have a chance to take a look at that. Well, we definitely will. I appreciate you submitting it. Next, uh, we have Richard Lake, and good morning to you. You can begin your testimony. Great, good morning, uh, and thank you, Council Members McDuffie and Pinto for allowing me to participate in today's hearing on the current proposed budget. Uh, I have spent the past 25 years of my career working to grow our local economy working to attract national, regional, and local retailers to my native city, recognizing that these businesses not only generated needed revenue for the city's coffers, but provided jobs and future careers to her citizens, elevating the quality of life for the district, attracting billions of dollars of investments to improve our neighborhoods and our offerings. Economic development is quality of life development. At this time, the city is clearing away the rubble from its path as it stands up after the greatest public health challenge in over a hundred years. The statistics tell the story that an, an inequitable society leads to inequity in all things, especially in life and death. COVID turned a bright light of the effects of the risk and consequences to inequity, a vastly disproportionate outcome for people of color, not only in Washington, DC, but throughout our nation. This budget is critical in taking the correct steps to improve the lives of all citizens in the district, to put the city on the correct path, because what we do now in the next six months will determine our economic future and the quality of life we provide for a generation. We lost 47% of our small and local businesses. We have seen the impact of the loss of 38,000 jobs in the hospitality and food industry alone. It will take an enormous effort to restore this treasured engine of our economy to recreate the momentum that was created with 20 years of hard work to train a new generation of entrepreneurs to raise billions of private capital to just reopen to our previous level at 2019 will take all of our efforts. Commercial vacancy rates were rising prior to COVID and now are only exasperated by this crisis. With only 12 to 15% daily occupancy, the ecosystem of downtown has been gutted. With nearly 20% of the office space vacant, downtown will continue to struggle. We need to rethink our approach on attraction and, re and retention of our employees, employers. Rethink our use of activation of our open space, look at zoning regulations that make it difficult to adapt to a rapidly changing marketplace, infrastructure investment that makes access to downtown easier. Without a vibrant downtown, the city will lose tremendous percentage of its annual budget and a vital tool in attracting bond financing for its ever-growing capital needs. Residential development is poised to stall. The cranes you see today are the product of projects that began the process years ago. The inventory of new units will slow, putting more pressure on market rents. The city must help the residential sector by first doing no harm. No more regulations that challenge the economics of housing production. This ecosystem is fragile, especially on the heels of the health emergency and the draconian approach and restrictions that negatively impacts market rate housing. Without the work of so many in improving the economic footprint of the city, we would not be discussing a budget of this magnitude. The work must begin again. We must not hesitate in investing in our future and rebuild our economy equitably. Targeted approach to attract and retain employers, invest in attracting high-tech industries, Grow our entrepreneurial stock by investing in small businesses, 
Mr. activate the city to attract more visitors. It sounded like you were you were about to wrap it up. Uh, your yes. testimony. And I'm gonna go ahead and let uh, the next person go. And and I know you probably already submitted your written testimony, but I'll have a round as with Councilmember Pinto, where I'm sure we would like to hear a little bit more from you. Okay. Doug Fristenberg is next on the list, and I see that he is with us. Councilmember, can you hear me? Yep, and and we we uh, we've noted, Mr. Shabazz, that you rejoined us. I'm gonna let you go after I conclude this panel. So if you could just stand by, thanks. Doug Fristenberg, good morning. Good morning, Councilmember Duffy, Councilmember Pinto. Thank you for your time and appreciate the opportunity to testify. Uh, your opening comments, uh, Councilmember Duffy, made me think back to uh, my experience with this pandemic, which was really honed by my wife. Uh, installed the flags in front of RFK uh, this fall when, and she planted up to, up to 267,000 flags when she ran out of the room. And while I'm here to support uh, DEMPED's budget request, I didn't want to mention how wonderful events DC was and, and helping Suzanne uh, make that installation happen so we could honor the uh, victims of uh, this terrible tragedy. Um, but we're, we're trying to move forward. And I think we're, uh, you know, at a great place here, uh, the, the district is poised uh, to uh, address recovery, equity, fairness, and hopefully achieve long-term success and build a great foundation for the future. Um, it's very important as we look at the pillars of the plan here and realize how important they are. As Richard just talked about, we've got to be very smart about housing. Um, a big push in affordable housing is a moment in time and a generational opportunity. And great to see that happen. Uh, in particular, though, we want to point out that the HANTA program approved last year, we're hoping we can get that program indexed so we can create more um, middle income housing to go with all affordable housing. Uh, and that's something we would like to talk about specifically in this year's budget support. Um, also, as we've talked about, hardest hit small business hospitality. Um, really have great tools at Destination DC, Events DC, and the bids to leverage up our investments and to get push the uh, recoveries of change and helpfulness there. Um, I do think the equity food access is a long talk about issue. It's one I've struggled with. How do we get more of that, in particular, in grocery stores east of the river? It's a big challenge. It's going to take a lot of money and smart programs. So I think revisiting that is a key element. And last, uh, uh, not least, is you know downtown, the vibrancy uh, and the growth and getting people back downtown is going to be critical. But also we need to grow jobs. And I think the conversation about jobs uh, being part of this future is great. I um, was thrilled not to see any new regulations, taxes in this budget. I think that's extremely important. Um, and the competitiveness is something we have to constantly keep an eye on. So I think having that added to the discussion here as we recover and we look forward is critical. And uh, uh, Councilmember Pinto, you don't know this much about me, but Councilmember McDuffie does. I would be loath not to bring up my favorite uh, UDC institution and hope as part of the recovery efforts, we look at great strategic programs that we may be able to do. Councilmember, like the AWS uh, partnership and to create something that really does allow you to see to further its mission to help the pathways to the middle class because that's the fundamental long-term opportunity we have here. I look forward to working with you to do that. And I will finish because I'm seven seconds over time. And thank you uh, for summarizing. I'm going to turn next to Jair Lynch and good morning. You can begin your session. Good morning, uh, Councilmember McDuffie and Councilmember Pinto. It's good to see you. Um, uh, I'd like to um, summarize my written testimony to make sure I'm within the three minutes. Uh, but first of all, my name is Jair Lynch. I'm president, CEO of Jair Lynch Real Estate Partners. We are, are a, a DC-based locally owned real estate investment and development company with more than two decades of experience creating extraordinary places, including neighborhood assets, uh, such as the Martin Luther King Library, schools, primary care facilities, as well as office, retail, and housing across the income spectrum around the city. We're proud of to be from DC and bolster other local talent throughout the value chain from the professional services to subcontractors to locally owned businesses and retailers. 
For instance, Highlands Cafe and Chicken and Whiskey will be opening soon at our projects at shops at Penn Branch and Wood 7 and Chicken and Whiskey at the Envy uh, across from National Park uh, in Ward 6. I'm joining you today to thank you uh, and all the elected officials and the administration for their incredible and invaluable work through this pandemic and express my opinion for the need for laser focus on the entire ecosystem that will set the course for an equitable and competitive, competitive city going forward. Quickly to summarize background, um, our population growth is waning. In the early 2000s, we had over a thousand people moving a month uh, to the district, topping 15,000 people per year in 2013. But now with the emergence of walkable urban places in Maryland, and especially in Virginia, our population has been less than 5,000 per year in both 2019 and 2020. In addition, our production of new housing has been subpar. Uh, the Council of Governments has indicated that the region is sorely lagging behind in terms of production and projections suggesting that nearly 320,000 units are needed by 2030. This is 75,000 more than previously projected. Uh, that's 30% more than previously contemplated. And we all know that 30% more of anything is much more work. The lack of production of housing matters as it increases pressure on existing housing and often makes it unattainable for many of our residents. We need a healthy housing ecosystem that produces and preserves housing across the income levels and geographic boundaries. Remember, if parts and pieces of our ecosystems, ecosystem are weak and underperforming, the entire system fails. For instance, construction starts declined 34% between 2019 and 2020, and may decline to 45% in 2021, according to Delta Associates. We've also have, we also have strains in the preservation space. Remember, TOPA has been told during the public emergency, and like many other components of the existing housing system, uh, we, we have been uh, on pause for the last year. So less than five major transactions happened in 2020, which affects funding of housing production trust fund, but more importantly, in the cases of affordable preservation, slows down much needed renovation and repositioning work, which impacts the quality of life of our, many of our residents, uh, most of which have been at home for the past year. These interdependent factors make the ecosystem very fragile. We need to build new affordable units and renovate existing stock, but instead much has been delayed or has been in limbo. Recommendations. A point of, Let's, point of uh, contact. Your, your time is uh, expired. So I'm happy I, to answer questions and get through the recommendations uh, via the panel. Yeah, I'll use uh, some of my time to, to hear a little bit more about your recommendations uh, on the round that we do after this, but I have one witness who um, uh, for te technological reasons uh, was dropped earlier and, and he's rejoined us. So I'm gonna turn now to James Shabazz. If you could turn on your video and unmute yourself. You have three minutes to testify. Okay. Okay. Start now. Yes, you can begin. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I am James Shabazz, spokesman for OVEC, Organized Vendors for Economic Cooperation, and team member of the Wardman Hotel uh, Development Committee. We want to talk briefly about the vision of the Wardman Project and why we have petitioned the D.C. government to provide tax dollars to purchase the property and help fund uh, our projects. Our vision is to help create racial equity for Black D.C., by using the Wardman property as a vehicle for cooperative ownership of homes and businesses at the site. Racial equity is derived through home ownership and entrepreneurship and by transferring wealth to the next generation. This cooperative model would not only create homes and businesses opportunities uh, for homeless and formerly homeless persons, but those who earn under $40,000 per year Families, students, veterans, and the unemployed would be invited to share in this opportunity. Uh, homes and businesses would be owned by members of the cooperative. Jobs on site, such as maintenance, uh, landscaping, construction repairs, and others would be performed by cooperative members and their families. Uh, we would seek to maintain a portion of the hotel site as a hotel creating uh, a, uh, the only black owned hotel service in the city. 
establishing jobs and contracting opportunities for those who seek racial equity by doing for self. We would also establish a cooperatively owned credit union, allowing us to harness and collectively leverage the credit union assets. This vision is rooted in the economic self-sufficiency models of the Booker T. Washington post-slavery uh, Tuskegee projects 100 years ago and the contemporary development model of the United House of Prayer for All People right here in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And thank you for your patience and, and sticking around. I'm glad we were able to get you back on to, to hear your testimony. Yes, sir. Staff, we're gonna do uh, a couple of, uh, a round for, for Councilman Pinto and myself. I'm gonna use the, uh, and I wanna thank each of you for your testimony here this morning. I'm gonna use uh, about a minute, minute and a half. Mr. Lynch, if you wanna uh, speak to your recommendations. Yes, uh, recommendations, a point, a single point of contact for all housing issues a captain who can think about the larger goal of ensuring the ecosystem is functioning across the city, support the additional investments in the budget for, for affordable housing, but diversify the implementation tools. We need to expand the toolbox. As Doug mentioned, operationalize the existing programs such as HANTA. The regulations need to be completed and we need to index them. We continue the investment in key infrastructure projects that in, in, ignite future development. This is essential to meet the mayor's ambitious goal of 36,000 new units. And then finally, support the mayor's expansion of the local rent support, uh, rental su supplemental program. This is an important step to adding the number of tools to tackle affordable housing. The, the low income tax credit program, often coupled with a housing production trust fund, is only utilized by a small set of highly specialized housing providers. LSRP can be used by more housing providers with a variety of capital sources, especially CDE housing providers with project sizes that vary from two to 200 units or more. So we need to make sure we're expanding the tools to make sure we can, we can tackle this, this daunting housing crisis that we have. Thank you for that. Let me ask, you just mentioned, especially for CBEs and that last part of your answer, I kind of want to hone in on that just briefly with, with the time that I, I have, at least a couple of minutes of it. I think uh, the folks who, who, who are doing development uh, on this panel uh, know well that I've, I've really pushed hard to uh, broaden the scope of the types of people who can, who can do development in the District of Columbia and, and um, have been meeting extensively over the last several years with minority uh, developers and, and was uh, brought an initiative to the to the mayor and the deputy mayor, which they, uh, uh, I, I'm thankful, uh, did decide to proceed with, which is the equitable RFP. Uh, you all represent, you know, large successful uh, developers, uh, yet I think the opportunity for emerging developers of color and women remains an intractable issue. And so um, talk to me a little bit about whether you think or how else DIMPED could support expanding opportunities for developers of color and women? I'll, I'll take that um, on. I think that DEMPED has uh, stepped to the plate uh, as it relates to making sure that diversity inclusion is part of all their RFPs. But I always find it, uh, and there are other tools as well, but making sure that the the RFPs meet the market and meet those emerging uh, emerging developers where they are is really important. Uh, continuing to make sure, advertise, and make sure people are utilizing things like the McKinney Act out of the DC Housing Finance Agency, because the first dollars are always the most expensive dollars. And if the district can support those emerging developers early in the process, that makes all the difference in the world. Because once a project is formulated, capital flows are a lot easier. And so the district can support in those two ways, but also making sure that our tools aren't really for the highly specialized folks that work through just through the low income tax credit program. If you wanna be able to develop affordable housing, you should be able to use HANTA regardless of your project size. If you wanna develop affordable housing and middle income housing, you should be able to utilize the local rent supplement program regardless of size. All of those things matter and will, will allow the ecosystem to, to function but also create the equity that we're looking for for CV and emerging developers. Got it. All right. Uh, if, sure. Ms. Lake? Yeah, also, uh, also one other thing to reiterate, um, what Jair was saying 
it's also the size of the developments matter. So if you're if you're if you're putting regulations that limit how someone can develop a five or to ten unit condo project and make it more difficult for that developer, no matter who they are, it makes it more difficult for them to raise the capital. So if we really want to foster and bring up a whole new class of developers and grow it out of the city um, and have a, an inclusionary process, we need to make it easier for them to access the marketplace. Okay, I appreciate that point. Um, with my, my remaining time, I just wanted to ask about the bids. We had um, a couple of folks representing bids on this call. I think it's $14 million I saw uh, in grants to assist bids. Do you all have insights on how that would be split? Uh, did they give you any, any insights on that? Um, I, so I can, I can speak for the golden triangle portion of it. Um, in the 14 million that was set aside between, uh, for the golden triangle and Acostia and Southwest waterfront, uh, 4 million of that is for the innovation district specifically. Um, and, um, so that's, that's the answer to that question. And then in other portions of the budget, my understanding is that DEMPED is going to be meeting with the bid council and I'm the chairman of the bid council um, to kind of be talking about that. And they're, they're coming to our next meeting on Tuesday. So I believe that will begin the beginning of those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Kenyon, uh, council member Duffy from the downtown bids point of view, all bids um, have different needs. And so we are supportive of this funding uh, for our, our fellow bids. You know, the, the city has funded Elvis with Franklin Park. You know, we have our own needs. You know, we'll be coming back to you soon with the Capital One Arena lease, which is really important to anchoring downtown. Um, so every bid is slightly different. And the innovation district that Leona has going is a great idea. Um, what's going on in the Anacostia and the Southwest bid are also uh, very strong ideas and we support them. Okay, yeah. You're gonna say, I think you were starting yeah. this. Yeah. Um, the Anacostia bid, I believe uh, 6 million is, is is attributed um, to to us uh, for placemaking and vibrancy. Um, and uh, we'd be focused on really creating uh, um, an arts, cultural and entertainment district that we can leverage what we have um, that's organically growing there, um, even with our environmental um, and environmental science and um, medical technology that's there too. Uh, okay, I'm gonna turn to Councilmember Pinto. Thank you very much, Chairman McDuffie, and thank you all for your testimony and your partnership throughout this year where everyone's had to be probably more creative um, and hardworking than, than ever before. I, I want to start with Leona. Um, given the Golden Triangle is one of the most areas in the city with fewest residents and the most reliance on businesses and, and office workers to support the, the local businesses, I want to give you a moment to speak about the need for additional clean team member, um, what you've been seeing, and um, any other innovations going on now with Golden Triangle that you need additional support on. Well, we have lots of innovation um, uh, going on right now, um, Council Member, and thank you for the question. And you know, clearly, uh, as you mentioned, we have 34 million square feet of office space. Um, there are 36 residential units. And so that concentration has created a scenario whereby there are about 90% of the people on our streets at any moment and in our buildings. And we've seen that throughout the pandemic. And the what where that has resulted is um, uh, we have had 120 small uh, businesses on the ground floor close permanently. Um, and we do have a, um, a program coming forward that will launch next week that will help to address that through some very creative pop-ups. Um, that is working to identify authentic um, retail to the District of Columbia. And so we're excited about that and more on that later. Um, but this large um, amount of office space that is vacant, the um, 7 million square feet, and I believe Jerry and Neil in the downtown bid have an additional 9 million square feet. Um, we are preparing for not an April shower. We are preparing for a hurricane of historic proportions. And I cannot stress that enough. This is, you know, bring out FEMA and start the, the, the preparations. This is something that we should all be concerned about. 
Um, as far as your question about clean team, we are looking at some innovative ways um, uh, to, um, to bring in some uh, exciting things. I, I'm in conversations and negotiations on some of that, so I can't talk about that. But um, what you are um, talking about specifically, I believe, is the fact that because there are no residents in the Golden Triangle bid, there is a very strong um, uh, down, uh, club scene um, that um, we have in the past done an amazing job of cleaning up after. Um, mm -hmm. We have pedestrian counts on some of our blocks um, at, from midnight to about 3.30 that exceed rush hour counts in front of our major metros, those being, of course, the Farragut's. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for all you do. Uh, Jerry, I want to turn to you. I appreciate your uh, comments and recommendations around reducing vacancy and encouraging our office workers to get back to work, supporting our hotel industry, as well as the conversion ideas, which, as you know, I'm uh, very supportive of. In terms of supports for our hotel industry, there's been some proposals suggested of additional specific grants per room key. You know, we still see some of our properties experiencing only 10 to 20% occupancy rates. And as we think long-term to encouraging uh, Destination DC and tourism and travelers back, which is wonderful, we, we still need to address the immediate needs uh, of some of our hotels that are, are really struggling right now. Um, is that a proposal that you all support? What, it, what have you been hearing from our um, hotel partners that that they need, particularly downtown? Well, um, thank you. Thank you for the question. The, the hotels are, are struggling, and we, and we look at our hotels specifically, but across the district, you know, the revenues are 15 to 20 percent of pre-pandemic. And anytime you lose, you know, 75 to 80 percent of your revenues, you have a hard time. I mean, the, the general managers are greeting you at the desk, they're serving you water, and they're making your bed. Um, you know, the hotel industry employees, as you've heard earlier today, uh, have had the greatest percentage, more restaurant uh, employees lost their jobs, but hotels were down you know, 55 or 60. I think they're still down 50. Um, and then they have their mortgage payments, uh, you know, their, their other fees to go. And so there's, there needs to be a dialogue with them. You know, the deputy mayor did a very good job with the bridge fund and they initially uh, uh, proposed 30 million for the hotels in a per key amount. Some of the international hotels decided not to participate and so this needs probably to be focused more on the locally owned. When you see a hotel that says Hilton, it's actually not owned by Hilton. It's owned by someone else who then has a management agreement under the flag. And so I think there needs to be a conversation. You know, Thomas Penny from Donahue, uh, Jeff Griffiths, they've been leading the charge on this. And I think it's getting together with them and creating a second bridge fund of an appropriate amount uh, to understand where they are today and then to say, how can we help you get to a point in the future? If the hotel demand came back tomorrow, that's a different number than if it comes back in December. Um, and so we are supportive. We'd be happy to help with the exact number, but I think it has to have a conversation uh, with them and probably involving, you know, Greg and Elliot uh, from Events DC and Destination DC to get the best minds working on this. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much, Jerry. And that's certainly something that I would like to work with you and, and Chairman McDuffie on in the coming months. Um, I'm sorry I'm out of time. I, I had other questions for um, Jair and, and, and Richard and Doug, um, but thank you for, for everything. And we'll continue to work together on some of what was highlighted around the, the need to not interject too much in the natural marketplace, particularly for our smaller operators. Um, and Jair will follow up with you to learn more about about how the uh, pilot programs for the workforce housing have, have worked in the last year. So thank you all. Thanks thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Next, we're gonna hear from Kevin Clinton with the Federal City Council, Katie Wycheck with Heinz, Peter Cole, Madison Marquette, Jason Cross with Red Brick, Toby Millman, Brookfield Properties, Caroline Kennedy, Urban Atlantic.
I see that Kevin Clinton has joined us. Uh, we're gonna begin with you and good morning. You can begin your testimony. Thanks. Uh, thank you, council member. Uh, good morning, my name is Kevin Clinton. I'm here on behalf of the Federal City Council. It's a pleasure to testify today on DEMPED's budget for 2022. Um, before speaking specifically to DEMPED, I would like to share that at the Federal City Council, we believe that DC notes both a strong and equitable recovery. None of us will have succeeded if a recovered DC looks the same as the DC that existed before the pandemic. And the mayor's budgetary investments in areas like the digital divide, childcare, K-12 education, career pathways, work-based learning, multimodal transportation, affordable housing, all of these investments will be essential to ensuring an equitable recovery. We believe Mayor Bowser's budget strikes the right balance, avoiding any tax increase, lowering business fees in some cases, while at the same time using federal aid to make one-time investments that will kickstart economic growth. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize DEMPED's tireless work on their recovery. During a difficult year, it has worked closely with employers, particularly those most, most vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic, to understand their needs and to design recovery programs to avoid the worst possible outcomes. And I would say the same for you, council member, and your team. You are receiving this budget at an uncertain time, we don't precisely know how downtown will look next year or the year that follows. We don't know how often federal and other DC workers will telework. And we don't know how all of these trends will impact DC jobs and tax revenue. Now more than ever, we need to be investing in the future growth engines of the economy while we ensure that the proceeds from that growth are more equitably shared. That is why we are pleased to see three new investments in the mayor's proposed budget. The first is the Employment Center Vitality and Local Job Creation Fund, which is designed to help DEMPED attract high impact employers to the district. The second is its investments in enhanced placemaking through the business improvement districts. With these funds, Anacostia will be on a path to an arts district, the Golden Triangle and Innovation District, and the Southwest, an autonomous vehicle district. The third is the business and professional license fee reductions. These will lower the barriers to entry for startups and low-income residents and lower the cost of business for everyone. The regional and national competition for employers and talents is fierce. DC has a great product to sell with wonderful neighborhoods, a highly educated workforce and improving education system and great leadership. But we lack the tools that other jurisdictions have. Virginia provides more incentives for employers to relocate there. DC has higher commercial taxes and more expensive commercial real estate, making it a tougher sell for employers. On top of that, we've all learned how easy it is to telework. We need to give employers more carrots to come back to commercial corridors, to exciting arts, transportation, and innovation districts. We need corridors that will attract attention, buzz, and capital, which will then lead to business activity, tax revenue, and I would emphasize most importantly, it will lead to jobs and wealth building opportunities for DC residents. And finally, we need to give DC's flourishing entrepreneurs a better bridge to transition from startup to sustainable, and lower fees will help. It's an open secret that DC startups generally head out to Reston or Tyson's once they reach a certain size. These investments will help DC be more innovative and keep more businesses here, leveling the playing field with our partners in the suburbs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you for your testimony. Next is Katie Wysak. Good morning to you, and you can begin your testimony when you're ready. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie, members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development, and council members. My name is Katie Wysak, and I'm a Managing Director with Heinz. And I'm honored to be here today to provide this testimony in support of the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Uh, Heinz is a privately held global real estate development, investment, and management firm which has been active in the district since the 1980s with its first office development, Columbia Square. Other Heinz projects include Franklin Square, 1219 Walter Reed. Um, Heinz and my current uh, project focus in partnership with DEMPED is the Parks at Walter Reed, a premier 66 acre redevelopment of the former historic Walter Reed Army Medical Center campus that will ultimately contain about 3.1 million square feet of living, retail, office, and educational uses. The redevelopment of the campus will integrate the formerly closed campus with the city so that it becomes a cohesive part of the surrounding district fabric and an asset to the neighborhood. At 
The park's stem head paid a critical role in engaging the community to I'm going to check with staff. I'm, I am losing this wise second. I'm not the sure you community are. prior to the procurement process to select agreement that we negotiated with them. Uh oh. Anyone else? You may want to turn off her video. Yeah. Maybe try turning off your video. Uh, we lost you for a bit. I'm having yeah bad connection problems today, unfortunately. Let's try that. And is the audio any better? It is. Thanks. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, uh, Jumphead has played a critical role in um, developing a plan for the site and negotiating the land disposition agreement that we um, have with them that establishes important objectives for the district. Uh, for example, the project will include over 450% and 80% of AMI, a new Whole Foods market, ample recreation space, senior housing, and all the developments will achieve lead silver minimum. And we are aligned in these goals that will make the project inclusive and sustainable. Um, beyond our partnership, Dumpet has created important initiatives that we'd like to see continue such as opportunities and programs to draw incentives to underserved communities. This connection at the parks has generated uh, robust the connection is, interest is. from investors from an originally thin end within the site. As a member of the business community, community. okay, I'm so sorry. I, um, do you have, if we need to move on, am I still bad here? So long as we have your written testimony, I, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if Councilman Pinto still here has questions, but um, it, we lost you uh, for a bit uh, on your audio. Okay. Right now, so, but I appreciate. All right. It. Well, I, I apologize for that. And, no, uh, I just want to try to just summarize. If there's anything, then you'd like to summarize briefly. We still. So, yeah. Hmm. I, I think um, in conclusion, um, I'd like to just say that we, we do support the budget and further efforts to help um, facilitate the post-pandemic recovery, especially for commercial and retail tenancy. Um, and with that, thank you. And thank you uh, for your testimony. Next, we have uh, Peter Cole, and good morning to you. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie, uh, members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development and Council members. My name is Peter Cole. I'm Principal and Chief Development Officer of Madison Marquette. And it's an honor to be here today to provide this testimony in support of the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Madison Marquette's a national real estate firm headquartered in Washington, D.C., with investments in excess of $6 billion. Since its formation in 1992, Madison Marquette has gained deep experience, is proud to be co-developer of District Wharf, 3.5 million square foot mixed-use development on the Southwest waterfront, which is heralded among the most su successful in the country. From Washington, we run offices in 13 cities coast to coast. Madison Marquette is proud to have partnered with DEMPED on the development of many projects, including District Wharf, where the city's partnership was unwavering and critical to the project's success. Our partnership with DEMPED now carries forward in the development of the Armed Forces Retirement Home, an extraordinary opportunity to create a community on 80 acres of land in the heart of the city that promises to create a dynamic mixed-use urban oasis intended to stitch the surrounding neighborhoods and the institutions of Petworth, Brooklyn, and Parkview together on the grounds of the home. Madison Marquette with its partner Urban Atlantic competed to be selected as master developer of the Armed Forces Retirement Home site in 2018 and was selected in October of 2019. Since then we've engaged in significant pre-development activity necessarily to develop, deliver approximately 4.5 million square feet of residential, commercial, hospitality and retail all while preserving 25% of the site's open space including the rolling meadows of this historic fight site for the community at large. We're really excited to be working with DEMPED and the city on another development that will deliver the city's residents a vital component of the community and city's continued growth. Our experience with the deputy mayor's office has been exceptional. In fact, we often cite the professionalism and effectiveness of this relationship in Washington as an example of best practices in other cities in the country where we operate. 
As evidenced by all the testimony you're hearing today, DEMPED's work is a key factor in Washington's enjoyment of sustainably favorable conditions in which we all live and conduct business. It's evident that DEMPED's efforts are instrumental to the city's continued growth and vitality across this diverse population. We've seen the effect of many programs and pursuits which bring economic infusions to the vulnerable pockets of the city, which therefore become less vulnerable. Besides developing thousands of units of affordable housing, DEMPED is concentrated on relocating DC government agencies from more stable neighborhoods to neighborhoods that should be thriving. DEMPED has also worked with you, Mr. McDuffie, to induce and pass legislation to recruit, recruit employers and economic development to communities of color. These are just a few of the many initiatives which are emblematic of the importance of DEMPED's work in support of the communities and businesses which make this city flourish. However, the pandemic has had devastating impact on the district's business community and tenancy. It's critical to bolster the growth, growth as every 1% increase in occupancy represents 5,000 new jobs and 40 million in annual in taxes. Along with the rest of the business com community, we viewed the council as our partner and support the same goals of equity, inclusivity, affordable housing and opportunity, especially now as, as we face the challenges brought on by the pandemic. Mr. Cole, your time has expired. Thank you for the opportunity then to present this testimony. And on behalf of Madison Marquette, we're excited to continue the, our work with you. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Jason Cross, next, it's good to see you and good morning. Great to see you, uh, Chairman McDuffie, and good morning to you. Good morning, Councilmember Pinto and members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development uh, and council members. My name is Jason Cross, Vice President, Managing Director with Red Brick l &D. Uh, And as a DEMPED alum, it's uh, truly an honor uh, to be able to provide this testimony in support of the Office of the Deputy Mayors for Planning and Economic Development. Uh, Red Brick l &D, we're a diversified real estate investment management and development firm headquartered right here in the district. Uh, we specialize in large scale mixed use uh, development that ultimately builds people, places uh, and community uh, and doing it in a sustainable way and with a focus on health and wellness and doubly so just given the last year that we've been in. Uh, since 2014, Red Brick has had the pleasure of partnering with MPED on uh, redevelopment of St. Elizabeth's East. Uh, with our partners, we're thrilled to have delivered over 252 units of new apartment homes at St. Elizabeth's, 200 of which were affordable, uh, which contributed 10% of the new uh, affordable housing stock for 2019. We're very proud of that. Also proud to break ground with Dem DEMPED and our partners on uh, 88 affordable townhomes for sale, uh, market rate townhomes, as well as affordable uh, at St. Elizabeth's uh, in March of this year. Next month, uh, we look forward to breaking ground on Whitman Walker's new healthcare facility, bringing jobs, business opportunities, services, and healthy food options uh, to Congress Heights. Certainly now more than ever, we appreciate Mayor Bowser, MPED, uh, your leadership, the council leadership on this important work in the district. Uh, and our partnership with MPED uh, is not just limited to conversations about our ongoing and future development projects, uh, as MPED has also served as a valuable thought partner and leader uh, to us on economic development and community engagement matters. Uh, DEMPED has embraced the Opportunity Zone program to align incentives for investment in underserved communities uh, and has worked with you, uh, Chairman McDuffie, to introduce and pass legislation to recruit employers and to bring economic development to communities of color. We appreciate uh, that DEMPED is relocating DC government agencies from more advantaged neighborhoods uh, to neighborhoods in need of investment and economic activation. Uh, DEMPED's work, your work, Council Members Gray and Trayon White on food equity and bringing healthy grocery options to Ward 7 and 8 is vital to our work together on food security. Under Deputy Mayor Falcecchio and his head of real estate, Soros Opadwala, uh, they understand the needs of balancing the city's needs as well as the needs of the private sector. So, uh, Ms. Latrina Owens, Director of St. Elizabeth's, uh, and James Parks have consistently shared time and critical information with the Red Brick team, uh, enhancing our community engagement efforts, uh, particularly in Congress Heights. Finally, we understand the needs for policies and programs to support the district's economic engines, uh, which powers the finances that provide for all of our residents in all eight wards uh, and will allow us to continue to grow our services for everyone, keeping us on solid footing for decades to come. These efforts have helped stabilize the district's economy during the pandemic. And these efforts and those like them will help the district as we recover from the pandemic. Again, I'm pleased to present this testimony in support of MPED. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight a few ways Red Brick and ultimately district residents benefited from the partnership with this agency. On behalf of Red Brick, LMD, we are excited to continue our work together. I uh, look forward to sharing updates on our progress with you, Chairman McDuffie, uh, and the Committee on Business and Economic Development. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. 
Uh, don't see Toby Millman. So we're going to turn next to Caroline Kenny. Good to see you. Begin your testimony. You're muted. How's that? That's better. How's that? All right, great. Uh, good to see you. Um, good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie, members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development and Council members. My name is Caroline Kenny. I'm the Managing Director of Public-Private Ventures for Urban Atlantic, and it's a real honor to be here today to provide this testimony in support of the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Our company develops and invests in commercial real estate projects that serve as catalysts for vibrant, inclusive neighborhood development. Much of our work is located in the district. We have enjoyed a strong working relationship with many district agencies through public-private partnerships for over two decades. Most recently, we are proud to have partnered with DIMPED on the redevelopment of 66 acres of the former Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Located in Ward 4, the parks at Walter Reed is one of the largest mixed-income, mixed-use communities in the district. At full build-out, it will include over 2,200 new homes, 440 of them affordable, over 500,000 commercial square feet, and over 20 acres of open space. Urban Atlantic, alongside our partners Hines and Trident Development Group, began our parks partnership with the district in 2013 when we were selected as the master developer through a competitive RFP process. Together, DIMPAD and our joint venture negotiated terms for a project that will deliver tremendous economic development benefits for district residents, a process that also included negotiating a fair price to purchase the property from the Army. The park's ground lease was executed in late 2016, and in just over four years, 40% of planned residential units are complete or under construction, 70% of retail is under construction, including Whole Foods Market, over 100 million in CBE contracting has been completed. More than 20 annual community events are held at the site and hundreds of community engagement meetings have been held. At full build out, the parks is projected to generate over $35 million in new annual tax revenues to the district. We look forward to continuing to work with DIMPED on the parks and projects like it in the future, including our newest opportunity, as Peter mentioned a moment ago, in partnership with Madison Marquette, the development, a redevelopment of 80 acres within the Armed Forces Retirement Home in Ward 5. The Deputy, Mayor, the Deputy Mayor's office has been a very strong partner to us. They hold us accountable to our commitments and work collaboratively with us to achieve them. They've also led the charge to develop an economy that serves all city residents, something for which I'm particularly grateful as a district resident myself. A few of their initiatives that I would like to highlight include one of the country's most aggressive commitments and the programs to back it up to develop tens of thousands of affordable housing units. Strategic relocations of DC government agencies to neighborhoods where their economic development impact is significant. Leveraging the Opportunity Zone program to attract investment to underserved communities. Partnering with you, Mr. McDuffie, to introduce and pass legislation to recruit employers and bring economic development to communities of color. And working on a national platform and international in some cases to attract small and large businesses to the district to continue contributing to our economic engine. I respectfully encourage the committee to support the mayor's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. Our city has enjoyed great prosperity over the past decade, and this administration and council have worked hard to responsibly and equitably spread the wealth. Now, a moment when we are hopefully coming out of the pandemic is not the time to put the brakes on the business community, one of our city's most foundational economic engines. Ms. Kenny? And FY28, are we done? Thank yeah. you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. I think uh, Councilmember Pinto uh, may have stepped away uh, briefly. I know there are multiple hearings going on right now. I, I don't have any questions uh, for the panel. I do appreciate the testimony. And I'm sure over the course of this budget process, we're going to be engaged with some of you uh, on, on what the committee is doing. And so thank you uh, for your contributions this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to have Harold Pettigrew. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have Harold Pettigrew, Keith Sellers, Japa Bowles, Ryan Bose, Rahana Muhammad, Beth Wagner, and Alejandra Zolodowski.
Staff, do we have Harold Padugu? Yes, sir. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and proceed. Give me a moment, please, thank you. Mr. Pettigrew, you can go ahead and proceed. Good morning to you, thank you. Good morning, Chair McDuffie. Uh, and good morning to members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. I am Harold Pettigrew and I serve as CEO of the Washington Area Community Investment Fund. WACIF is a nonprofit community development organization whose mission uh, is to promote equity and economic opportunity in underserved neighborhoods uh, in the Washington DC metropolitan area and fulfills its mission by providing small business advisory services and capital to underrepresented entrepreneurs. Supporting resiliency and economic recovery is central to WACIF's mission and reflective of our work to support small businesses. As a leading CDFI in 2020, WACIF served nearly 1,900 clients through technical assistance and capital deployed with over $11 million in grants, loans, and debt relief to support small businesses. These activities represented WACIF's ability to deliver high impact technical assistance and deploy needed capital to small businesses through the development of dynamic corporate, philanthropic, and public partnerships, including our partnerships with DEMPED. Through these efforts, our work directly supported nearly 19,000 jobs across the city. In 2021, WACIF is on track to deploy nearly $20 million through grants, loans, PPP, and debt relief to support continued efforts for small business recovery and resilience. And as a CDFI, WACIF has deployed new small business technical assistance approaches in 2021, including the launch of a new business center focused on women entrepreneurs of color, and will be launching in the coming months new centers focused on employee ownership and support of worker-owned cooperatives and, and small business resilience to help small businesses to thrive through the normalcy of disruption. In, in speaking in support of the ambitious FY 2022 proposed budget for DEMPED, there are key highlights illustrated uh, and wake of impact narrative to elevate. To execute on capital deployment, DEMPED partnered with CDFIs like WACIF to efficiently and at scale deploy capital to small businesses across the city and provide trusted technical assistance to help build the capacity of entrepreneurs to navigate the environment. In reviewing the budget, I was pleased to see proposed investments to help small businesses to recover with specific focus on new strategies to support small business recovery and growth, food access, and place-based investments. Now is a time where the city must be ambitious in its investments and central uh, to the ability for all of those efforts to be successful as partnership with CDFIs and a focus on capacity building for small businesses through technical assistance initiatives like the Small Business Technical Assistance Hub, which are critical to economic recovery. I would like to thank you for your leadership, Mr. Chair, uh, as a champion for small businesses and the small business ecosystem. Your support for small businesses contribute directly to wake of success uh, in meeting its mission and our ability to invest in small businesses that anchor our communities. We applaud the committee's commitment and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony, Mr. Pettigrew. We're gonna turn next to Keith Sellers. Good morning to you, Mr. Sellers, you begin your testimony. Actually, we're in the afternoon now. Good afternoon, you can begin. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie. Um, council member Pinto, members of the council of the District Columbia, Committee on Business and Economic Development and attending council members and staff. Um, on behalf of the Washington DC Economic Partnership, I wanna thank you all for your many years of support and leadership. I'm Keith Sellers, President and CEO, and it's an honor to support the mayor's budget for economic development for fiscal year 2022. Um, the partnership's primary mission is to foster business attraction and retention in Washington DC. As a 501c3, nonprofit we're un uniquely positioned for this role. Over the last 20 years, we've strived and succeeded in attracting new businesses and growing our economy. Economic intelligence, data research and analysis, a comprehensive business resource library and marketing am amplifications are just a few of the tools we've deployed to help entrepreneurs make the best decisions for their businesses. Over the past year, as most of the world has, we have been focus on making it through the pandemic. But this challenge only inspired us to double down on our economic development efforts. We've been working harder than ever. Working with DEMPED, we've engaged 
with over 175 different companies across the sectors. We've created COVID hubs on our Hey, Keith, I think you hit your mute button accidentally. I sure did. Sorry about that. Um, businesses could have access to critical information in a central location. Our consistent and ongoing work to address food inequalities and bring grocery stores to the district's food deserts resulted in a new Safeway announced um, in Ward 7. We we held DC BizChats de designed to help business adapt to the ever-changing business climate and our annual retail summit drew over 700 people. We've convened stakeholders from the business community and held recovery roundtables to strategize innovative ways to refine our business retention and attraction strategy with a focus on inclusivity and equity. Our work is more important now than ever in the respective area. We continue to release our signature publications, including the DC Development Report, which became our most downloadable publication of all time in just a few weeks after its release. This represents thousands of developers, site selectors, and potential DC businesses coming to, to the partnership for information on development projects in the district. As you know, Chairman McDuffie, a vibrant econo economy is essential on the ongoing recovery of the district and its sustainability. It's been it has continued to be our focus to recognize the importance of the work touching communities. Mayor Bowser has submitted a budget that is structured to strategically result in a much stronger economy for the district. Considered a deliberate intentional actions are, that are required to achieve. This partnership has participated in numerous meetings and engagement with other organizations, the district government, community members and business leaders to discuss our recovery and best paths forward and also analysis, analysis as, as our current state. I realize I'm going over, but I, I just wanted to say that uh, the partnership's in full support and really excited about um, the budget um, for this um, fiscal year for, for economic development. And I can provide. I, I promise you, I didn't mute you that time either. Um, we're gonna go next to Japer uh, Bowles the Capitol Stonewall Democrats, and you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Kenyon McDuffie. My name is Japer Bowles, and this, in this capacity, I'm representing the Capitol Stonewall Democrats, formerly the Gertrude Stein Democratic Club, as the Vice President of Legislative Affairs. Uh, Capitol Stonewall Democrats is a founding member of the DC LGBTQ Budget Coalition, which seeks to advocate for dedicated resources for the LGBTQ plus community. Today, I'm here to implore the, co the committee to support the investment and partnership proposed in Mayor's uh, FY22 budget to identify, create, and support a LGBTQ safe space and center. As the committee is well aware, DC has the highest per capita LGBTQ population of any state with roughly 10% of the population identifying as LGBTQ. The DMV is also the largest metro region in the or the sixth largest metro region in the country. Although the largest, our local LGBTQ community suffers documented uh, employment and housing discrimination, our youth experience homelessness at much higher rates and our seniors face social isolation and depression more than the straight community. Other agencies have supported and continue to support numerous LGBTQ dedicated uh, and led organizations that provide vital resources and services to the community. However, a joint space would offer a single location for the community uh, to access these organizations' services and allow these organizations to redirect funds that's currently going towards overhead and administration costs towards real services. Unfortunately, this problem is exacerbated by the sale of the Reeve Center, where the DC Center of LGBTQ Community and the Capital Pride Alliance are currently located. Last budget cycle, the council heard from our community and, uh, and acted and provided the, these organizations with rent relief, but a long-term solution is required. 
Our community sees this as an opportunity. At present, four 501c3s have committed to relocating their entire operations uh, into a shared space. And in, in addition to services being provided by these organizations, these spaces would also give the numerous support groups, food delivery, counseling, events, emergency housing, and many other possibilities for some of the most vulnerable members of our community. Additionally, comparable cities have massive spaces, which are the beating hearts of their community, uh, offering support groups, counseling, theaters, sports leagues, 24-7 drop, drop off centers, and emergency housing. These spaces were established by a partnership between the local LGBTQ community and the municipalities that they're located, as well as some federal funds and a capital campaign. As an organization that doesn't provide a service, but instead is used to uplift the voices of LGBTQ plus Democrats, we hope to work with your community and MPED to see this, seize on this unique opportunity to better serve our community and unite multiple LGBTQ organizations under one roof. We believe that our organizations and community will be better served by this space, and we hope the district agrees. We welcome the opportunity to discuss this project with you further and are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Ryan Boss. And good afternoon to you, you begin your testimony. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, everyone giving us this opportunity. Um, and uh, I want to introduce myself. I am Ryan Boss, the Executive Director of the Capital Pride Alliance, um, go by he, him. I'm also a resident of Ward 6. Um, and um, I am here today specifically as a member of the DC Career Space Task Force and the Executive Director of the Capital Pride Alliance. Um, um, as Japer just mentioned, um, I don't want to reiterate every single word he said because they are right on point. Um, we in the community have had this opportunity to, uh, to find new ways to collaborate and to um, the opportunity to have adequate space um, to share resources um, will help us to better serve um, our local community here in Washington, D.C. Um, it provides unique, unique ways um, to, to, um, to utilize resources um, that actually uh, um, represent, obviously, a very intersectional community here in D.C. Um, we deserve an adequate space. Our community needs to be able to have pride in the space uh, that we provide um, for our local LGBTQ citizens. Um, so very much um, support um, the council, supporting uh, the mayor's budget of 1 million and definitely um, would love to promote and encourage um, the city to support even more um, as we um, strive to have um, adequate space. Um, in addition, um, I'm here um, to also support uh, the, um, the 3 million um, to waive city municipal fees for um, uh, public events um, here in the district. Uh, the district is a vibrant place, um, one where people um, want to live, also want to visit, uh, but if we don't have um, these events, um, and that will not be as successful. Um, with the Pride Parade and Festival, one of the largest um, annual events here in the district, um, the risk of us to be able to actually continue to put on this event um, is drastically at risk um, because of the increasing fees. Um, just over the last five, six years, fees grew from approximately $105 thousand um, dollars to nearly three hundred thousand dollars annually um, and this is um, fees being spent by nonprofit organizations who are providing direct service to the community um, so in essence these funds that we are paying the city would be better used to support these services that we're trying to provide for our residents and it's also important to note um, we just um, received a preliminary um, economic impact study of the pride celebration itself um, and it is estimated now that nearly $370 million in tax revenue um, is earned by the, the DMV annually by this event alone. So as you can see, this is an event that is of value to the city. It generates revenue. Um, so being able to waive those city fees will only benefit the entire community as a whole. So um, I'll just end, um, this is Pride Month. Uh, next week, we will be celebrating Pride, though differently. Um, and we hope um, we can see um, um, everyone show their pride and their support for the LGBTQ plus community this month and beyond. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Rahana Mohammed. Good afternoon to you. 
Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Chairperson McDuffie and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Rahana Mohammed, and I'm chair of the DC Center Board of Directors. Um, and the DC Center helps to support the LGBTQ community in the district through direct services, support groups, and community events. We also partner with new and existing LGBTQ organizations across the city and execute grants on behalf of multiple DC government agencies, departments, and offices. Um, like uh, my two colleagues who just went before me, the DC Center is a founding member of the DC LGBTQ plus budget coalition, which seeks to advocate for dedicated resources to the community. And I'm also testifying as a part of the DC Queer Space Task Force, along with um, my two colleagues who just spoke, uh, which is a coalition of eight local LGBTQ plus organizations advocating for this joint space for the community. I'm especially excited to be here discussing this issue on the third day of Pride Month, as was mentioned. Um, and I'm here also to implore the committee to support the investments and partnership proposed in the mayor's FY22 budget to identify, create, and support this new LGBTQ community space. Um, in short, because again, you've just heard from two of uh, my fellow task force members, uh, DC deserves a sufficient, accessible, inclusive LGBTQ plus space. We have the highest percentage of LGBTQ plus individuals in the country, higher than California, higher than New York, and we're a very large metro region. Um, while we have different organizational spaces for our individual orgs, uh, none of them are really sufficient based on the needs of our community. And this task force has joined together to change that. Um, as Japer mentioned, four 501c3s would fully move into this new space, but um, other members of our task force plan to co-locate um, in our um, this new headquarters, this new center, and that will allow us to better coordinate and provide services in a one-stop location for the community. We'll be able to easily refer community members based on their needs and ensure that they can receive all the diverse services that they really need to thrive. Um, we can also offer more services at this location by um, by partnering because we have different specialties, um, different services that each organization provides that we can, we can leverage in a joint space. And we anticipate offering lockers, phone charging, computer resources, therapists, counselors, case managers, recreation space, co-working space, and also incubation space for new organizations that, um, that are being created by our community members in addition to STD and HIV testing and an area for community events, training and education. Um, and so our vision is really a single space where all are welcome and can find community and access the services that they need. We've been working with council members and mayor's offices and other community partners, and we're thrilled with the positive reaction to this project. We're very excited to see that $1 million included in the mayor's budget for this project. Uh -huh. and your, your time has expired. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. And thank you for providing your testimony. Next on the witness list is Beth Wagner. Good afternoon. My name is Beth Wagner, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Brooklyn Manor Coalition and in support of the Brooklyn Manor Brentwood Village Residents Association. Brooklyn Manor, or Brentwood Village as it was known prior to its rebranding, is unique for its large number of three, four, and five bedrooms. It has long been a place for families and now it is one of the last. Residents ran a boys and girls club with hundreds of kids participating. The pool and the large playground with double basketball courts were central gathering places. HIPS ran a community gardening program to help people recovering from addiction, which in turn fed a CSA program in the neighborhood. Residents established a recording studio for teens, a medical clinic on site and a collaborative to connect residents with transportation benefits and services. Brentwood Village was home to a church and a thriving set of neighboring small businesses, including a store where residents went for groceries. Tragically, much of this has been systematically destroyed by the owner, Mid-City Financial, in an attempt to break the community and make it easier to clear in the face of a pending redevelopment that significantly reduces affordable housing. Mid-City has undertaken a concerted and violent effort to remove as many long-term Brooklyn Manor residents as possible through intimidation tactics such as filing, unfounded evictions, fencing off all green spaces and common spaces, including yards, playgrounds, and the pool, letting conditions deteriorate, walling off bedrooms and large units, and hiring private security guards to harass residents. 
Keeping residents separate and on edge is part of Mid-City's divide and conquer strategy. Most recently, their tactics led MPD led to MPD threatening elderly people and children as young as two with arrest for being in their own front yards. This police harassment is nothing new. In 2017, private police beat and maced a man in a case of mistaken identity. His words on the experience were, quote, it feels like a prison to be humiliated like that with handcuffs, with mace in my face for over half an hour. It feels like I was being raped. The redevelopment project at Brooklyn Manor permanently destroys more than 100 family-sized units. Thanks to you, Council Member McDuffie, and your study, we know exactly how desperately needed family units are, especially for intergenerational Black families who rely on shared child care so parents can work. Voucher holders also have no protection against displacement unless even more money is given to Mid-City Financial, who has proven to be, despite public promises to the contrary, a viciously bad actor who is terrorizing the very community it used for decades to bring in millions and millions of HUD dollars and now seeks to discard like trash. In the words of one resident, they're building this on the backs of black people. So why this hearing? The DC Council of the Whole voted unanimously without public discussion to reward Mid-City with a $47 million TIF in 2018, passing the motion on the consent agenda, an administrative tool typically used for trivial things like approving meeting minutes. That money belongs to the people and must come with real resident equity and anti-displacement protections. Protection and reparations in the name of racial equity are necessary. It's not too late to protect families at Brooklyn Manor. You will find specific recommendations in my written testimony and echoed here by others. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Next is Alejandra Jolodowski. And good afternoon to you. You can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this is one of my two testimonies, so hopefully I get to do both, but at least I'll do this one. And this one is on behalf of Brooklyn Manor Coalition. Brooklyn Manor residents have been fighting against their displacement for years, triggered by the expiration of a 40-year HUD contract that ended in 2017. In 2018, two particularly important things occurred that made it clear that the city does not care about people living in this community. The first was that the zoning commissioners approved Mid-City Second Stage PUD application unanimously. The PED should be considered a public benefit, but instead it undermined DC's affordable housing crisis and did not account for the residents' health, safety, and welfare. The second was that the DC Council's unanimous support of a TIF bond to fund $47 million to Brooklyn Manor's developer, developer Mid-City. The decision was made without a public hearing before the full council that would allow the community to provide input. I'll skip over the tactics of, that Mid-City has done to the residents since Beth already talked about that. And I'll just say that the plan that Mid-City has will significantly reduce affordability and eliminate more than 100 affordable family units, including all five bedroom and nearly all four bedroom units. A 2019 study requested by Council Member McDuffie and performed by DEMPED and CN. HED found that the family units are the ones that are most desperately needed. The study notes that, quote, the heads of large households are more likely to be people of color, particularly in large renter households. Large households also typically are headed by younger householders and are more, more likely to have three generations living in them, end quote. So what can we do? First, we want the Brooklyn Manor Residents Association to meet with each council member to immediately open green space and implement anti-displacement protections. We also want to use $150 million, $47 million that comes from the TIF, and $100, millions from, $100 million from the Housing Production Trust Fund to build a 200-unit limited equity cooperative and the ability to pass housing on to the descendants. Additional financial equity to create permanent affordable housing can be given in the form of voucher payments, including rent to own options. Lastly, we want to build with the community by creating a jobs program so residents can assist with the con contractions and maintenance of the project. We also want to build and staff a community crisis center to repair the damage done by Bit City, allocating money to a partner of the Residents Association's choice for abolition based violence protection. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody on this panel uh, has an opportunity to provide their testimony in writing in particular. Uh, I do appreciate it. I do have one question, though, uh, for Mr. Pettigrew. You, you talked about um, a number of things. And one thing in particular that is important uh, to this committee, and I actually included a request in my uh, budget party's letter to the mayor uh, asking for additional funds 
to support uh, CDFIs and MDIs. And I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why uh, CDFIs and MDIs are critical to support businesses owned by minorities uh, and, you know, and, and people of color. Absolutely, and thank you, Councilmember. So uh, it, it's important and central, I think, to think of CDFIs uh, really as partners to the city and carrying out uh, certainly capital programs and things that are focused on, on small businesses. Uh, as an example for WACIF, because we're, we're committed in that way in 2018, 100% of our lending was to entrepreneurs of color. In 2019, 96% was to entrepreneurs of color because of our commitment to the topic um, but also recognizing some of the, the, the challenges we have as a city with the racial wealth divide. And so it's, it's important, I think, to also think through how do we continue to catalyze that type of impact and make sure that where city dollars can be used uh, to help leverage additional capital coming in so that we can really expand uh, on making sure that we're, we're being very intentional about uh, targeting the racial wealth divide, getting entrepreneurs of color specifically capital that's needed so that they can recover, but also to thrive and, and to grow. Um, and so it's certainly possible with city resources uh, to be positioned in that way, where if, if investments are directly targeting CDFIs, not just directly using city resources to deploy, but also for leveraging city dollars to bring in and attract uh, additional capital uh, so that there's, there's greater dollars going to entrepreneurs of color. I appreciate that. Um, I don't think we have Councilmember Pinto uh, or any other members of the committee right now. I do appreciate each of you taking the time out of your schedules to provide testimony uh, on this Zoom. And, and again, I'd love to make sure that we have everybody's testimony in writing. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we're going to turn to William Jordan, uh, Susan Gallucci, Ann Coleman, Maya Stuckey, Sabrina Rhodes, Commissioner. Ward 5, Allison Powers, Capital Impact Partners. One, two, three. That's um, Ed John Boardman. To that panel as well. All right, I think we've got uh, this panel here. We're gonna start with William Jordan. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Jordan, you're getting testimony. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman McDuffie and Council. Uh, approximately 20 years ago, the city adopted uh, Alice Rivlin's recommendations, recommendations from the Brookings Institute to focus its energies on recruiting 100,000 new residents to this city and disinvesting in the black family. That policy has resulted in, um, according to Andre Perry of the Brookings Institute, who testified a few days ago, the loss of a hundred, a loss of ten thousand black homeowners, the black owners, black home ownership rate in the district falling from fifty percent to thirty-seven percent, the white family wealth ballooning to eighty-one times the black family wealth. We also know that black income has stayed. Um, basically flat at $43,000 per year over the last 20 years. And we've at the same time lost over 40,000 black people from the district. We need bold, immediate and powerful action. We need your committee to lead that action. And it has to happen now in this budget period, no more around the, the edges. So I have some recommendations. Uh, that I think will move us to putting the Black family as something to be invested in and the kind of bold action we need from you and then Ped. Uh, one is to fully fund and implement the Park Morton Equity Plan. I say $30 million. 
to adapt, implement, and fund the Brooklyn Manor Reparations and Equity Plan immediately to support the acquisition of the Wardman Hotel and the 600, 600 units and economic mobility that will become from that project. I think these are the three moves. There are probably others that have to happen immediately in this budget. And if we have to rearrange it, then we rearrange it. Uh, also, so that we're guided um, as we move forward, I ask you to have CORE analyze the following projects. 965 Florida Avenue, Hill East Phase One, the Adams Morgan Hotel, the Chemonics Tax Abatement, and the War to see how those projects, which I know has had a negative impact on racial equity in the Black family to find out what is going wrong so that we can change our LDAs and agreements to make sure that projects moving forward don't follow along those, that pattern. Um, and that racial equity become a requirement for any dispositions moving forward. And then finally, we have to do community-led and community-involved partnerships and that DIMPAD immediately invest $2 million in particularly in public housing to help specifically the residents have an equity position in the projects and redevelopment. Uh, thank you, Chairman McDuffie. And thank you uh, for your testimony. We're gonna turn next to Susan Gallucci. And good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Gallucci. I'm a resident of Ward 3 and a social worker working with pregnant women and families throughout the district. I'm also a member of the Ward 3 Housing Justice Working Group. I echo my fellow working group members' testimony and would like to add my own experiences to underscore the need for affordable housing and this tremendous opportunity with the Wardman Hotel. In my work with families, I'm daily made aware of the lack of affordable housing in Washington, D.C. Families are often living in one room or in a one bedroom apartment or hopping place to place because they cannot afford the rent. I spend a great deal of time helping pregnant mothers and families search for affordable housing. We work on their credit, education, and search every program and opportunity to get their names on waiting lists for affordable housing. They participate in inclusionary zoning orientations and then wait years for a unit they can afford. In the meantime, they're living in overcrowded conditions and stressed about how they will manage to pay their rent and have enough food and other necessities for their families. The Wardman Hotel offers an incredibly unique opportunity to provide mixed income affordable housing, including deeply affordable housing. It's a large property which could offer hundreds of units for families. It is housing which is very accessible to public transportation. It's an already existing space which is more env environmentally sound to convert rather than to demolish. The building could house many amenities which would greatly benefit the families who live there. The pandemic has further exposed the disparities in our city, racial, social, economic, among others. Investing in new affordable housing at the Wardman would be a way in which to begin to address these issues. The mayor has made a commitment to create more affordable housing in the district. Acquiring and redeveloping the Wardman is the rare opportunity to work towards achieving this outcome. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, next on the list, we have Ann Coleman. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, something's wrong with my video. I don't know what's going on. It says it's on, but it obviously isn't. Um, I'm not sure if you have a, a cover on it, but but it's otherwise okay for you to proceed with your... Okay, open. I'll have to proceed because I don't know what to do. Well, don't worry about it. You can go ahead. Uh, and thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name's Ann Coleman. I'm a resident of Ward 3. I'm a member of the executive committee of the Ward 3 Democrats, but I want to make clear I'm testifying in my personal capacity. I want to talk both about the Wardman and Brooklyn Manor. I support everything said by the proponents of both groups. I want to see affordable house. I want the city to buy the Wardman and convert it into affordable housing. My written testimony doesn't address social housing, but I would absolutely support that as one of the alternatives. 
I'd also like to suggest that while making it a model for affordable housing, the city make it an environmental model that it, when it's converted, it be taken all off gas and turned totally to electricity and that other best environmental practices be used. Um, switching to Brooklyn Manor, there is not enough to say about the outrages at Brooklyn Manor. Um, the plans for redevelopment have nothing to do with racial equity and are totally inconsistent with the comprehensive plan amendments. The developer has been harassing the tenants since 2014 and improperly evicting them, since at least 2014. The city needs to stop this. I would agree with the plan suggested by proponents before me for TIF money and other money to go to the Residents Association um, for cooperative housing. I also have an alternative suggestion um, which I feel in general, TIF should have really tough restrictions put on them. And I suggest if the council and the mayor made clear that the TIFs would only be granted if all harassment stopped and all tenants go into the new rebuilding in proper sized apartments, the harassment and the problems would stop immediately. So I urge you to take one of those two solutions. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, we have Maya Stuckey who's next on the list. I believe she's in school at the moment. Uh, and so she, she submitted a video. We're gonna play it at the uh, end of this panel uh, after the final witness for the DEMPED panel. So uh, we're gonna move next to uh, Commissioner Rhodes uh, of Ivy City, and good afternoon to you, Commissioner. You can begin your testimony. Hello, good afternoon. Um, yes, Council Member and Chair McDuffie, the Deputy Mayor and Committee, I'm Commissioner Rhodes of 5D01 and a resident of the Ivy City community. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. First, I want to thank you all for supporting and advocating for the Ivy City residents to be able to keep the Cremel School as the heart of the community and allowing us to finally make it into the much needed recreation center and safe play space that the residents have fought for for so many years and Empower DC has fought for over 20 of those years. We were able to step foot on the site for the first time on this past Memorial Day. Phase one is not quite complete yet, but we're excited and it felt like Wonderland. It should, it should be finished up soon, phase one, and then we'll close the area for construction. It'll be periodically um, open for community access during the rest of the installation, per Tommy Jones at DPR. I have stated this before, we have a mixed community with diverse cultures and various income levels, but we all want the same for ourselves and our families, recreation, resources, and opportunities, and we all want a safe and peaceful community. Now that we have this space, the Cornell School and the two acres that surround it, we as a community, we want to be part of the planning process. There's so much we can do here. We can make this space inviting to residents of all ages. Our, on Memorial Day, this, this was evident. We have folks of all ages, the youngest who can barely walk to some of us who are seniors or almost seniors. Um, we, do, we do have a small area plan. We do need a small area plan for the entire community and please help us secure the 250,000 in the fiscal year 2022 budget so that it can be completed. Also last year, a $50,000 reoccurring grant for youth programs in Ivy City was funded from, from our knowledge, it hasn't been released yet. And do we have any additional information on this? Uh, Deputy Mayor Fauchikio mentioned in, a, in an email that we will work with the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Washington to ensure that there is programming and events this summer. 
We are rare, they're ready to play, have mobile units that could be part of the summer event at Crimea Hill. We want a full and re robust schedule this summer to make sure activities are always available, at least until the recreation is complete. We're happy and excited about the news that we're finally get a re getting a recreation center, but we want transparency about all the planning and we want to have seats at the planning table to keep our goal of the center being for the community, ran by the community, and we would much rather work together to address future developments and ensure we address longstanding community needs because the community should be the decision makers. Thank you for allowing me to testify. And again, we are happy and excited and thank you so much for helping us secure criminal. Absolutely, thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. It's great to join you and, and all those residents. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Intergenerational. Uh, participation uh, on Monday, so it was uh, it was great to be on that that site and uh, had to dust off my basketball skills. But the, the folks out there, they were having a, a really enjoyable time, and so yes, we continue to work with you all and, and with Dempad, mm -hmm. and, and also thankful to to DPR, yeah, uh, Director Hunter and and DGS Keith Anderson uh, for their support and assistance. So we'll get more information about the Boys and Girls Club. Okay. Uh, and what uh, is proposed there with their participation. So thank you for that. Thank you. We'll turn next to Allison Powers. Thank you for being here uh, this afternoon. You can begin your testimony. Thanks so much. I'm here on behalf of Capital Impact Partners and will be testifying in support of the Nourish DC Fund. Capital Impact is a nonprofit community development financial institution that provides integrated financing and technical assistance to support people and projects in historically marginalized communities. Founded in 1982, we've deployed over $2.9 billion in the communities we serve and have a long history of providing financing and implementing programs in the Washington, D.C. area. Supporting healthy food access is part of our larger mission. We've deployed over $200 million in lending to over 100 food retailers and small businesses. We were also the fund manager of the California Freshworks Fund and the Michigan Good Food Fund, and in May 2021, we're selected to manage the Nourish DC Fund, a $1 million award for a year of programming as part of, as part of the 5.2 million DC Local Equity and Access Preservation Funds, or DC LEAF. The purpose of Nourish DC it is, is to support the development of a robust ecosystem of locally owned food businesses, especially in neighborhoods underserved by grocery with a focus on job creation and economic prosperity locally and locally owned food businesses led or owned by people of color. I also think there's a great intersection between Nourish DC and the cooperative and cooperative development for both consumer owned cooperative grocery stores and worker owned food businesses. Capital Impact is a long, has a long history of financing and supporting co-ops and is part of the DC co-op stakeholders group in addition to partnering with WACIF on the DC co-op impact grant. Nourish DC will have a three-pronged approach to create impact, providing technical assistance, catalytic grants, and loans to emerging and existing locally owned DC food businesses. We will be collaborating with a group of technical assistance and lending and partner partners with deep community roots, including the Washington Area Community Investment Fund, or WACIF, Latino Economic Development Center, or LEDC, Dreaming Out Loud, and Eats Place. The collaborative will leverage this $1 million award to attract an additional $2 million to the fund deploying at least $3 million of financing, supporting food entrepreneurs through robust, robust technical assistance, and awarding at least $200,000 in catalytic grants. We also feel that DC Nourish Fund will increase entrepreneurs' business acumen and capital readiness for district grant programs such as the Neighborhood Prosperity Fund. We strongly support the proposed budget allocation of an additional $3 million over two years to further support the Nourish DC Fund. Expanding funding will provide continuity of programming and increase the impact of the fund, enabling the partners to support more food entrepreneurs through technical assistance, financing, and catalytic grants. The extended timeline will create programmatic stability to provide capital and services beyond 12 months and allow the partners to leverage more funding to support an equitable food system in DC. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your testimony. I uh, really appreciate the work that you all do and Ellis Carr uh, was instrumental and in, in a member of my equitable recovery working group last year uh, in helping me think through uh, some initiatives that we actually included in last year's budget. So I appreciate you being here to testify this morning. This Thank afternoon. you so much. All right, last on this panel, but not least, certainly is John Boardman. Uh, it's good to see you. John, you can begin your testimony. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, always good to see you, and I uh, want to extend uh, greetings to Council Member Pinto, although I recognize she may not be in the room with us right now. I am John Boardman of Unite Here Local 25, a uh, union that represents 7,000 plus uh, workers in the hospitality industry. I'm here today to express um, support for capital crossings and specifically in favor of the extension of the pilot uh, on this project. Local 25's interest in capital crossings project flows from one of the uh, components of the project, and that is the hotel. Uh, and that's what I'd like to talk about today. The extension of the pilot uh, will ensure that the project, including the hotel, will go vertical. It'll be built. Um, pilots, like other district financial tools, uh, represent public investments. And as such, uh, pilots can and should uh, maximize return to the public good. Investing in capital crossings uh, project uh, does more than just construct 2 million plus square feet of bricks and mortar. Uh, it will accomplish other public good. It will build a hotel and that hotel will provide good jobs for district residents. I wanna stress this. The developers of this project um, have recognized the importance of creating not just jobs, but good jobs that can support district families. To put it simply, the pilot for capital crossings should be extended so that the potential of good jobs and the hotel workers who will work them can be realized. And I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee for uh, providing time for me to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony, Mr. Borman, and I want to thank each of the witnesses. Uh, not uh, the capital crossing. Do you all already have uh, an agreement in place, Mr. Borman? Uh, yes, the developers in Local 25 reached an agreement um, years ago, as a matter of fact, in the project's infancy. So we are uh, pleased to be here uh, speaking on behalf of the project because we know the outcome will be uh, good jobs for district residents working in that hotel. Got it. Okay. Uh, I do not have uh, any additional questions for the witnesses. I do appreciate each of you providing testimony here this afternoon. I'll go to the next uh, and final panel for uh, Demp Head. Uh, and again, we're going to have these witnesses join as participants, but then we also have a video uh, by War 5 resident and student Maya Stuckey for her testimony. Uh, Alexis Blackman, Council Ruby, Darren Vance, Rainbow Families, Margaret. Uh, Linsner, Chris Otten, Keisha Howard, Amy Bruno, and Reginald Black. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Uh, we haven't gotten started just yet. We're waiting for some folks to transition in. Oh, okay. perfect. You wanna, we'll, we'll, we'll get started with you now. Uh, thank you for your patience and good afternoon to you. You can begin your testimony. Good afternoon. Good morning, council members and um, members of the committee. I'm Alexis Blackman, the Director of Government and Public Affairs for Casa Ruby. I'm also a member of the LGBTQ coalition, budget coalition in the district. And I'm here today to urge the di districts to fund the Shared Space Initiative the Shared Space Initiative will allow several different human service organizations to that specifically target the LGBTQ population to obtain a large community space within the district. This is an excellent project because it will provide a space where citizens can access multiple, um, multiple services in a single location. These services are included but not limited to possible emergency housing, a workforce program, mental health services, shared event space, community, um, community center, legal assistance, case management, STD treatment and adherence, veterans, senior returning citizens and domestic violence um, assistance. This space is extremely important to our community because the space is where somewhere, is, will be somewhere that our community members will be able to call home. 
currently our city doesn't have a dedicated LGBTQ space. But like my colleagues have stated before, um, before me, uh, LA has a huge space. Um, New York has another space. And with us being, Texas has a large space. With us being one of the largest populations of LGBT people per capita, we think that DC should show the way, fund the initiative, and try to make us <clears throat> try to make us get a build, or try to help us get a building within the city limits as easy as possible. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I don't see Darren Vance. So we're going to move next to Margaret Linsner. Good afternoon to you. You can begin your testimony. You are muted. If you want. No, I am. Thank you. Um, my name is Margaret Lensner. I am a longtime homeowner in Ward 3. As a member of the board of the Cleveland Park Citizens Association, I worked with others on a housing committee to try to comprehend the complex realities of affordable housing in our city. We finally concluded that the housing needs of thousands of district residents on waiting lists for subsidized housing will never be met without new, bold, creative policies. Relying on vouchers is inefficient and costly and inclusionary zoning in new housing built by for-profit developers is inadequate. For the past several months, I've engaged with the Ward 3 Housing Justice Working Group, focusing on the idea of city investment in the purchase of the Wardman Hotel property. For conversion to housing for individuals and families with a range of low incomes, including zero to 30% MFI. My main task has been to meet with Woodley Park neighbors to discuss with them this idea and our consulting architects conceptual plans. I have been very pleased by the uniformly positive responses I've received from Woodley Park neighbors so far. They know that the hotel property will be redeveloped and they remember the 2016 PUD application for excessive redevelopment that was withdrawn in the face of community opposition. They appreciate that sustainable adaptive reuse will avoid disruptive demolition and the release of carbon now stored in the building's concrete. They welcome repurposing the hotel's vast event rooms for community uses such as daycare, fitness and sports, food surface training, and meeting rooms. They recognize the possibilities for expanding the nearby oversubscribed Oyster Elementary School, possibly with a pedestrian bit bridge to the Calvert side of the hotel. Most of all, they value preservation of the open green space in front of the hotel on Willie Road that the whole community treasures. They also recognize the desperate need for affordable housing for low-income citizens and families, seniors, disabled, and essential workers who can't afford DC's high market rents. Wardman's conversion would com accomplish one quarter of Mayor, Mayor Bowser's goal of 1,990 affordable units in Ward 3 by 2025. That cannot possibly be achieved by a for-profit developer through inclusionary zoning. The Office of Planning asserts that affordable housing is its main priority, but the mayor has said that land cost in Rock Creek West is too high. We appreciate council member McDuffie's request for $140 million to purchase the Wardman, and we urge DEMPED to consider this seriously. OP often complains that neighborhood opposition blocks redevelopment. Perhaps that's because OP and developers fail to engage collegially and honestly with community stakeholders. Ward 3 Housing Justice Working Group's continuing outreach to the Woodley Park community is laying the groundwork for a new affordable housing community at the Wardman property. Thank you for letting me testify. And thank you for providing testimony to the committee. Next up, we have Keisha Howard. I don't, I don't see Chris Otten. He's, a, he's on the the list, but I don't see him present. So I'm gonna to move to Keisha Howard and good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, um, Chairman McDuffie and to all the other community leaders that were on this. Um, I'm gonna to try to skip through because I did send in a written te testimony. Please excuse my typos um, because I've been on here waiting since 9 a.m. and I'm trying to go back and forth because my daughter's still in school doing Zoom. But um, I just have like four things I want to touch base on. First of all, I'm a resident at Brooklyn Manor Apartments, and I have been on this property 
for about 22 years. But if you all came to the leasing department, it would only state that I've been here for six years because as the um, gentrification has started, I had to move twice. And every time you move on the property, they change your lease. I want to say um, for the first part is that everyone that resides on Brooklyn Manor apartments are not bad people. I am a single parent mom. I have a senior now that attends Bowie State University. She's on the Dean's List Honor Society and she attended Phelps High School where she was ranked top 10 in the DMV. And she was the only senior that had 456 community service hours. I have a second daughter that is 11 years old and I had to enroll her in the K through 12 program. And she has continued to maintain straight A's even though having ADHD. Um, the reason the points that I want to point out is that the harassment on Brooklyn Manor properties is really damaging. Right now, my children cannot take out the trash because I don't want them to get bitten by a rat. We have rat holes everywhere. The rats stay by the dumpsters. We don't really have maintenance people. I had a broken toilet for six months and only have one bathroom. I reside in a three bedroom that I had to fight for. I spent 10 years in a one bedroom with both of my daughters until I was finally moved into a three bedroom, which then now I'm down the street because they tore down the side that I used to reside at. Um, I am considered in-house section eight. I've been on the section eight list since 1999 and my name still has not came up. Every time I call, I'm on hold or I get disconnected when I finally get a person. I do understand that you have helped a lot regarding the low income residents. And I do understand that Mid-City would see $47 million. I don't know for what, but I do know that the if you just take a walk around our property, you will see that we do have unwelcome vests guests that stay on our streets you will see that we have a lot of things that happen on our streets but the things that happen on our street are not residents that reside in brooklyn manor apartments our kids have nowhere to play chairman they have nowhere to play the playground that exists is for the rat holes and dirt um when I want to take my daughter outside I can only be outside for five minutes because of the unwelcome residents that reside that continue to come on our street, but they do not live here. We have 24 hour security that if something happens on the street, they don't help because they said that they're only here to watch. I don't understand that. Um, I'm asking, I agree with the redevelopment because our apartments are very, very old as you understand, but we also need to keep the one, twos, threes, and four bedrooms because it doesn't matter what color you are. Many of us have families and many people that stay on this property are not only seniors, but they are also taking care of families. May it be due because of a loved one had passed away, someone is incarcerated, or so forth. Ms. Howard, if you could just summarize just the, the, the end of your testimony, very important testimony. I hate to cut you off, but. Okay, okay I do understand. The importance that I just want to say right now is that um, with the hardship of the COVID-19, um, we have a giant across the street. It took us so long to get food inside of our stores. When we needed food, we had to travel to 14th Street or 8th Street Giant to get food. We need something now and we need some help now. And if it wasn't for the Brooklyn Association who was giving out bread and milk and eggs, I don't think I could have survived. It's plenty of times that I went to bed hungry to make sure that my two kids were able to eat. And I see a lot of people on here that's talking about the hotels and jobs and so forth like that. But we still need a place to stay. We still are paying rent. We was never relieved of not paying rent. And if you don't pay rent, you will get evicted. I'm just asking that if someone, anybody can come to the property now and have real people like myself sit at a table so you can hear the truth and you can also hear what Miss City is so, saying. So I'm gonna take you up on that. I was actually there uh, twice last week, uh, once to talk with residents, and to walk uh, the area around Brooklyn Manor, but the second time to meet directly with uh, the folks uh, who manage the property uh, to voice and amplify the concerns that have been raised about security following uh, yet another one of the unfortunate incidents where residents were complaining about being harassed by uh, the private security. I spoke to uh, the management and representative of ownership 
about that. Uh, I made some specific requests based on feedback that I had gotten from the community. Uh, and I do understand the difference between people who live there and people who don't, who come back and visit. Uh, in some cases are the ones that folks have complained about. And so I do, and I'm well aware of the distinction that must be drawn. Let me say, you started out by saying that, you know, all people who live there are not bad people. I know that for a fact. Uh, I know that for a fact because I know plenty of people who have come through and have lived there, including my own family, uh, niece, nephews. Uh, I have a cousin that lives on the property uh, now. Uh, and so, and I, decades ago, used to hang there because I played uh, boys and girls club football in, in, the, in the center, the community center on the property was our headquarters. Uh, and so I'm well aware of the history and, and, and how important it is to make sure that the things you are saying today are addressed. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to provide that testimony while your, your daughter is home on Zoom. Uh, that's important uh, and it helps to inform the decisions that we make here at the committee. And I will take you up to meet with you and hear from you directly to be able to share anything that you weren't able to get on the record today. But again, Ms. Howard, I do appreciate you taking the time to do just that. Uh, and I, I'll have, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we'll make sure that my, my staff, if you could direct message me or send an email, uh, we'll schedule some time where I can come out and chat with you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate it. And I want to say one more thing. Sure. For the outlet of Dance Place and Models Inc., I don't think that my daughter would be able to take everything that has been thrown at her. Both of my kids have been raised through Dance Place and my youngest daughter is now with Models Inc. And I'm pretty sure that you guys have heard about them. But the most stressful thing is dealing with mental health. And we all have a, a touch of that is my kids are wondering where they're going to lay their head. So I really hope that you do take me up on sitting down. I'm willing to work with anyone, but I think that you guys need to hear the entire of what's really going on in our property. And the first thing is we really need some help with the, with the rats. It, it's, re it's really, it, it's unbearable here. So, I, I will I'm tell you, I, when I meet with you, I'll share you a personal story that we had about rats over here. Rats are, are, are I'm not sure what's going on in the city right now, but I am getting a, a number of complaints about it in various communities throughout War 5. And so we'll talk about that. I did make some specific requests, as I mentioned, around the computer lab, uh, the basketball courts, open space use by kids. Uh, I heard a lot of complaints that kids weren't even allowed to play on the grass. Which they, to me they're, is, they're not allowed to play on the grass and they yeah. have headlocks on the gates. Okay, well, we, we, I've talked to them about that specifically. Uh, and I've also uh, uh, raised the concerns about the security, asked that they be retrained and that the policies be reevaluated uh, and anything that is outdated uh, be updated. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the city uh, with MPD, and I've specifically focused a lot on police reform, uh, but I've also been focused on private security because we know sometimes uh, there are situations that exist where it is not MPD. I'm not letting them be off the hook. I just know that there are uh, various areas where private security uh, have, have uh, really engaged in uh, deplorable uh, tactics and behavior. And so thank you for taking the time to testify. I'm going to move on to, to our next witness, Ms. Howard. Uh, our next witness is Amy Verno. Uh, I don't actually see. It's Angela, actually Angela Wilson. Oh, uh, yes. I was informed by, of that by staff. So um, good afternoon to you. You can begin testimony. Good morning, Chairperson McDuffie and Councilperson Pinto. My name is Angela Wilson Turnbull. I'm a member of St. Augustine Catholic Church, and I'm testifying on behalf of Wynn. I serve as one of the WIN co-chairs. Our WIN members live and work in all eight wards of the city. WIN is a grassroots organization that has organized for over 20 years in light for the creation of a more just and equitable city. We have testified before you about living wages, jobs, community safety, immigration, and many other issues. But one of the issues dearest to my heart is affordable housing. Wynn wants to ensure that long-term Black communities that endure the poverty of our city are part of the prosperity. In the nation's capital, the first majority Black major city in the nation, we believe that the district must work 
to change the trajectory of systemic racism that has been manifested through policies like redlining and restrictive covenants to bring about a city where everyone thrives. We see a strong start in this budget. We're happy to see the increase in the Mayor Bowser's budget of 400 million for affordable housing, the trust fund, and hope this is used to preserve and create more affordable housing. Today, I specifically want to talk about two critical projects that Wynn is dedicated to. First is a Reservation 13 Hill East in Ward 7. This is one of the largest pieces of public land, over 67 acres along the Anacostia waterfront. Wynn congregations together with DC general residents worked with the administration to create safer short-term family housing that is now complete in all eight wards. Before the Hill East Reservation 13 RFP was issued, when leaders door knocked and talked with hundreds of residents on both sides of the river, we heard from residents that their priority for this land is to maximize mixed income affordability and to provide opportunities for black and native Washingtonians to build equity, particularly through home ownership. We applaud the creation that you pushed for and helped create Chairperson McDuffie on the equity RFP and its requirement for a third, a third, a third, and for mixed income home ownership opportunities. We know that what happens here on these parcels will define the identity and character for Black people for generations. We know that when the administration, city council, development community, and residents work together, we can make miracles happen. We did it at Spring Road. We did it at Temple Courts. We're doing it at Reservation 13, and now we want to say, let's work together to get the land at RFK released from the federal government and turn parking lots into homes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we're gonna turn next to Reginald Black, and good afternoon to you. You can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Good afternoon, Council Member McDuffie members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development and DC residents. My name is Reginald Black. I am a native Washingtonian, Ward 4 resident, as well as the Advocacy Director for the People for Fairness Coalition and a lived experience appointee to the Interagency Council on Homelessness. The Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development is a crucial agency that helps produce housing opportunities for our District of Columbia residents. During an unprecedented and tragic year, we have learned just how crucial this agency is to our community. During this time, PFFC has supported many community partners to create development opportunities for themselves and the communities we live in. We wholeheartedly believe in housing being a human right and have convened the Universal Right to Housing campaign. It focuses on two main principles, Article 17 and 25 of the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 217A, 3 of 10. Declaration of Human Rights. Article 17 says, number one, everyone has the right to own property alone as well with others, and no one should be deprived of this property. This is why we support the efforts of community-led development. PFFC is deeply support is committed to supporting communities like Ivy City. This community has come together to spur on their own development for a rec center and city center for the historic Cremel School, which will provide this community with equity if we are committed to both human rights and racial equity, then not only does the Ivy City small area plan need to be funded, but residents should be uh, encouraged and empowered to participate full in the development. Uh, not do, refusing to do so blatantly breaks Article 17, and we should not deprive Ivy City residents uh, of this site or be judged by our actions. PFC also supports the creation, uh, development, and implementation of the Park Morton Equity Plan which encased in its intentional set of policies and actions, not only give public housing and vital historic members our community equity, but it provides them with a minimum of 33.3% up to 55% uh, uh, equity, which will again advance Article 17. In addition, the People for Fairness Coalition is encouraging implementation of the vacant virus reduction plan, as well as the acquisition of the Warburton Park Hotel uh, with over 
19,000 vacant units with 5,523 5, 5, being class A. We can only look to DEMPED as a main contributor. PFFC applauds your, your efforts to fund the city's desire to acquire the property, but we also urge you to use eminent domain for Woman Park and would like to see an audit of how public money and land uh, is being used to give residents the equity that they deserve. 19, over 19,000 vacant units means that our residents are being deprived of poverty, which is not what, what we should strive to be in terms of being a human rights city nor should we ignore the opportunity to provide ownership and housing opportunities. Article 17 implies we must consider the community when making these budgetary and, legis and legislative decisions. Mr. In that same vein, we support the Brooklyn Man Manor Tenants Association Mr. who are right now being deprived of property. Uh, those residents should have been given that $46 million uh, to support developing a safe vibrant community. Article 17 of the Universal uh, Human Rights um, the time, we're constantly missing opportunities yeah. to advance healing and housing justice. This is why we also want to make sure that the old Engine 22 fire station on Georgia Avenue um, is also a part of this. I would just ask all witnesses to be courteous of all the other folks who've signed up. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, we've had over 100 people sign up to testify. And I know uh, in many cases you want to uh, speak longer than three minutes, um, but we really are trying to make sure that uh, we are fair to everybody who's taking the opportunity to sign up to provide testimony. Uh, so I do appreciate people being courteous of everybody else, uh, despite uh, understanding how important it is that you get your testimony to record. I just make sure that folks can provide their testimony in writing. We're going to hear testimony of Maya Stuckey now, who, as I mentioned, is a resident of Ivy City. She's a student. Uh, and she provided the committee with a video in lieu of uh, her uh, in-person appearance today. Once you get it going, the, the volume, if you could just start it over to make sure we get here from the beginning. Staff, if y'all can let me know if we're gonna get this going or if you're working to fix the volume, otherwise. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, um, We're gonna take a brief recess, a brief three minute recess to queue this up. And, and what I like staff to also do while we're queuing this up is to uh, bring the next witnesses in for the next three agencies. So the witnesses for DC Lottery, Office of the CFO and Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking should be a total of five witnesses. While we're transitioning them in and trying to queue up the video, we're gonna take a brief recess. We'll be back uh, at about 1.13 or so.
Time is now 1.15 p.m. We're gonna reconvene uh, this public uh, oversight hearing. Uh, and uh, we left off, we were queuing up a video from a witness, Maya Stuckey. Uh, I think staff has worked out the, uh, the details and we can begin that. Hi, I'm Maya. Unfortunately, I can't be here right now. I'm pre-recording this. Um, I have school on Thursday. Um, I have in-person school on Thursday. I can't miss those classes. So I'm recording this um, as a pre-submission for my testimony because uh, yeah, that's what I do. Um, so I just want to start off by saying thank you to Council Member McDuffie and Deputy Mayor Sivak Chikio for the support and efforts, not only giving the younger residents of my community, but the community as a whole, a safe place to play and a nice place to be the heat for the summer. Um, this is kind of relevant, well, not technically relevant, but I longboard and that lot is like so smooth. I mean, it's like the, per it's better than the street. It's most definitely better than the street riding my longboard, but I just thought I should throw that in there. Um, I can't express my full gratitude over video, but you know, it's there. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I just really, you know, I just really love the lot. I really love what it's there for. And I can't wait to see what it um, further develops into. And that's what I'm here to talk about. So I'm not entirely sure where we are with the process of converting the lot to a school, but I know Empower DC has been working hard and very persistent on getting us here. And I don't think their efforts should stop there. <clears throat> I'm hoping that um, we can ensure that the plans for the rec stay in the right direction and putting us in that right direction is why uh, I guess the board of people that would meet for the development includes Empower DC in that. Um, I know Empower DC works close with the neighborhood. I mean, Miss Parisa is out there. She does what she does and that is amazing. But I don't want her to be left out of the know. I don't want Empower DC as a whole to be left out of the know because it feels like they're my connection from my community to um, bigger government officials, if that makes any sense. Um, coming from the position of a resident, it makes me feel a lot safer knowing that I have familiar that I'm familiar with the decisions being made for my benefit and that the people making those decisions know what I want and aren't just thinking about, I guess, thinking about what we want without actually knowing what we want. Um, I want to have a place to share my opinions on what programs and thing, other things that will make the site a closer voting for our community. So suggesting things, I know I've already said this before, but something gardening, um, it's a fun activity for all ages. I think if I had the space to share that with somebody that I knew on the board, that would make it a lot easier instead of just estimating on, oh, well, the kids would like this because all kids like this, not everybody's the same. But um, yeah, I wanna make sure that we have a safe place to play and I don't want this rec center to be somewhere that caters to the needs of others rather than the people in the community, like a lot of businesses around here. So, I'm just hoping that this happens. Um, thank you for letting me share this and have a nice day. I am uh, so glad we were able to get that video. Uh, and we're gonna obviously make that a part of our official record for this hearing. Uh, Maya, I'm sure you're not gonna hear this because you are in school and I appreciate that you have your priorities in order. Uh, but I also appreciate that you've made uh, your testimony one of your priorities for today. Uh, thank you so very much. We do appreciate your insights. And uh, Empower DC has obviously been involved for decades uh, with the Ivy City community and the push to get a recreation center on the community. Uh, but you should understand uh, well that your testimony, your involvement uh, is also, uh, I think a reflection, not only of your dedication, but your commitment to your own community. So thank you for that, uh, Maya Stuckey. All right, we're gonna move next to uh, witnesses for uh, other agencies. DC Lottery is up. Uh, I don't know if we, yeah, we do. I have uh, Jeff uh, Ifra, who's a, with Ifra Law. Good afternoon to you and you begin your testimony. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone um, participating today. Um, Chairperson, uh, and thank you to uh, to my own uh, Councilwoman uh, Pinto, if she is still on. I'm a bit CBE business in Ward 2. We've submitted uh, witness testimony. Uh, Chairman McDuffie, you may recall from, from last year that um, we had requested on behalf of the small businesses, 
bars and restaurants who want to participate as Class B licensee, licenses, licensees, sorry, in, um, in DC, that um, they be able to participate at a lower cost. At the time, I believe the budget office had already budgeted a certain number of bars and restaurants. Um, and so I think that our small, modest statutory change was sort of tabled. We wanted to try and renew that now coming out of COVID. It's more important than ever, I think, as you've been hearing throughout the past three hours, um, to get the small businesses and restaurants on their feet. And part of um, doing that would be to help enable them what really was your vision, which was to allow them to share in a portion of uh, lottery and gaming revenues um, in DC. As you recall, um, the then director, uh, Beth, um, did not, of the lottery, um, did not oppose the statutory change we were asking for. And all that statutory change says is that where there are multiple bars who are owned by a majority of the same shareholders, that there only be one license fee uh, of 25,000, assuming they're partnered with the CBE, as opposed to 25,000 per location. The statute currently talks about multiple buildings falling under one license, but the lottery is not really sure and looks to you um, whether or not that would cover what we're proposing. We have 10 bars, um, uh, Chairman, who are ready to go for this NFL season, and we have 20 more who are waiting. And this would present um, a really big financial obstacle if they had to go forward and pay 25K per facility. Um, so at a time when hopefully um, no monies have been budgeted for these licenses, we'd like to ask again um, that you consider a statutory change, which would allow um, owners of multiple locations to pay one fee. And we have submitted a request to the lottery um, last summer um, to, to the now acting director. And I think um, that the statutory clarification would would be the best approach and the easiest approach to make this happen. We don't know of any opposition. Our bars and restaurants, by the way, are located in every, almost every ward in the city. Um, and like I said, they are very excited to, uh, to finally launch. There have not been um, any bars or restaurants uh, since the lottery launched this program. There have not been any bars or restaurants who have been licensed. So this is not just me saying this is a problem. It seems evident from the fact that no one has been licensed, that this is somewhat of a financial barrier for entering. Um, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, we've submitted written testimony on this as well. And thank you for your testimony this afternoon and for providing the written testimony as well. Uh, I do not have any questions for you at this time. I'm familiar with the issue and call uh, uh, our discussions previously about it. Uh, we're gonna move next to the office of the chief financial officer uh, and the three uh, two witnesses who had signed up to testify. Uh, Karen Kasten and Jennifer Kuyper uh, are both present. And we're gonna begin with Karen Kasten. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear Chairman you. Chairman McDuffie, thank you so much for um, holding this hearing <coughs> and accepting my testimony. Um, I'm Karen Kasten, a resident of Ward 3. I want to talk about the discriminatory way the Office of the Chief Financial Officer interprets rent control reform legislation. Its fiscal impact statements currently categorize rent control legislation as a financial deficit that must be compensated for out of the city's budget before the legislation can be implemented. Take as an example, the requirement that the recently passed voluntary agreements moratorium can't become operational until and unless it's funded. How can it need funding, I wondered? Will an office be set up or will staff need to be hired? to administer the moratorium? The answer shocked me. As I understand it, the Office of the Chief Financial Officer calculated that the passage of the voluntary agreements moratorium would cause the city to lose $191,000 in hypothetical future taxes that landlords would have paid into the city's coffers due to higher rents that they would have been able to collect on the next group of tenants 
if the voluntary agreements moratorium hadn't prohibited it. And the whole thing is a, made even more questionable by the fact that post pandemic, there's no way to know if or when landlords will be able to charge higher rents. So the penalty on tenants and the protection of landlords is based on speculation about something that may not even happen. Um, I wonder why the fiscal impact statements don't assess rent control reform legislation as an asset to the city's economy based on the fact that renters who spend less money on rent have more money to spend on other things. The current interpretation that is injurious to renters only began with the fiscal impact statements in 2017. And it can be, and I hope it will be undone. This issue also has a racial equity dimension any delays in implementing or failures to implement rent control reform measures, such as voluntary agreements, particularly affect renters of color. The chief financial officer's current fiscal impact statement methodology is another example of government discrimination against renters of color and should be investigated by core. Ms. Gaston, your time is That's expired. it. The Council Office on Racial Equity should investigate. Thank you uh, for your Thanks. testimony. I appreciate your observation about the fiscal impact statements. Uh, I've you. had questions uh, and had discussions about uh, some of the methodology that they use at times. Uh, oh, wonderful. Yeah, so, so I, I appreciate you putting that on the record. Uh, we'll make sure that we are asking questions about uh, that particular issue. I'm going to turn next to thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Jennifer Kuiper, uh, who was with us uh, earlier. We appreciate you coming back uh, for this particular panel. Uh, you can begin your testimony. Thank you, and also thank you to you and your staff for providing Maya's testimony. That gave I know a lot of us inspiration to see her leadership. So thank you for that. Um, I am Jennifer Kuiper with District Bridges. And we're a DC-based nonprofit that provides community-based economic development. And in particular, we support DC small businesses through six of the 26 DSLBD funded Main Street programs we manage across four wards. My testimony today recommends support for small businesses as it pertains to the Clean Hands Certification Program managed by the Office of Tax and Revenue. OTR's Clean Hands Certification is required for businesses to apply for DC permits, licenses, and grants. Under current regulations, the certification verifies that a business does not owe more than $100 to the District of Columbia. It also assesses a significant fee for reporting errors. Based on District Bridges, CNHEDs, and other SBTA providers who work closely with individual small business owners, we found that the clean hand certification requirement to be a barrier to accessing the regulatory and financial supports small businesses need to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Similar to struggling district families, small business owners are having to decide which bills to pay on a month-to-month -month basis, leading periodically to falling behind. Although it is possible to secure clean hand certification if the business owner negotiates a payment plan, businesses have experienced long delays in accessing OTR staff to develop these agreements. We have also found that OTR records can be inaccurate, leading to an inappropriate denial of the certification while the claim is disputed. The delays that arise from efforts to create payment plans and resolve disputes can result in significant missed opportunities. For example, businesses have failed to meet grant deadlines or delayed opening and expansions during high seasons. These challenges are magnified for minority owned businesses with fewer resources to resolve errors, businesses without digital access and business owners who are non-native English speakers. Ironically, these are the types of businesses many relief programs are intended to support. It is important to note that prior to the pandemic, many of these businesses were fully compliant and without debt to the district. To provide small businesses with the best chance to fully recover, 
We ask the DC Council to introduce a two-year moratorium from DC's clean hand certification requirements for small business licensing, permitting, and grant applications. Further, we request expanded financial resources to support additional full-time employees for OTR to support small businesses in resolving disputes and creating payment plans during the moratorium period. Support should also be provided in multiple languages to ensure all have a fair shot to come into compliance. DC small businesses are working hard to keep their doors open, workers employed, community <coughs> and debts repaid. During this period of recovery, we encourage the district to do all it can to assist these important economic partners to access the government programming and meet regulatory requirements intended to aid in their recovery from these exceptional circumstances. Instead of possible permanent closures, these measures could enable businesses to stay open and generate the revenue needed to meet their financial obligations to the district and correct any errors during the moratorium period. Thank you for very much for this opportunity to provide testimony. And thank you uh, for providing your testimony, both of you, uh, on the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. Um, uh, Ms. Copper, have you had a chance to review uh, the bill that, that I introduced? Okay, I just want to make sure it was on your radar. Yeah, and we're very supportive of the recommended modifications. Okay, I know the, the CFO is, is concerned about the, the size of the FISC and the costs associated with the bill, uh, but I did want to make sure that you were aware of it. So again, thank you both for your testimony here this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. We're going to turn next to Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking. We have one witness who signed up to testify. <coughs> He's familiar to the committee, and he is Joseph Lightman Santa Cruz, uh, who's the CEO and Executive Director of Capital Area Asset Builders. It's good to see you. Uh, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, my name is Joseph Blackman Santa Cruz. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the DC-based nonprofit Capital Area Asset Builders. Today, it's my honor to provide testimony before the committee in support of the proposed FY22 budget for DISB DISB. The work that we do together with DISB directly addresses and minimizes the racial wealth gap in the District of Columbia. It also provides prosperity opportunities for low to moderate income Washingtonians. CAB partners with DISB to link low and moderate income residents with information, resources, and money to achieve financial stability and build wealth. CAB currently has two partnerships with DISB, the DC Earned Income Tax Credit Campaign and the DC Opportunity Accounts Program. Given the ongoing pandemic and the significant socioeconomic challenges that primarily low to moderate income residents in the district, specifically our black and brown brothers and sisters face, we at CAB strongly believe that both of the partnerships with DISB play a key role in economic development and should continue to be funded in FY22. Specifically regarding the DC EIT campaign, DISB has been an instrumental partner to ensure that all EITC eligible Washingtonians know about this critical tax credit. Last year, we estimate that about 48,000 low wage DC residents claim more than 156 million in the EITC at both the federal and at the DC level. However, a lot more work still has to be done. CAB estimates that about 20,000 EITC eligible families are missing out on over $40 million of this critical tax credit. Regarding the DC Opportunity Accounts Program, we are extremely proud of managing this program. Each Washingtonian participating in the program is incentivized to save up to $1,500 and can then receive a match of up to $6,000. And this is a tax-free grant being provided. The combined $7,500 can be used to invest in their well-being and long-term asset building, like buying a home in the district, launching a business in the district, paying for college, and other long-term assets. The DC Opportunity Accounts Program is a unique program in the nation, and we're extremely proud and applaud that Mayor Bosser has requested an expansion of $3.8 million. This is a significant investment that will provide prosperity opportunities to primarily low-income black and brown district residents. And we kindly request that you support and fund this expansion as well as the FY22 budget for DISB. We would like to recognize the leadership by Commissioner Woods and the key role that DISB plays in empowering district residents on personal financial matters. We appreciate her support for the work that CAP does to both raise EITC awareness and to financially empower district residents to the DC Opportunity Accounts. 
thank you, Council Member McDuffie, for your proactive role in ensuring that addressing and minimizing the racial wealth gap continues to be at the forefront in the district. 100% of the work that CAB does seeks to minimize the racial wealth gap in the district. Thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Lightman Santa Cruz. I, I don't have any questions for you. I'm very familiar with you all's work, as you know. Uh, and uh, uh, if we do have anything, uh, we'll follow up uh, via email. Uh, we, we know that we've been in communication with Disby about the program more recently. And so uh, if we have any follow-up, we'll let you know. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna uh, transition to the Department of Small Local Business Development uh, or DSLBD for short, uh, which supports the development, economic growth, and retention of district-based small businesses and promotes economic development throughout the district's commercial corridors. Um, we got a number of witnesses who signed up uh, in advance to testify with this agency. And so I ask that participants please mute their microphones when they're not speaking. We're gonna call about seven or eight witnesses per panel. And I also wanna urge everyone to be mindful of the clock. Uh, I have been interjecting throughout the day. I hate to do it, but we have to, given uh, we want to be courteous of every witness's time, particularly those who've signed up for multiple panels and have been very patiently waiting for their opportunity to provide testimony. All right. We're going to begin uh, with Yvette Banfield. Good to see you again. You begin your testimony. Hi, good afternoon, and good to see you again as well. Um, good afternoon, Councilmember McDuffie and members of the committee. My name is Yvette Banfield, and I am the Vice President of Economic Development Policy at the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. Um, CMHED, uh, excuse me, Councilmember McDuffie, we wanna thank you again for your leadership uh, around advancing issues around racial equity in the district by introducing key legislation and commissioning research to improve make improvements in the district's small business ecosystem and making it more inclusive. Um, for, the D for the district's FY 2022 budget, CNHGD is asking um, council to affirm its commitment to the district's small business community and our neighborhood commercial corridors by supporting um, CNHGD's budget ask for um, the Department of Small and Local Business Development. CNHGD is looking to council to commit um, 5.6 million for the Main Streets program and we are also requesting a cost of living increase for the Clean Teens program. Um, we are asking that the increase in funding, which equates to about $50,000 per program for the main streets be used in flexible funding to enable them to address the specific issues and challenges impacting their corridors. Um, each of these corridors are different and, and they have different challenges and needs. We're, um, we commend DSLBD for continued efforts to support the district's Asp Aspire program and the microloan program for um, um, Dream Teens, excuse me, Dream Grants, the microloan program for small businesses in Ward 7 and 8. And we're asking that um, CNGT supports the mayor's um, FY20 uh, 22 budget of $250,000 for the Aspire program. And we're asking council to commit 2 million to um, support the green, uh, the dream grants and supplement the district's robust retail uh, grants, um, which is funded through fines. And lastly, uh, we are asking um, council to commit um, 10 million in the budget line 3050 for access to capital. CNHD has continuously advocated for this and it has remained at 169,000. Um, we cannot um, over, we cannot stress the importance of a flexible fund for small businesses with limited access to traditional vehicles for financing to scale up their businesses. Um, and lastly, uh, we are asking council to commit 150,000 to support and operate um, the operating costs for the, for the needed program around the district's uh, mentor protege and bonding program. Um, and that concludes my testimony. And thank you for providing that testimony. We're going to turn next to Peying Lifong. 
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Pai Yingli Fong again, and I had already testified in the, um, the video embed session. So I will not repeat the, the testimony that I had already provided, but I will just, I guess, emphasize a couple of things. One thing that I wanted to, uh, I guess, share again is that I do speak on behalf of the DC Co-op stakeholder, Stakeholders Group. We have been working together for five years. We have mostly been in contact with one DSL LBD staff member. However, we realized that we haven't really had visibility and have not been on the table of um, the DC economic development, um, I guess, big picture. And so we really wanted to take this opportunity of the FY 2022 DC budget hearing to be on the table, especially because of the post pandemic um, efforts to try to, to find different models of um, economic development that would be more resilient and racially and economically just in DC. I would uh, say that, um, for example, you know, we, we haven't really the only co-op specific grant this year was $40,000 for four co-ops at $10,000 each through Wakif and Capital Impact, which was wholly insufficient for startup co-ops. Uh, co-ops are special business entities with their specific legal tax and governance structures. They need very specific types of financing and, and technical assistance. They need density of cooperatives and then second level technical assistance co-ops to survive and thrive. We would like to collaborate with, with DLSBD to create the following resources to help startup co-ops and the technical assistance partners they need to, to emerge and grow. So I'm going back to the three recommendations that had already been shared before. One is that we would like seed funding to really research and, ana and analyze DC's co-ops and the co-ops ecosystem that is going to be needed for DC. The funding, the financing, the technical assistance, which is legal and business development. Two, we would like to provide seed funding to support pilot projects that can once again support co-op startups that will develop business models for specific industry sectors and targeted worker communities, which are very diverse in DC. And then three, we would, we would like to establish a co-op trust fund where funding partners, private sector partners, and private citizens can add to city resources. Thank you for the opportunity to testify again, and I am available for, to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next is Zachary Israel. Commissioner. Uh, Chair McDuffie and members of the committee, thank you for holding this critically important budget oversight hearing today. Uh, my name is Zach Israel and I represent single member district 4D04, which includes parts of Petworth and Brightwood Park in Ward 4. Uh, I am testifying today on behalf of Advisory Neighborhood Commission 4D, whose six commissioners collectively represent more than 12,000 residents. The focus of my testimony today centers on ANC 4D support for a new DC Main Streets program designation beginning in fiscal year 2022 for Petworth, encompassing the Georgia Avenue corridor north of Kansas Avenue and south of Missouri Avenue and Upshur Street. Uh, SMD 4D04 includes the eastern side of Georgia Avenue between Emerson and Ingraham Streets, where several dozen independently owned and operated small businesses ranging from a barber shop to Ethiopian and Jamaican restaurants, a Latin bakery and a nail salon are located. These businesses form the backbone of our community and a DC Main Streets designation will help them tremendously. In addition to new businesses that may move into currently vacant and or blighted properties on this section of Georgia Avenue. The DC Main Streets program, quote, promotes the revitalization of business corridors by retaining and recruiting businesses, improving commercial properties and streetscapes and attracting consumers. Leaders in these neighborhood organizations assist businesses and coordinate sustainable community-driven revitalization efforts in their neighborhoods. As a result of the DC Main Streets program, the district has seen an increase in new businesses and jobs. In addition, facade improvements and building rehab projects have upgraded the image of the commercial corridors, while marketing and branding efforts have resulted in additional exposure and increased market share. While there are currently DC Main Streets located on Upper Georgia Avenue, north of Missouri Avenue, the Kennedy Street and 14th Street corridors and Lower Georgia Avenue, south of Petworth, 
the stretch of Georgia Avenue that I represent has been left out of this great program. On May 19th, 2021, ANC4D unanimously passed a resolution, number one, supporting the establishment and designation of a Petworth Main Street on the Upshur Street corridor and Georgia Avenue between Kansas and Missouri Avenues, and number two, supporting a funding allocation of $200,000 in the Department of Small and Local Business Development's FY22 budget for a first-time investment for the Petworth Main Street designation and a subsequent investment of $150,000 annually to DSLBD for this purpose. This funding will provide significant returns in terms of business stability and growth and neighborhood vitality in ANC4D and provide targeted technical assistance and capacity building to support our neighborhood businesses during and beyond the pandemic. In addition to ANC4D, ANC4C, which encompasses the Upshur Street Corridor, has also expressed their support for this, as well as Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis-George and hundreds of Ward 4 residents. A Petworth Main Street designation and boundary realignment is critical for ensuring an equitable economic recovery for our ANC 40 neighborhoods. And I urge the committee to allocate the funding necessary in FY 2022 to create this new designation. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Next is Commissioner Clara Botson. Good afternoon. Um, I have a similar topic here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Clara Haskell Botstein, and I'm the ANC Commissioner for 4C08 in Petworth and a proud Petworth resident. I'm also here to urge you to support funding for a Petworth Main Street in the FY22 budget. As you may know, the DC Main Streets program, currently comprising 26 Main Streets, has been highly successful in supporting and retaining local businesses by helping them secure grants and other resources and serving as a coordinating body and collective voice for local business corridors. These main streets, which are run by nonprofit organizations, have created jobs, recruited businesses, made public improvements, and generated neighborhood engagement and community-driven economic activity. Main streets dedicate a full-time staff person to supporting local businesses with their, their specific needs and give out at least 35,000 in direct grants to businesses within the main street boundary. While Ward 4 has several main streets encompassing much of the Georgia Avenue corridor, there is a crucial gap in coverage in the heart of our community in Petworth. There is currently no main street covering the Upshur Street corridor or on Georgia Avenue from Kansas to Kennedy and through to Missouri, where many small restaurant and retail businesses have been profoundly impacted by COVID-19, including many women, minority and immigrant owned businesses and longstanding small businesses. On Upshur Street, where I live, we have a range of wonderful small businesses from Willow to Cinder to Art of Noise and Loyalty Books to Town and Country Market and Fia's Fabulous Finds. However, we have seen significant turnover even before COVID-19 and businesses have shuttered during the pandemic. My colleagues and I have heard numerously from businesses about the need for more direct assistance, capacity building and strategic support to weather crises like this one, recover stronger and realize Petworth's full potential. For example, while the 800 block of Upshur Street is a critical community resource and attraction with expansive opportunities for economic development and community engagement, as evidenced by the recent Petworth Porch Fest event that brought thousands to the area, the businesses are in real need of support in order to survive and thrive. A Main Street would be an important step and a catalyzing force for economic stability and development that harnesses Petworth's great diversity and community. As we look towards a strong and equitable recovery in the district, we urge you to include funding for Petworth Main Street in the FY22 budget. This relatively small investment of 200,000 will yield strong returns in terms of business stability and growth, job maintenance and creation, community engagement and neighborhood vitality. Most importantly, this investment will have the greatest impact on the businesses that need it the most, including those that have been hardest hit by COVID-19 and those owned by people with limited access to traditional capital. Over 100 businesses would be supported by this investment in the future of our community. Um, we have a neighborhood petition with nearly 450 signatures um, and an ANC resolution in, with unanimous support for this from 4C as well as 4D. Um, and I thank you for your time and consideration and would be glad to take questions. Thank you for your testimony this afternoon, Commissioner. We're gonna turn next to your colleague who I assume will probably have similar testimony, uh, Paul Johnson, ANC 4C07. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my colleague, Commissioner Bostein, is always a hard act to follow, but I'll, I'll give it the uh, college try. Thank you, um, Chairman, for um, overseeing this and your um, um, uh, stewardship of uh, economic um, and equity and um, economic development with guardrails. It's really important, and uh, we think that's 
our ask and advocacy today is right in line with that thinking. We also uh, wanted to take an opportunity to thank our Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis-George for her um, strenuous and steadfast um, advocacy um, on behalf of her constituents, which include small businesses here in uh, the ward and here in this particular uh, area of the ward. I just wanted to sort of emphasize a few points. I know sort of short on time. Um, we're, we're asking, and my colleagues before me have shared the particulars of the, of the ask for the Petworth Main Street, but we're asking for um, you and your colleagues in the district to invest in us, um, to invest in our communities. Small businesses are the lifeblood of the economy, and they're really where the rubber meets the road in terms of uh, our constituents and residents benefiting from the fruits um, of an ec equitable economic recovery. Um, I want to share that we really have a broad base support from a uh, variety of stakeholders. Um, there's collaboration amongst advisory neighborhood commissions. There's no sort of um, narrow casting of fiefdoms. Um, uh, in terms of customer demand and support, uh, we have a petition, as was mentioned, uh, that indicates broad-based uh, support from consumers. Um, we have sort of nonprofit and civic entities that are uh, very active in this space. Um, we have uh, CDFIs. I was pleased to see some discussion before about the deployment of capital. Industrial Bank supports this. It's right uh, smack within this catchment area. And um, it's very important, the barriers uh, of access to capital um, and the, the, the sort of last mile of deployment that I think one of the other um, um, uh, testimonial uh was given that uh, there is a uh, really a needed effort to make sure that the last mile deployment of capital is sort of given to this area. We think a Main Street sort of helps in that regard. And I think that to address the racial wealth gap, uh, a Main Street is important, um, critical. I think with the comprehensive plan passing um, and determining who lives here and who benefits economically from the changes that happen here, a Main Street designation is important to support our businesses. Um, so thank you very much. Um, 4C uh, supports this. And uh, thank you again, we're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Just to, you know, we lost you a few times uh, there throughout your testimony. I think we certainly got the gist of it, but wanted to just let you know that. So if you haven't already, if you could just provide your testimony in writing, that would be helpful as well. Okay, thank you. Are there any resolutions? I think they were mentioned in some of the testimony about uh, resolutions in support of this and, and ensuring that the committee has those would be helpful as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Charlie Whitaker, uh, who is the CEO of Career Path DC. It's good to see you. Mr. Whitaker, you can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, council members. Good to see you also. I would like to thank you, the mayor, and other council members for supporting the clean teams during this epidemic. And also, I would really love to thank DSLBD. They've been a wonderful partner over the last 11 years. Today, I want to talk to you guys, though, about some numbers. So for our clean teams, we haven't received an increase in several years. So in 2018, the clean team was making $13.95 an hour. The living wage took us to uh, $14.20 an hour um, in 18, and then it went to $14.50 an hour in 19, and then it went to $14.65 an hour um, January to, during January 2020. Um, as, of as of July the uh, 1st, 2021, we'll be making $15.20 an hour, the team members will be making and we haven't received any type of um, increase in funding. Also, um, we have new requirements from DSLBD. We have to have cyber insurance. We have to have excess liability insurance, which is an un uh, umbrella insurance. And we have to now have environmental pollution insurance. All these insurances um, puts a large strain on our organization. And I just wanna tell you how much we receive in administrative calls through these grants. I'm gonna give you an example. So from Minnesota Avenue 
it's it's one hundred and seven thousand dollars. We have we get zero amount for administrative calls. For Kennedy Street, we get two percent um, administrative calls. From uh, Connecticut Avenue, it's like three percent administrative calls. Um, and I'm saying this to say this: if if we could just get more in administrative calls, if if they could give every team, if every team could receive twenty five thousand dollars per area for administrative calls that would really assist us with these new calls. And I haven't yet started talking about our bags went up, um, our uniforms went up during the pandemic, uh, our supplies also went up during the pandemic. And uh, we've been working through the entire pandemic. Career Path DC never took off. We, our guys came in faithfully and worked. My biggest fear is that at a point, we're just gonna be in the red and it's going to be it's going to really affect our organization. We love doing what we do for DC residents. We love doing what we do for the community. However, our ask today is just one to ensure that we do have that the contracts get an increase of at least twenty five thousand dollars to make sure we can um, pay for a lot of new administrative costs that we have, and two that um, as the living wage goes up that we have like a fund set to, to the side where you guys can then go in and as you um give the guys an increase that you would can that you'll be able to increase the budgets at the same time because this has really been a strain on us um if you have any questions uh I, i'm feel free to ask me and but i appreciate and i want to say this i definitely appreciate the program and i definitely appreciate you guys for all the support you've done over the years Sure, sure. No, I appreciate your testimony, Ms. Whitaker. Uh, this is uh, the work that you do and, and the work of your team is, is extraordinarily important uh, to our commercial corridors. I think uh, everybody will acknowledge that. And, and I've had extensive conversation with you about this issue, which I think is more structural and needs to be addressed urgently. Uh, you mentioned cyber insurance, excess yes, insurance, and environmental what insurance? Cyber insurance um, and environmental pollution insurance. So yeah. we 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 fought it. We fought the environmental pollution insurance last year, but this year they came back and said we had to do it again. So we, we just went on and got it because um, we just want to stay in compliance. Okay. But so knowing what your costs are would be helpful. So if you could you know, just just reach out to the committee and provide okay. that information um, uh, so that we have a sense, and we'll we'll, we'll likely uh, reach out to some of the other uh, clean teams to to get their costs and, and get a sense of, of, of uh, the increased costs more broadly, but also uh, the cost of insurance and having to have that as well. Uh, so I appreciate you raising that very important issue. You guys are a lot of people who live in these communities across the District of Columbia, in many cases, you know, people with barriers to entry into the workforce. And so uh, I, I really do appreciate what you do. Uh, and, and thank you for the testify today. Um, I, I'll note, we, we still have a few more witnesses on this round, but I, I will note for the record that we've been joined by Ward 4 council member, uh, uh, Janice Lewis George, and uh, it's perfect timing. You just had a few of your commissioners who testified about the need for an additional Main Streets. And so uh, we'll give you a five minute round. We just have a, a few more witnesses on this panel. Eric, uh, Alves, this, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is on the right correctly or not. Alves Desa. I think it's the last name. He's not present. Oh, he's not present. Okay. How about, I see Alex Padro, who's uh, executive director of Shaw Main Street. So we're gonna turn to uh, Ms. Padro. You can give me a testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and committee staff. I'm Alexander M. Padro, executive director of Shaw Main Street since 2004 and a former 10 year excuse me, 10 term ANC commissioner representing Central Shaw. Shaw Main Street is grateful that the Bowser administration appreciates the crucial role that the DC Main Street's program is playing and will continue to play in supporting our city's small businesses during the intense stresses that the COVID-19 crisis is imposing on almost every independent business in our neighborhood. At least 16 Shaw businesses have closed permanently since the onset of the pandemic and more may follow in its aftermath due to financial damage and societal changes resulting from the virus. 
As our city begins the reopening process, additional resources will be needed in order for organizations like ours to support surviving businesses. The FY21 DC Main Street grants shifted $30,000 from promotional activities that supported multiple businesses to direct grants to specific businesses. While that helped the, the handful of businesses that received the grants, Shaw Main Street serves over 300 businesses, the vast majority of which were deprived of the services that they would normally be as a result of that repurposed funding. Hopefully, the FY22 grants will remove the requirement for direct grants or provide additional funds that can be used to benefit the majority of our businesses. As some of the more mature DC Main Street's programs have seen the number of businesses in their corridors grow, funding has not increased to be able to provide the full range of services that businesses expect. It is no longer reasonable to continue to provide even funding to all DC Main Street's programs, irrespective of the size of their service areas and the number of businesses they serve. One size does not fit all. A mature program like Shaw with over 300 businesses should not be funded at the same level as a newer program or one that has a fraction of the number of businesses relying on its services. The clean team grants that are the principal funding source for clean and safe teams across the city have been frozen at $117,000 for a number of years. Needless to say, the combination of annual living wage increases and steady increases in the cost of supplies and equipment are now threatening to require the reduction of service in areas covered by these teams. The living wage alone has increased by a dollar per hour in the past three years. The commitment to paying a living wage is important to every Main Street and our service providers, but this is currently an unfunded mandate. The annual grant should be increased to at least $130,000 for FY22. Furthermore, a number of Main Street's clean team service boundaries are smaller than our overall DC Main Street service areas due to the limited funds provided. In order to be able to serve areas and show a Main Street service area that are currently not provided clean and safe services like 6th Street and 11th Street, additional funding needs to be made available so that the clean team boundaries can be expanded to match the Main Street boundaries. With your support, DC Main Street programs will redouble our efforts to keep our current businesses, to help our current businesses survive and then chart a path to post COVID-19 prosperity. Shaw Main Street's plans to redouble our efforts to promote existing businesses and the new businesses that are filling recently vacated retail spaces. We'll pay special attention to more than 60 legacy businesses that have been in operation from 15 years to over a century. We built a thriving set of commercial corridors before who plan to do everything possible to help our corridors return to their past prosperity. I'm available to answer any questions you may have for me now or after the hearing. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, do not see Bill McLeod, so we're going to move next to Cal Todd, Executive Director of the Bladesburg Road Main Street, as well as Rhode Island Avenue Main Street. Uh, I see the name, and now I see hey. the person. Uh, good afternoon to you. It's good to see you, you begin your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Committee Chair McDuffie and the rest of the committee. I am very pleased to be testifying today in anticipation of the continuing economic improvement here in DC as pandemic restrictions are lifted and life seems to be getting uh, back to normal. As we come out of 15 months of economic challenges, we know our work made a difference for small businesses in our corridors. This committee and the entire team at DSLBD have been invaluable in making sure that small businesses had as much access to assistance as possible despite limited resources. The majority of our DSLBD grant funds over the past year have gone directly to businesses to assist with rent, utilities, payroll, and just keeping the doors open. Now, as we look forward to the new fiscal year with a feeling of optimism, the role of Main Street programs and the economic recovery of the District of Columbia is more important than ever. Even as we unmask and start dining out and shopping, small businesses are facing challenges to get themselves back up to full speed. In particular, we are being asked by business owners to help uh, with expanded technical assistance, marketing, promotional activities, and, and freshening up their storefronts again. Um, to put it another way, we are seeing more demand for assistance than ever as existing businesses seek to improve their practices and new businesses are joining our corridors. Over the last few years, our funding from DSLBD has remained static. And this year I joined my colleagues in requesting that funding for our existing Main Street programs be increased by at least $50,000 per program above the mayor's proposed budget so that we can more effectively meet the needs of our small business communities. I would additionally ask that clean teams funding be increased to provide expanded service as we welcome the return of 
restaurants, theaters, and businesses that operate later in the evenings and weekends, uh, in addition to all of the things that Mr. Whitaker mentioned previously. Uh, this committee, and in fact, the entire council and the mayor have all been incredibly supportive of Main Streets for the last several years. And I hope that we've proven to you that our work has been a critical component of the growth that DC has experienced and a positive return on your tax dollar investment. I encourage you not only to continue, but also to expand this support through additional funding. We will always do our best for the small businesses that make DC such a special place to live and work. Recovery will take time and Main Streets will be here for small businesses every step of the way. Thank you for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have for me. And thank you for your testimony. We're gonna turn next to Rachel Shank, who's Executive Director of Georgetown Main Streets. And good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. Let me just get my testimony up here on my screen really quickly. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Council Member McDuffie and members of the committee. My name is Rachel Shank. I'm the Executive Director of the Georgetown Main Street Program, GMS. Our corridor stretches from K Street to Whitehaven Parkway along Wisconsin Avenue and half a block east and west. GMS supports more than 200 small and local businesses, not including corporate businesses, across the mile plus of the commercial district. Close to 60% of our small businesses uh, are either women, immigrant, or minority owned. And first and foremost, before I get started, I just want to thank you and this committee's support of small businesses during this past year. Today, I want to talk about two pretty straightforward funding opportunities that could be incredibly beneficial to small businesses in our corridor. During these past 16 months, the Wisconsin Avenue Commercial Corridor in Georgetown experienced 21 small business closures, just small businesses. To help businesses respond to the pandemic, GMS acquired parklet permits for outdoor dining, connected businesses with technical assistance providers, created opportunities for commerce to occur safely outdoors, and directly helped small businesses acquire over $400,000 collectively in grants. Every DC neighborhood is unique and will face a different set of challenges as we transition into the economic recovery. Georgetown Main Street and my fellow programs intimately understand the needs of our communities. We provide high touch individualized and trusted support. We're fortunate here in Georgetown because there's a diversity of dining, retail and recreation that attract patrons to the community. However, we will still face challenges related to inaccessible rent prices, stringent rules regarding an opening in a historic neighborhood, maintaining historic buildings, technological illiteracy and safety and security to name a few. I fear we will face a new wave of challenges as rents become due and evictions resume. Demand increases, but employment remains challenging and online retail continues to grow in popularity. We're asking for an additional $50,000 in unrestricted funds per existing Main Street program to help each organization tailor interventions in our communities. In Georgetown, we would use that funding for capacity building and to bring on technical assistance experts to provide specific and requested one-on-one -on -one support. I'd also like to request an additional $73,000 be added to the Glover Park Clean Team Grant to fund the expansion of their services. Currently, the 1700 and 1800 blocks of Wisconsin Avenue are neglected, falling into a gap between Glover Park Clean Team and the Georgetown bid. These two blocks have a full grocery store, six busy bus stops, a middle school, a popular weekend market, seven restaurants and cafes, 20 retail service businesses, and a rec center. Uh, the Glover Park Main Street shares support for this request. I'd like to thank this committee, the council, and the mayor for continued funding of the DC Main Streets program. And I'd like to thank Director Whitfield and the DC Main Streets team, Christina Maruso and Elizabeth Anderson for their support and dedication to DC um, small businesses. I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, and the final witness on this particular panel is gonna be DeAndre Anderson. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and staff. My name is DeAndre Anderson, and I'm the program manager for the Woodley Park Main Street. Designated in 2018, WPMS supports approximately 70 small businesses and community members on the Connecticut Avenue corridor from Calvert Street to Devonshire Place Northwest in Ward 3. Our Main Street includes the Smithsonian National Zoo, the Omni Shoreham Hotel, and the location of the historic Wardman Marriott, which is currently vacant. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, the city government has expressed interest in acquiring that building. The business community would like to know. Otherwise, we would like to hear if you could help with starting a community engagement process that includes business owners, Woodley Park residents, and the, the government to decide what would be best for all stakeholders. Now that the National Zoo has reopened, 
we believe it is vital for the growth of the businesses on our main street to have some type of tourist attraction for that site. And while we have been focused on getting our businesses to pivot from marketing towards tourists to concentrating on local residents, it is important to have a good balance of business in our community. And as you know, Mr. Chairman, tourism adds to that balance. Our mission is to promote urban revitalization and investment in Willie Park's commercial centers and provide a safe and beautiful community for its people. That has been difficult during COVID-19, but in response to the challenges presented by the pandemic, our Main Street has helped small businesses by providing pro bono legal support to small business owners who had to rene renegotiate their lease agreement by removing graffiti from buildings because DPW doesn't do that work above ground level, by helping landlords find new tenants to build vacant buildings to keep our commercial corridor vibrant, and by providing over $36,000 in grant funds to keep Whitley Park small businesses open, which are over 70% minority owned to align with the city's racial equity efforts. I'm requesting that the district allocate an additional $50,000 to the $150,000 already allocated to WPMS so that we can expand our support to address the particular challenges facing neighborhood businesses. These funds are urgently needed to support the new businesses that are coming into our neighborhood um, to help with opening expenses, to provide immigrant outreach to business owners who do not speak or write in English and most often cannot take advantage of grants provided by any organization and to continue to support businesses that need legal support for lease negotiation to prevent um, evictions. In conclusion, Willie Park very much appreciates the support provided by DSLBD's Main Street Grant Program, the ongoing support of Council Member Che, and the DC Council overall for small businesses in the district. With this additional support, we hope to be able to preserve the existing small businesses and support new ones to thrive in our community. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you for your testimony. I want to thank each of the witnesses on this panel. Before we transition to the next panel, as I mentioned, uh, we were joined a little earlier by Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis George, and she's here, and I'm going to turn to her for uh, around five minutes. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairperson uh, McDuffie. Um, I have a few questions that I want to ask and I want to direct it uh, to our Ward 4 A and C commissioners. Um, I, I want to get a sense of, I, I saw that you submitted um, a petition that had over 450 signatures. Um, so I want to um, ask uh, Commissioner uh, Claire Bostein, uh, Paul Johnson, um, and Zach Israel, um, sort of understanding of what the impact has the pandemic had on the businesses in your SMD. Um, or your ANC uh, commission, and can you sort of help me paint a picture of the demographics of the businesses in your um, ANC? Are they independent businesses, big chains? Are they owned by DC residents, um, black owned, women owned? Um, could you share some of, uh, of their demographics and sort of what the impact has been for them? So um, I'll just jump in. Thank you, Councilman Rula Stewart for being here. Um, so, you know, along the stretch of Georgia Avenue that I represent from Emerson up to Ingraham Street, uh, the majority of businesses are small, independently owned businesses, many minority owned. Mm -hmm. um, we have a barber shop, we have a nail salon, we have uh, a Jamaican restaurant, an Ethiopian restaurant. And, um, you know, things have been tough for my conversations uh, with those owners over the last 14, 15 months. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this type of designation that we're talking about, I think would really help all of them collectively um, and, uh, you know, make things more equitable as we move forward. Um, this part of Georgia Avenue has sort of been left behind out of this and, and this, this would help rectify things. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, I would just second um, what Commissioner Israel said. I mean, we have, um, you know, they're all small businesses. A lot of the owners are local. Um, a lot of women and minority owned businesses. Um, and I think one of the things that we're hoping on Main Street will do will sort of catalyze um, kind of engagement um, and more resources towards the community. But a lot of the um, 
the businesses, you know, there can be language barriers. So accessing DC grants can be challenging, just sort of navigating not just the crisis, but normal operations. And as I said in my testimony, we've seen a lot of turnover um, even before COVID-19. And so um, even on the 800 block of Upshur, which is, you know, has the highest concentration in the area. So um, there's a real, real need. Um, these are local mom and pop shops, um, retail restaurants. Um, it's a community driver, a community locus point, um, and can be an attraction for the entire district. Um, but again, it's, I think, sometimes the kind of really successful businesses here can um, mask the realities for most. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's also interest in just having an organizing body that can help with, you know, the streetscapes were meant, or, you know, the streeteries were mentioned. Um, you know, is that something we want? how to get the permits, who's gonna organize that. Um, you know, we've been involved with some arts, um, community-based arts events um, from Mr. Johnson and I and others. And, you know, we've been doing that on a volunteer basis, um, but having a main street to kind of, you know, even host a GoFundMe, you know, you need right. a nonprofit. So there could be huge potential um, realized um, and jobs created and maintained as a result of a main street. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Council Member. I had a couple of thoughts to share just to your question about um, impact and demography. Um, you know, the impact, there's been closures, you know, and there's been sort of suffering. And um, I, which, you know, is not a surprise, but I think that um, it also highlights the um, inequities and structural inequities that were already sort of existing with some of the businesses in terms of um, access to professional services, you know, accountants and mm -hmm. um, legal advisors and uh, mediators and negotiators and all those things, which help to buy you some time. I think that, um, so I think while we need a recovery, there was, you know, the baseline was problematic in terms of structural inequities, which we need to think about and consider, um, particularly, you know, I think um, Ms. Uh, Kuyper and Mr. Pettigrew spoke about um, the nexus between ownership and displacement, um, spoke about the deployment of the last mile of capital between the community development for institutions and all of these things sort of intersect um, to address the wealth gap and ownership and how these um, businesses meaningfully participate and the changes in the development that happened in our ward and uh, within our sort of neighborhoods. So, um, and to your question about the makeup of businesses, I mean, it's really, really vibrant and diverse. Um, you have uh, black owned businesses, women owned businesses, black women owned businesses, you know, um, uh, you have uh, immigrants, Latinx, you have LGBT owners, um, and um, it really runs the gamut. So I think we're really representative of, of all of those things. And I think it should be supported. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think my time is up. But I want to say another thing about um, your Patworth community is particularly is that Pat, Patworth community members are intentional about supporting their, their community. Uh, Small businesses, they want to invest in their small businesses, they want to support them, um, and, and the businesses want the support to be able to continue to contribute to the community. So I appreciate all of uh, our ANC commissioners work on this um, and, and look forward to working with you, uh, Councilmember McDuffie, um, as well as DSLBD to hopefully make this happen for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you to all the witnesses on this panel. Next, you could have a staff transition to the next panel of witnesses. We're gonna begin with Teresa Edmondson, who's just joined us. Main Street Manager, Lower Georgia Avenue, Main Street, District Bridges. Uh, good afternoon to you. you, can begin your good, afternoon. Thank you. good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie, Council Member and staff. My name is Teresa Edmondson and I'm the program manager of the Lower Georgia Avenue Main Street. Lower Georgia Avenue Main Street was established in 2017 and provided a grant from DSLBD. Approximately 220 small businesses operate on Lower Georgia Avenue Main Street, located over one and a half miles from Bryan Street on the south end in Ward 1 to Upshur Street on the north end in Ward 4. 
Lower George Avenue Main Street is one of six DC Main Street grants managed by the DC based nonprofit District Bridges. Lower George Avenue Main Street is the melting pot of longtime African American and immigrant businesses alongside new businesses. Languages spoken in these businesses include Mandarin, Amharic, Vietnamese, Arabic, Spanish, Korean, Swahili, French, and Urdu, to name a few. This stretch of George Avenue is also home to anchor institutions such as Howard University, the Bruce Monroe Community Park, and the Petworth Library, which provide stability and generate demand for services upon which our businesses depend. Despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past 19 months, LGAMS used the DSLBD DC Main Street grant to provide much needed support to neighborhood businesses, including over 800 hours of technical assistance. Other support included $75,000 in direct grants to 26 businesses, assistance with streetery permitting processes, facilitating technical and loan assistance with partnering organization Latino Economic Development Center, connecting businesses to the DC Small Business Development Center at Howard University and the DC Bar Pro Bono Legal Clinic, individualized support to BIPOC and women owned businesses to secure city and federal grants. 13 Lower Georgia Avenue Main Street businesses were recipients of one or the other or both. As the Lower Georgia Avenue Main Street program manager, I have three priorities. One, post COVID reactivation, helping businesses reconnect with their neighbors and clients. Two, building bridges, helping businesses overcome language barriers and three, business strengthening getting access for entrepreneurs to the basic technical and financial support they need to grow and thrive. By allocating $75,000 of additional funds to LGAMS, we could expand our support to address the challenges facing these neighborhood businesses, of which the main ones for Lower Georgia Avenue are language access, our language access assistance and access to capital as they struggle to reopen, recover and reconnect with their community. In conclusion, Lower George Avenue can be a wonderful example of how a neighborhood can build on its past history and culture as it revitalizes and diversifies. With this additional support, we at District Bridges can help ensure the progress and success of the Lower George Avenue Main Street. Lower George Avenue Main Street would also like to take this time to acknowledge the value and appreciation of support from the district government on Georgia Avenue since before, well before COVID. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Next is Zach Rabarzik, Program Manager, Cleveland Park Main Street. Thank you so much, Chairperson McDuffie, Council Members, and Committee staff. Uh, designated in 2019, Cleveland Park Main Street currently supports over 60 small businesses along the Connecticut Avenue Commercial Corridor in Ward 3. This corridor, part of the broader Cleveland Park Historic District, is home to a diverse mix of small and large businesses the majority of which are women and minority owned, ranging from legacy small retailers to new concept restaurants. It is also one of the six main streets managed by District Bridges. From January 2020 through March 2021, we've provided over 850 hours of technical assistance, ranging from alerting owners to pandemic related regulatory changes, assisting with grant applications and reporting requirements, to coordinating and liaising between DDOT and business owners over ongoing transportation projects. What I cannot stress enough is that despite the loosening of pandemic related restrictions and the gradual return of the customer base, our small local businesses in Cleveland Park, like many other businesses throughout the district, continue to need the support of the Main Street and district government as a whole. While it's a district wide and national issue, Many small business tenants in Cleveland Park are facing an uncertain future when it comes to lease negotiations with their landlords post pandemic. While many, but not all landlords have shown some level of flexibility with tenants in terms of lowering rent and establishing repayment pl plans, many businesses are still concerned about what the end of the public health emergency will, will mean for their ability to pay market rate rents and associated property taxes passed down to them without additional relief from the district. As I shared during a previous hearing, a particular challenge for CPMS during the pandemic was a mandatory closure of small retailers and personal service businesses. Even after reopening and implementing best practices to keep staff and customers safe, 
many of these same businesses continue to struggle to make up for lost time and sales. We, we now request council's assistance to make sure that regulations are again updated to bring these businesses to parity with their neighbors to allow small retailers to use outdoor space, similarly to restaurant streeteries, which are currently closed to retail participation. For FY22, we request that council increase the CPMS budget by 50,000 to a total of 200,000. This increase will allow us to provide a greater number of small businesses grants and technical assistance. In addition to target support, we anticipate will be needed to help businesses survive a large DDOT streetscape project in the coming year. In addition, while not directly related to the CPMS budget, we request that your committee work with DSLBD and the main streets along Connecticut Avenue to increase the budget for the Connecticut Avenue clean team to levels commensurate with other large clean team programs throughout the district. Of course, Without the support of DC Council and DSLBD, none of this would be possible. We look forward to continuing our partnership as we work together to help local businesses survive the current crisis and thrive long into the future. Appreciate it. And thank you for your testimony. Next on our list is Evan Washington from the Parks Main Street. And good afternoon to you and your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chair McDuffie. It's certainly good to see you. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member uh, Lewis George. Uh, certainly appreciated you uh, coming over into our over uh, Culture Coffee with your uh, community hours here last week. It was very successful. Also, committee members and staff of the co uh, Committee on B uh, Business and Economic Development, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today on the Mayor's FY22 budget as it relates to the Department of Small Local Business Development. In particular, it's DC Main Street's program. I am Edwin Washington, Executive Director of the Parks Main Street. TPMS is a program of the Center for Nonprofit uh, um, Advancement, uh, which also manages the Upper Georgia Avenue Main Street. TPMS will complete our third program year at the end of FY21. We continue to make a positive impact in the small businesses within our distinct commercial corridors of Riggs Park, Lamont Riggs, and Manor Park, uh, which, are, which are straddling wards four and five. Funding through DCLVD has made this possible. Without contradiction, FY20 was a year of change and in some cases devastation for DC small businesses. However, the upcoming summer months of FY21 bring a sense of hope. With this new sense of be uh, beginning, DC Main Street's program should have more funding to help businesses with all their uniqueness to help them survive, thrive, and compete. Small businesses are excited uh, to get back to full operation by serving residents and visitors. Just recently, TPMS's uh, second round grants allowed uh, us to provide help to a coffee shop with pilot funding to hire part-time workers to extend their hours a dry cleaner with entrance uh, lightning to increase visibility and security, e-commerce and social media for a health and wellness center, and outside upgrades to enhance the appeal of an event venue, just to name a few. Make no mistake about it, small businesses remain hampered by back rent and other outstanding obligations. The type of funding just mentioned reflects the hope small businesses uh, owners see in front of them. The mayor's FY22 budget is encouraging as a funding commitment for the DC Main Streets held at FY21 levels. I see this as a nod to the leadership provided by DCLB Director Christy Whitfield and the DC Main Street staff led by Christina Amoruso. DC Main Streets plays a vital role in commercial revitalization for small businesses. I do ask consideration that each Main Street program receive 50,000 more in funding. Increasingly, there is a need to provide one-on-one -on -one services on a case-by-case -case basis to small businesses. The pandemic has uncovered deeper issues with small businesses that may not have otherwise come to light. Uh, one size did not fit all in this case. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie, for your untiring uh, commitment to small businesses. Thank you to the City Council for your continued confidence in the Parks Main Street and my fellow DC Main Street programs across the city. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Washington. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Lee Catherine with Tillytown Main Street. And good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie and members of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. Uh, my name is Lee Catherine Miles, and I'm the Executive Director of Tillytown Main Street. 
I thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the FY22 budget for the DC Main Streets and Clean Team programs within the Department of Small and Local Business Development. Tillytown Main Street is a nationally accredited and DC designated Main Street program. Like the 25 other Main Street organizations that serve the city, we have spent the last year working shoulder to shoulder with the small local businesses in our community. We awarded more than $85,000 in grants and recovery supplies to Tillytown businesses and helped them secure more than $800,000 in additional grants assistance. We also provided more than 1,000 hours of technical assistance. All told, we were able to direct nearly a million dollars of assistance to small and local businesses during the pandemic. The value of Main Street programs goes beyond dollars and cents though. Main Streets are intentionally nimble, providing customized assistance to the businesses and neighborhoods we serve. We know there is not a one size fits all solution to the struggles facing businesses. And our business owners know they can call upon us at any time for help with lease negotiations or tax issues or government permitting or marketing advice or storefront renovations or myriad other issues. This is true whether we are in the midst of a global pandemic or on the path to recovery. While there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel as we celebrate our city's reopening, we cannot forget that our small businesses still have a long road ahead of them. I'm asking today that the DC Council increase funding for DSLBD in support of the DC Main Streets program by 1.3 million, or the equivalent of $50,000 more per Main Street as part of the city's investment in small local businesses. And let me emphasize the word investment. The annual $150,000 grant we received resulted in nearly $1 million in direct assistance to businesses, not to mention the value of new business attraction, place management, and business district marketing we provide. And that kind of return on investment is not atypical for Main Street programs. According to the National Main Street Center, on average, for every dollar allocated to a Main Street program, more than $30 is reinvested in the local economy. 30 to 1 is an exceptional return on investment by any standard. Additional funding would enable each Main Street program to provide support tailored to the specific needs of their business community. In Tenley Town, we'd allocate funds toward increased financial and technical assistance and support expanded initiatives to increase foot traffic and sales. I'm also here today advocating on behalf of the Wisconsin Avenue Clean Team. Citywide clean teams are often unrecognized frontline workers providing vital clean and safe services in our commercial corridors. They also offer employment and training for returning citizens providing a pathway to economic opportunity. Wisconsin Avenue Clean Team ranks in the top 25% of teams in length of service, street trees, and trash can service, yet falls in the bottom half in terms of funding. So I'm requesting an additional $50,000 be allocated to the Wisconsin Avenue Clean Team to hire additional crew members and provide funding commensurate to the needs of the commercial area served. I'm grateful for the support Mayor Bowser, this committee, and the entire DC Council has provided to businesses and to the Main Street programs that serve them, and for considering increasing that investment as we recover and grow back better. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have Michelle Malatsky with the Logan Circle Main Street, District Bridges. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman McDuffie and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about the Logan Circle Main Street and our DSLBD grant. I'm Michelle Malatsky, the program manager for the Logan Circle Main Street. Logan Circle Main Street is in its third year and supports 180 businesses along the 14th Street corridor from Thomas Circle to T Street Northwest in wards one and two. Logan Circle is one of the six Main Street programs managed by the DC nonprofit District Bridges. 14th Street is known for its restaurants and bars which make up 35% of the businesses. Other sectors include retail businesses which are 20% and professional services which are 14, 14%. Nearly two thirds of our businesses are locally owned. Some of the examples are the Great Wall Thetuan House, Miss Pixie's Furnishings and Studio Theater. One third of the businesses are nationally known chains such as Whole Foods and Sephora. 17% of our businesses are owned by women and 15% are owned by minority business owners. And nearly half of our businesses have been open for more than 10 years. This, during this past year, uh, District Bridges was able to survey some of our businesses that have been um, impacted by COVID, and we found that 70% of the businesses who responded reported losing 50% or more of their business due to COVID. Um, of the businesses that responded that have lost 50, less than 50% in revenue, these tended to be restaurants who were able to pivot and take advantage of other um, business models such as takeout and delivery. 
Over the past year, 15 businesses have closed in Logan Circle, nine new, rest, nine new businesses have opened, and we have 14 vacancies. Um, we have some recent developments in the neighborhood, which is that um, Amazon Go will be opening, and Fatfa, which is an online mattress company, is opening its first brick and mortar store, actually in the United States, in Logan Circle. During the past year, we have been able to provide technical assistance to 132 businesses. We have worked with streeteries, to, uh, with restaurant businesses to have streeteries and fences at 29 businesses. We've awarded $30,000 in business grants to 15 businesses, and we've been able to help over 27 businesses apply for and win nearly $250,000 in national and district grants. Um, we're also involved with cross -pro promotional opportunities for our businesses, such as this Saturday's uh, Burn and Brunch in Logan Circle at 9 a.m. Um, we are requesting an additional $20,000 in funding this year um, as part of the district's continuing support to Logan Circle Main Street and our locally owned businesses. Um, we hope to address the high commercial real estate rates that are driving out locally owned businesses vacancies, and safe and clean issues. With this funds, we will be able to provide more targeted technical and legal assistance. We wanna work with tenants so that they can negotiate leases with their landlords um, and support businesses who are now reopening after having made it through the pandemic. Milotsky, uh, your time has expired. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And thank you for your testimony. We do appreciate it here with the committee. Uh, next on the list is Carolina Putriago, who's uh, with the Columbia Heights Mount Pleasant Main Street Program, District Bridges. Good afternoon, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member McDuffie and members of the committee. My name is Carolina Huitrago. I am the pro Columbia Heights and Mount Pleasant Main Street Program, designated in 2000. Columbia Heights Mount Pleasant Main Street Program supports approximately 280 small businesses and community members in two of those neighborhoods in DC. Population and about 30% minority owned businesses. In response to the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, CHMPMS helped small businesses by supporting them apply for financial opportunities, both grants and loans, and leverage over $120,000 in funds. We helped at least 30 businesses apply and obtain permits for outdoor dining. This includes temporary sidewalk permits, parklets, and streeteries. We provided timeline, timely information on new grants and loans, regulatory updates, public health guidelines and promotional opportunities in both English and Spanish. We provided over $32,000 in small business grants to 16 businesses in the corridor. And we paid for the fence rental and the AD score covering costing over $15. We also connected businesses with DC Bar Pro Bono to help them negotiate their rent with the landlord. And under a grant from the Mayor's Office of Latino Affairs, we're supporting 13 Spanish speaking businesses with facade improvement projects on 14th Street. I am requested that the district allocate an additional $100,000 in funds to the CHMPMS so that we can expand our support to address the particular challenges facing neighborhood businesses as they struggle to reopen and recover. This program covers over 280 businesses in two very distinct neighborhoods. This additional funds would allow us to provide more equitable access to types of, of support the businesses in this corridor need. In addition to the many supports we already provide, these funds are urgently needed to provide small business grants to minority owned businesses who were at a disadvantage when applying to financial opportunity, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. with a particular focus on helping provide one-on-one -one as well as offering workshops on various topics and various languages to help the businesses get back on track um, post-pandemic. Without this additional investment by the district, many businesses in the Columbia Heights Mount Pleasant corridors are at risk of not being able to recover from the effects of the pandemic. This will disproportionately affect minority-owned businesses and would result in a significant loss in the diversity and cultural heritage of these communities. I would like to thank the council for continuing to fund this vital Main Street programs, which are more important than ever before as our city begins to recover. CHMPMS appreciates the support provided by, D by DSLDB and the ongoing focus of supporting small businesses here in the district. 
With this additional funding, we hope to be able to preserve the existing small businesses, which contribute to the identity of these neighborhoods and support new businesses to thrive in our communities. Thank you for your support and your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Um, I do not have any questions at the moment, but we do have just a couple more witnesses on this panel. Uh, and I uh, just want to note we've been rejoined by Ward 2 Council Member uh, Brooke Pinto. Uh, I'm going to turn to the next witness, who is uh, Kate Dean. And just as a heads up to witnesses, uh, I'm going to be uh, taking a brief recess, but we will not uh, interrupt the flow of this important hearing. And, and Council Member Pinto is going to take over as chair when I transition in about five minutes. So just wanted to give you all a heads up. We're going to turn now to Kate Dean with the Global Park Main Street. And good afternoon to you. You can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for allowing us to appear this afternoon. Um, I am Kate Dean. I'm the executive director of Glover Park Main Street. We are a relatively new Main Street in that we just finished our first year in existence. And if it's okay with everybody, I thought I would stray from prepared remarks uh, to talk to you about how actually I started off my day today dealing with a fire at one of our local businesses. And um, it doesn't seem like that would be something that a Main Street would be focused on that we wouldn't be the first phone call, but that kind of off books, really personalized work is, is really par for the course for um, my colleagues and I, and what we really are doing every day on the ground with these small and local businesses in the community. And I certainly didn't know that when I started um, with the organization, um, but that is really, uh, what can we do, right? Um, the only thing I could really do is stand with them and support them and communicate to the other businesses who are concerned for that kind of activity going on in the corridor and on their block, talk to the building owner and really connect them with a, a remediation company that can help them get out of this. But that is the kind of incident that um, Glover Park has benefited so much from having a Main Street over the last year plus and through this crisis, the amount of money that has been injected into the community directly from grants from the Main Street and also through the city's generosity has made it so that we have seen very few closures on the corridor. And in fact, we have seen a number of vacancies filled. Um, we've been working very hard to try to get some of those larger spaces filled during COVID. Uh, we've seen new businesses open and we have a couple of things to be very happy about. We have new construction projects coming online. Um, Whole Foods uh, that everyone is always asking about is under renovation and set to open in the coming weeks. Uh, we as the Main Street are undergoing some streetscape work. It's our first attempt uh, on our Northern Gateway. We're also installing street light banners, which is uh, very popular with the community. And unbelievably, uh, one of our new and small restaurants, Chiquette, was awarded a Michelin star just the other week. So we're, we're thrilled at the progress in the neighborhood and the effect that the Main Street has been able to have on the community. But that's, that's not exactly what I'm concerned about. I'm worried about six months from now and a year from now when the federal funding dries up and when the support from the city that has been so generous and really unique across the country, when that's not available to small business owners anymore because we are on the other side of, of the pandemic. What happens when the exhaustion sets in and the everyday is just too much? What We're gonna see vacancies, we're gonna see closures. Um, the, the problems with uh, that all of my colleagues have already commented on today. I simply echo their concerns. Your and, time has expired. I oh, apologies, but thank you. And thank you. Uh, where, where's Chiquette located along the Main Street? It is in on Wisconsin at 2404. And Slate is on the ground floor and Chiquette is the upper two floors. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to turn next to Anwar Saleem, who's been a long time Main Street. Sorry. Good evening, Councilman Duffy. 
All right. Uh, you, uh, just before you begin, I'm just going to turn, Councilman Pinto, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, as chair of this committee. Okay. Good evening, Councilman McDuffie. Um, my name is Anwar Saleem, the Executive Director of H Street Main Street. Uh, for the past 12 to 15 months, um, it's been, you know, um, really hard for us. My sister and I, and I have not had, had a break since the uh, outbreak of the COVID pandemic. We are consistently operating from a position um, that allow us to service the needs of our businesses. Um, we've had less than 10% of our businesses uh, closed, uh, including WeWorks. Um, some others closed um, permanently, um, about less than 10% closed permanently and others are questionable as we begin to look uh, forward to our future a little differently. Within the same time frame, we were forced to defend our ground and protect our businesses throughout the uprising of the murder of George Ford uh, your office worked with us and other DC council members, the office of the mayor and many agencies work with us to address the needs, uh, many of our needs. The SLBD partnered with us to address the neighborhood and local concerns and issues such as the issuance of personal protection equipment, um, align funds uh, for our many grants, hosting virtual meetings to manage retail and security issues and health and leasing concerns. Many pandemic and uprising exposed Main Street programs to many of our business shortcomings and relationships we need to strengthen between ourselves, the businesses that we serve. Uh, we met many of our businesses um, owners to help them apply for some, uh, some form of assistance. We discovered the hardship that many minority owned businesses had, had applying for district and federal grants and loans because of one unfiled uh, tax returns, inadequate business insurance, expired licenses, the inability to produce financial statements, the absence of organizational structure produced timely paperwork. Through the past year, we assisted businesses with the following, but not limited to uh, leasing adjustments, pocket and street permits, pickup and delivery zone permits, mini grants, open for business signages, PPP loan applications, new ads and promotions, building security and hardening assistance, uh, connecting businesses with DC agencies to resolve uh, various issues, business highlights marketing and um, uh, during the HP Festival, we also created pop-up um, and local federal grant assistance uh, for many of the businesses. Uh, during the time, same time frame, uh, these are some of the, uh, we realized that some of these issues uh, that I'm getting ready to mention, these three issues that need to be addressed immediately, or it's going to really hurt some of our, I mean, about some of our businesses. I'm concerned about our legacy businesses owned by our seniors who have fallen behind on property taxes. If we don't address this issue immediately, we will not only lose their business, but they will also lose their property to tax sales. A few of the, two, a few of the commercial landlords along A Street are voting the landlord and tenant courts and are taking their tenants to civil courts to find relief. I hope it doesn't become a trend. How can this issue be addressed? Three, some, of, some Main Street programs wish to morph into a, a business improvement district uh, type structure. I believe it's time to look into the, uh, into the legislation and find ways to fit us into a structure that would allow, would in time provide us with financial support and need, uh, that is needed for success. No other program in the city has the tools and expertise to bring back our neighborhood commercial district like the Main Street program. We believe that there is no cookie cutter approach to bringing these businesses back online. Through our experience, we know that every quarter is different and unique uh, with unique qualities and, and, and assets. We will need to provide assistance and recommendations according to their strengths, weaknesses, and the type of businesses in need of services. We know that it is much cheaper to retain a good minded business person to either change or improve their business model than to allow them to close because of undercapitalized. Miss, Mr. Saleem, yes, we're, we're a bit over time. If I can just ask you to, to finish up and we can get back during questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to summarize. Well, we expanded our boundaries. We need an additional $100,000 to service Blainberry Road and, um, and Benning Road. And we also need $100,000 to program uh, a public space, the Starburst. Um, other than that, um, the LBD has been great. Uh, we received about $150,000 like the other Main Street programs. And we would like to thank the council and the mayor uh, for their services in promoting and, and uh, supporting H uh, the Main Street programs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Saleem. Um, next, we have Martin Smith, the Executive Director of Barracks Row Main Street. Hi, can you hear me? We can. 
Great. Uh, good afternoon, Councilmember Pinto, members of the committee. My name is Martin Smith. I'm the executive director of Barracks Row, the oldest of DC's Main Street programs. Uh, I'm here today to express my thanks to the city council and uh, the mayor for their continued support of DC's Main Street programs and the important economic development and community building services that they provide. Just like my colleagues that you've already heard from today, when COVID-19 hit last spring, we jumped into action, helping our small business community to access federal and local funds and other resources to adapt to constantly changing rules, regulations, and guidance from public health officials, and to transition to new ways of doing business to meet those new changes. Uh, Barracks Road's experience during the pandemic shows that the investment in small and local neighborhood serving businesses is working. We were fortunate to have already relied heavily on neighborhood traffic rather than tourism or daytime office workers, and our good fortune increased when our neighborhood stepped up and deliberately decided to shop locally and order takeout and do everything that they could to support the commercial corridor with their dollars. As a result, we've been able to weather this storm better than many other commercial corridors, especially those without Main Street programs. We have lost a yoga studio, two restaurants, and a retailer, but we have gained over a dozen new businesses during the pandemic, and several more are about to open this summer. We also completed a $14 million renovation of the Eastern Market Metro Park during the pandemic, meaning we now have a significant public asset now that people are finally able to gather again. While we've been fighting for our businesses, though, our own organization has taken a significant hit from the pandemic. We canceled the entire event season in 2020 and all of our spring events for 2021. We also canceled our annual campaign to raise funds for our program from building and business owners during the crisis. While these were the right things to do, doing so resulted in a significant loss of revenue for our program of over 200,000 unrestricted dollars. That loss of unrestricted income led to significant pay cuts for our own staff and eventually eliminating all of the staff positions except for my own. The assistance that we are able to provide to our small business community is directly proportionate to the resources that we have ourselves. Given that reality, I join my colleagues in asking for an additional $50,000 of unrestricted funds to be added to the existing Main Street programs and an additional $25,000 to be added to the Clean Team funding. The additional Clean Team funding is particularly significant to BRMS given our need for additional services to maintain the city's significant investment in the Eastern Market Metro Park. I also echo the concerns earlier of Charlie Whitaker Increasing the living wage while not increasing the grant that pays for it is an unfunded mandate. The goal of the increases to the living wage is to put more money into the pockets of our city's workers. If we have to reduce hours of, uh, to fit the pay increase within our grant budget, then that doesn't happen. I also echo his concerns about increased costs due to inflation and also insurance requirements from the city. I realize my time is expiring here, so I'll try and sum the rest of this up. Uh, like he mentioned, we also took out a cyber insurance policy this year, not because we needed it, but because we were required to. And the only company that's ever going to benefit from that policy is Chubb Insurance, not our small and local businesses where we could have spent that money. Uh, thank you very much, members of the committee, and a special thank you to Christina Amoruso and Elizabeth Anderson with DSLBD. Without their constant support, we never would have been able to get through the past year. This concludes my testimony, and I'm available to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. Next, we have Wendell Kwan. Wendell Kwan is the director uh, of Destination Congress Heights Main Street Program, Congress Heights Training and Development Corporation. Go ahead, Mr. Kwan. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. All right. Uh, Thank you, uh, members of the committee and currently Chairwoman Pinto. <laughs> uh, it's a, a great opportunity for us to testify. Uh, we, as the other main streets have uh, suggested in terms of baseline budget changes, uh, we support the 50 grand increase for uh, main streets and then also the needed resources uh, the $25,000 baseline increase uh, for the clean teams. We uh, are out in Congress Heights, a community that is seeing some new investment uh, on St. Elizabeth, where Main Street has had a long history uh, of disinvestment. And so budget-wise, uh, we support those baseline increases. Uh, we are kind of first responders uh, for uh, small businesses. Uh, and I think the one-time money uh, that uh, the city is receiving for innovation opportunities should be looked uh, for, for the main streets. And so 
I guess my testimony should have been on the gun bed uh, uh, panel uh, because the types of things that are being done uh, for bids, Main Street's kind of need the same type of innovation. And so I hope uh, that through the leadership of this committee that we could somehow uh, meet soon uh, to talk about uh, innovation ideas. Because uh, <clears throat> we, for example, explored establishing a bid uh, in this area. And the reason we weren't able to do it is because uh, most of the properties are owned by nonprofits uh, and government agencies. And so uh, it would not raise enough to, you know, to support bids. And I wouldn't dare compare uh, Main Street to a biz uh, in terms of uh, the benefits uh, that they're receiving uh, in the budget, but uh, they represent you know, dynamic uh, areas in the city. And I think some of this one-time money should be looked at for innovation uh, along Main Streets. And so, for example, we are one of the few areas in the city that has vacant and blighted properties uh, that could use that innovation money uh, to redevelop, uh, you know, the main street uh, to the quality of the first class city uh, that we live in. And so that's my only suggestion that we have an opportunity as main streets to uh, talk about the one time uh, innovation money that the city is receiving uh, that could really help uh, main streets, particularly those that are disinvested uh, like kind of science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwan. Um, and I think that gets us to the end of this panel. If we've missed you on this panel, if you can put your video on to indicate you have not testified yet. But I think that's it. All right, so I, we'll do a, a five minute round for this panel. And we'll see if any of our other colleagues join us. But I wanna ask um, some of the heads of Main Streets about what your experiences has been this year on two pieces. So first for the robust retail grants, DSLBD awarded about 106 businesses, $7,500 each. And I'm curious to know uh, how many businesses in your respective corridors applied and then received those grants. Um, and then if there's anything else that you wanna share with the committee around outstanding needs that your businesses are reporting now that they're starting to get reopened, whether that's a permitting issue, a fee issue um, that we should be aware of. And so let's start um, with Michelle Malotsky. I'm still on here from the Logan Circle Main Streets. Hi, Council Member Pinto. Um, so about 20 businesses applied for and received uh, the rot robust retail grant, and that's really quite wonderful. My request would be that uh, going forward in the future, there's a way to streamline it and make it easier for businesses to get the grant money. Um, still a lot of businesses struggle with paperwork, and since the district already has a lot of tax information, there really could be a way to just do a very simple even a tax credit or a tax return. Okay, that's that's good feedback. Thank you, um, Carolina. Um, I don't have the exact numbers with me, but I think it was the same at least about twenty. But I do remember um, same as Michelle brought up. I have a lot of minority-owned businesses, and the issue is getting the documents required for any grant application. Um, I know Clean Hands um, Council Member McDuffie um, is working on that, but that is one of the biggest issues when it comes specifically to minority-owned businesses trying to gather the required documents, as well as language access. Um, we have the experience with many other grants where the application would be translated the day it was due or the day before. So, thank you so thank you. much. Um, Ms. Dean from the Glover Park Main Street. Yes, hello. Um, so uh, we did not do great with the robust retail grants. However, um, our corridor was very successful in both the early micro grants and also with the bridge fund. So um, a number of businesses did quite well um, with additional support from the city. 
Glover Park is not uh, really home to a lot of uh, retail per se, clothing retail, things like that. It's something that we're working on. Um, but I, I would say about grant applications and making it easier to access for people. One, if there could be a way to kind of loop in the main street that the party is affiliated with, that is something that would be helpful to us. Also, if there was a feedback loop a strong feedback loop of where who had received money so that we know, so that we're not granting money to someone who may have already received a, a lot of money. And that's kind of across the board for, for all of the grants. Um, but I will say in terms of highlighting issues that are, are forthcoming, I am extremely concerned about vacancies as, as ever and as always. Um, and all of the associated reasons with that that my colleagues have already mentioned here today uh, but I would also say that we um, are concerned about the streeteries and getting permits through not DDOT, but DCRA um, due to the structural nature of the, the structures that we're trying to build right now. We've been working on one for over two months and now we're into summer. And so this business is really at a loss. And um, so anything we could do to improve our communication among all of the different agencies that we work with would be beneficial to the small businesses. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, Zach? Hi, council member, thank you for this question. I know we had roughly a, a half dozen or so businesses um, receive the robust retail and, and like Carolina shared, uh, language access was an issue for some of our, our businesses through the application process. Um, I know we've seen that improve recently with other rounds of grants, so that's a step in the right direction. Um, as I mentioned during my original testimony, right now we have a number of restaurants who are taking advantage of the Streeteries program um, in Cleveland Park, but I know we also have a number of small retailers who would also like to do so and set up sort of outdoor market areas for folks to come outside and take advantage of that space. And right now through the permitting process, they're not allowed to do so. Um, and to our understanding, this has gotten hung up in the executive's office. And we would love to be able to have um, those folks with your help through DZ Council sort of push that through so retailers can have the same uh, permitting rights that restaurants do. Okay, thank you so much. That's helpful. Um, and I'm out of in the own self-prescribed of five minutes. So to try to stick on schedule, I'm going to ask Lee and Edwin and Wendell if you can keep your answers to about 20 seconds each so I can hear from each of you. Um, we'll start with Lee. Thank you so much, council member. Uh, in terms of the robust retail grants, I think we had uh, 10 to 12 in, in Tenley Town, which is about half of the ones in, in Ward 3. Um, and likewise, businesses did well with, with micro grants. Um, and I echo everything that my colleagues have said. So the one thing I wanted to highlight is about commercial rents um, and the issue of those coming due. Um, we have a lot of businesses that have been uh, threatened with illegal lockouts or with landlords that are delaying on implementing payment plans. Um, and without any kind of enforcement mechanism or uh, widespread education, even beyond the main streets about the requirements for payment plans and their rates, uh, I'm very concerned about a lot of businesses that may be on very shaky ground um, as we move into what the city calls the recovery, but they're still grappling with these unpaid bills. And I have business owners that are, you know, they really want to meet their obligations, but they're trying to pay their own personal bills for food and housing um, and are sacrificing those to be able to pay their commercial rent right now. It's such an important issue and we continue to hear concerns about that from businesses across the cities. So thank you for raising that. Uh, Mr. Washington? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I guess in our area, uh, we had about three with the robust retail. We also had about three who had challenges uh, with some of the paperwork, uh, with the uh, clean hands, with the no council member. Uh, McDuffie is championing that area. Um, and uh, But I think that was probably one of the bigger. We also had an issue related to some insurance. Those are key. Um, but that's, that's kind of where we are, I think, uh, just to take only 20 seconds. There you go. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And Mr. Kwan, last but not least. Yes. And so we, all of the programs have been very helpful. Uh, but a lot of our businesses, if we don't provide the technical assistance, they don't apply. Uh, and so the dream grants, we benefit from that also. The major issue is uh, enforcement of different agencies. 
we have open air drug markets and, and lottery that happens and the police watch and, you know, and there's really no enforcement. So that's a major issue that our ANC is taking up. Uh, but, you know, the main street is working with all those groups and stakeholders. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to this entire panel. This has been such a challenging year and we lost almost 300 businesses and it would be many, many more without the support of the main streets and all of your efforts to protect our businesses and provide them the support they need. So we look forward to continuing to work together and be creative as we head to the summer months to try to get our businesses open and up and running. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to transition to the last panel for DSLBD. We'll give everybody a moment. We will have Roscoe Grant, Marsha Birnbaum, Mark Friend, Andrew Shapiro, Eric Spencer, Paul Weinstock, Walden Needham, Nathan KBL, Kahama Wright, Richard Salmon, Deborah Jones, and Alex Krefitz. If you're on from an earlier uh, panel, I know we weren't able to hear from you, so I'd love you to join this panel. You are here. I'll give everybody a moment. And we are going to, um, if we can reset the clock to three minutes, we'll have three minutes. And if I can ask everybody for your help to try to keep it, um, keep your testimony to three minutes as we have many more witnesses to get that through. This is my, my first time standing in as chairing this hearing, so I don't want to interject too much. You can help me out. Um, all right. Do we have Roscoe Grant on here? Present council member. Sorry? Not present. We don't. Okay. Okay. Um, we will start with Marsha Birnbaum from PFFC Downtown DC Public Restroom Initiative. Go ahead, Ms. Birnbaum. Hi. Um, I'm a DC resident, and as you know, I serve as mentor and advisor to PFFC's Downtown DC Public Restroom Initiative. Our research and advocacy both inspire and inform the introduction of Bill 220223, the Public Restroom Facilities Installation Promotion Act of 2018, which was passed by unanimous vote by the DC Council on December 18th, became law in 2019 and went into effect on October 1st of 2019. As a result of the onset of the COVID epidemic in March of last year, implementation of the two pilots uh, provided for two standalone restrooms open 24 seven, the community restroom and center pilot were put on hold. Uh, at that time, the Department of Small and Bus Social Business Development, which was responsible for implementing the second, had made impressive progress in preparing the guidelines to go out to bids who were interested in participating. And it was only logical with COVID resulting in closure of so many facilities to remove funding for the pilot from the 2020 budget. We're pleased to see the pilot now can resume now that the mayor has given permission to all of the establishments to re reopen to 100% to capacity and that the 66,000 removed from the FY 2020 budget has now been reinstated in the 2022 budget. On behalf of our initiative, I'm here to give thanks to council member Madot for introducing this bill, the bill to uh, all of uh, the members of the DC council for unanimously passing it and to Director Whitfield and her staff for enthusiastically up until COVID hit, laying the groundwork for groundwork for instituting it. Uh, now that the COVID restrictions have been lifted, uh, DCBLD can pick up where it left off. So these funds will make it possible for a bid to provide incentives to up to 30 businesses to open their restrooms for the public. Participating businesses will be required to put up a decal indicating that members of the public are welcome to attend. And locations of the businesses along with hours will be made available either on an app at or on the DC government website. People shopping, uh, jogging, going to and from work will benefit from knowing that within the bid boundary, they can find clean, safe restroom nearby. Participating businesses will also benefit in that people coming in to use their restrooms are likely to purchase items. It'll be less poop to scoop in the areas where businesses 
they open their restrooms to the public and less odor from public urination. Uh, so um, in closing, I just want to thank uh, the DC government and the council for their support. We're eager to move ahead and to collaborate in any way we can with DSLBD. I'm attaching to this testimony a description of the London Community Toilet Scheme upon which this is based. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Birnbaum, and thank you for the time um, and, and your effort on this really important initiative. We absolutely need to see more bathrooms and public restrooms throughout our city, and I appreciate your leadership on this. My pleasure. Uh, next, we have Mark Friend, also from the PFFC Downtown DC Public Restroom Initiative. All right. Um, Never mind. Next, we have Andrew Shapiro or Shapiro, uh, who's the owner of K and B Sodas. Hi, I'm here. I'm just driving, so unfortunately, I'm not going to have my video on, but I pulled over. Um, no problem. Just going to read off my testimony. Uh, Chairman McDuffie, Council Members Allen, Che, Gray, and Pinto, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Andrew Shapiro, and I am a 21-year resident of D.C. and the founder owner of k &B Sodas based in Ward 4. I am speaking today to voice my strong support for their funding requests, both for the DSLBD and for the designation of a Petworth Main Street area in the FY 2022 budget and for increased funding for the green teams. And our capacity is a unique, locally grown DC-based small business. We have had a great success working with the DSLBD, as well as great success participating in Main Street programs and working with clients in those corridors. Recently, at the generosity of the North Capitol Main Street, KMB Sodas, KMB Sodas was able to participate in the National Main Street Conference and Workshop, where we were able to network and learn essential strategies for surviving as a small business in the new environment we find ourselves in. When we first launched in late 2015, early 2016, we began working with the Small Business Resource Center in DCRA to navigate the complex and complicated process of launching a small food and beverage business. This was a moment when others across the city were launching similar concepts, and while the regulatory agencies got up to speed and how to properly handle the licensing of food and beverage product, the Small Business Resource Center was very helpful in holding us steady until we were able to obtain a business license. We would also like to thank the Latino Economic Development Center for their assistance in securing and helping us secure a DC micro business grant last summer and for helping us navigate the PPP process and getting PPP funding. They are an invaluable asset to the DC community. Additionally, DSLBD has made us aware of many programs and opportunities for small businesses owners like myself to learn much more and participate in workshops and trainings and to grow as a contributor to the business community. It was through this that we became aware of um, the Coffee and Col Coffee and Capital series, which has been an extremely useful uh, weekly series to learn about um, federal city grant and funding assistance um, and helping to navigate the very tricky waters of being able to stay in business given the realities of the past year. Through the DSLBD, we are now in the process of applying for the Anacostia Impact Fund, which among other things, pairs small business leaders with business graduates at Georgetown to develop the Georgetown Business School to develop some fundamentals and assistance like writing business plans, developing growth strategies and sound accounting practices. On a weekly basis, we sign up for one of the information Zooms offered by the department and feel quite thankful to live in a city with strong resources um, to support the small business community, even if the city itself does not make it easy on small businesses or always financially support it. We are also speaking in support of the Petworth Main Street um, designation area. We have seen the success of the Main Street programs around the city and the vibrancy they have brought to neighborhoods and communities. We remember a time when Main Streets in most places were vibrant and dynamic, and as such, we strongly support the spirit of the program and its mission, and have been proud to work with several Main Streets in the city in support of their programs. One such was the Kennedy Street Festival in 2019, which we are proud to be a vendor at. Petworth is a dynamic community with a rich history and a corridor with unique small businesses that would greatly benefit from this designation. Um, for example, Timber Pizza, who has long been a partner and carried our product, is a vibrant contributor to the community 
and one such business that would benefit. We strongly urge the final budget to include funding for this program and the positive impact it'll have on the Petworth neighborhood and community. We thank you, the committee, for allowing us to speak today and are happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Shapiro, and thank you for your efforts on behalf of your small business and being kind of open-minded about the opportunities before you, especially in this challenging year. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you. And be safe driving. Next, we have Eric Spencer from DC Caucus for Returning Citizens. Council Member Pinto and members of the committee, the DC Democratic Caucus for Returning Citizens is here today today regarding the proposed funding in Mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser's fiscal year 2022 budget addressing return of citizens participation in the District of Columbia's medical marijuana program as owners and operators. While the district is appreciative of the mayor's efforts in recognizing, recognizing the inequity and importance of funding, $300,000 will simply provide for the technical assistance portion of the mayor's proposal from one of several cannabis consulting firms here in the district. To start up an entrepreneurial cost, the mayor touts in her budget require more. Funding in terms of low interest loans and grants would have a greater impact. As is customary, the caucus would like to bring to the attention of this committee that there are tens of thousands of returning citizens living in the district, and a majority of whom pay their first share of taxes. This population has historically been overlooked in the medical marijuana industry here in the district. However, thanks to the chairman and members of this committee, returning citizens are beginning to see a semblance of equity now that they can participate. But mere participation is not enough. Returning citizens, some of whom were successful in the legacy cannabis market, believe that given the opportunity in the legal cannabis market, the results will be the same. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed acute and deep-rooted connections between physical and economic health here in the district. The medical marijuana industry in the district continued to thrive, posting profits and creating wealth for owners and operators who may not reside in the district nor have been incarcerated for marijuana while simultaneously excluding those most impacted directly from the war on drugs. Medical marijuana business owners collectively agreed that business had never been better. These admonitions by current industry participants lead to the conclusion and provide proof that the medical marijuana program in the district is viable, profitable, and here to stay. Providing additional funding to the Department of Small and Local Business Development of five to $10 million with, with the goal of offering low interest and loans and grants to another government program, that being the medical marijuana program, will ensure that the mayor's objective of financial assistance for establishing cannabis business enterprises by assisting district residents, including veterans and returning citizens with startup entrepreneurial resources will be met. A mere 300,000 will not suffice. The caucus believes that the above requested Five to 10 million would be a good starting point for funds available for returning citizens to have a meaningful opportunity to join the medical marijuana program here in the district as owners and operators. The caucus believe that these funds would aid in the anticipated increase of medical marijuana licenses in light of B24-0113, the Medical Cannabis Amendment Act of 2021. This bill currently is before the council and would increase dispensary licenses to 16. The caucus is hopeful that there will be set asides for returning citizens to increase the odds of participation in the district's medical marijuana program at this committee and the council as a whole address the Medical Marijuana Cannabis Amendment Act of 2021. In conclusion, it has not been lost on the caucus, President Biden's stance on adult use cannabis here in the district. President Biden stipulated in his budget that he was against adult use by not removing the appropriations rider that prohibits the district from creating a recreational cannabis program. His stance provides the caucus with more ammunition to argue for the above funding and license set asides so that returning citizens can operate as owners and operators in the district's medical marijuana program. This committee and the council as a whole has a duty to create a level playing field for an industry built on the backs of those who were directly impacted by the war on drugs. Black and brown communities created the culture yet were punished for mere myths of marijuana's effects. Thank you, Councilwoman Pinto, for your continued support for the return of citizen community. Thank you so much, Mr. Spencer, for all of your work and your testimony. I definitely want to circle back when we can ask some questions. Um, it's absolutely outrageous that President Biden's budget continues to include the spending rider over the District of Columbia from an act 
enacting our own adult use cannabis program. Um, but in the meantime, we absolutely need to take every step necessary to ensure that returning citizens are included in the process. There's a lot of potential for making a lot of money in this business and making sure that we do everything we can to overcome the decades long impacts of the war on drugs and the overcriminalization of cannabis that now uh, many people are, are realizing never should have been criminalized in the first place. So thank you for your efforts in that. Um, next, we will have Paul Weinstock from the Clean Team Program. Um, yes, good afternoon. I wanna thank everyone for um, allowing me to participate in this hearing and also thank all the council members that's taking place in this hearing as well. Uh, my name is Paul Weinstock. I'm a returning citizen. I am a contractor with uh, DSLBD with the Clean Team. Also, I am a Ward 5 a C, and I'm the director of State Now Next Generation, which is a nonprofit organization. I want to commend Director Whitfield and the agent for uh, giving me an opportunity as a return of citizen to come out and regain my freedom and become a small business entrepreneur, as well as helping others to provide them with job opportunities. And I would like to uh, speak on some, a couple of issues that uh, Director Whitfield and uh, DSLBD has helped me with along to be successful and just give them, you know, just a, a round of applause for the great work and the great opportunities that they have allowed me. Uh, one of the issues that, um, with, with that I was helped with as far as payment, as far as the COVID-19 cleaning, um, I had several, um, projects where we were doing the cleaning and um, it was an issue with payment. And I and um, Director Whitfield um, helped me a lot to uh, get, get in contact with the right source to retain that payment that uh, was overdue. Also, um, she has helped me and the agency has helped me as well in the workforce development part and by me being able to hire uh, a certain amount of clean team workers, we do uh, train them for workforce development and uh, public speaking and basically customer service to make them be better in uh, their opportunities as far as job related. Also, um, they, um, Dr. Director Whitfield has helped me partner with other agencies um, in the workforce development field. Uh, matter of fact, it was uh, with Building Blocks, the new agency that our wonderful mayor had uh, initiated with Director um, Director uh, Linda Whitfield, I mean, Linda Holly Hopper. So they have allowed me to partner with them to be able to hire a couple of new individuals under the clean team as well. And, and um, also, I, um, they have allowed me to uh, help with actually retaining uh, cleaning this in uh, beautifying DC. And um, I, I really would think that um, if possible that they could be fully uh, funded. This program has been a very helpful program for individuals that need job opportunities. And I think it's a great program. And also I help with the entrepreneurship part of the program, which is SPIRE as well. So I, and, you know, I just wanted to touch on that and you know speak very highly about Director Whitfield and the agency as a whole, and gave me an opportunity to uh, you know become a law-abiding citizen and also some of the council members as well, like Kenya McDuffie, um, Doe, and some of the other agencies from like DYRS, which I contract with, uh, DOES, uh, the one office. And just to name a few, I don't want to take too much time, but I just wanted to a testimony of how a great help yeah. this me as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Weinstock. We are out of time, but I really appreciate that. And I know those agencies and, and members do as well. Okay. Um, next, we have Balden Needham, who is from Congress Heights Training and Development Corporation. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Pinto uh, and members of the committee. Um, my name is Baldwin Needham, Assistant Director for Congress Heights Community Training and Development Corporation. I am here on behalf of our Board of Directors and my Executive Director, 
to provide this testimony in support of this, uh, the Department of Small and Local Business Development. Uh, we partner with DSLBD on several programs, but I'd like to focus your attention today on the clean team programs that we currently partner with this agency on. Um, if you did not notice, uh, the clean teams worked on a regular schedule throughout the pandemic. Um, the services provided under the clean team were de deemed essential and with proper PPE, um, our crew members uh, work to keep the commercial quarters clean. Uh, we manage three of over 30 commercial um, clean teams funded by DSLBD. And I tell you today that this program is one that should always be funded no matter what the cost. On top of the environmental benefits we receive due to cleaning up the commercial corridor, uh, the clean teams also provide jobs for residents, especially our returning citizens, um, who tend to find a lot more difficulty in you know, finding jobs compared to others. Uh, we, look, we, we love working with the DC government, but when it comes to distribution of funds to small organizations by some agencies, it, it can take months which you know, many of us as nonprofits don't have three to six months of, of monies um, sitting around because we have to then be reimbursed 30 days later after submitting an inv invoice. However, DSLBD clean team program, and I'll also add the Main Streets program, have a clear process that I know all clean team service providers um, can say they are appreciative of in relation to receiving payments. Um, up on uh, DSLBD allows us to submit invoices at the beginning of each quarter for a portion of the grant funds. Upon receipt of these funds, uh, we spend down the funds accordingly and, and properly. And on a monthly basis, we submit our expenses in the form of receipts and payroll, um, et cetera, to show actual money spent, which later uh, totals the, the grant receipt. DSLBD understands that not all grantees will spend all the monies and therefore they hold up to 15% you know, of the grant funds as retainage, which is not paid out until all reports, receipts, and invoices have been submitted into QuickBase. Uh, this process helps many nonprofits and even for-profits stay in business and be effective at providing the services that we provide. The team, Director Whitfield, Lincoln, Donnell, Ms. Lauren, Christina, and Elizabeth uh, from both the clean team and Main Street um, setting are awesome at getting contracts drafted, executed, and POs issued as quickly as possible in working with OCFO. Uh, this team understands government to uh, business uh, relationship, and we want to, to say that they're doing a great job at it. Lastly, I would like to add that while DSLBD commercial um, team, clean team program works effectively to the benefit of residents, businesses, and the visitors. I implore you all today to consider providing DSLBD with more funds to for additional residential clean teams, especially east of the river, as for the environmental and health outreach awareness uh, benefits that can come from it. Residential <laughs> clean teams. Um, Mr. Needham. We are very over time. Um, I was giving you a moment with the finally clause, but uh, if you can wrap up. Got it. Okay. Um, it's, we thank you. Uh, we thank DSLBD. And like I said, if it's possible to help them, um, this testimony is written also. So if it's possible to provide them additional funding for residential clean teams, that would mm -hmm. definitely go a long way in helping the communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that and could not agree more. Everyone deserves to live in a clean neighborhood and our clean teams are so instrumental in that effort. Um, next, we have Rahama Wright from Shea Yellin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Council Member Pinto and all the committee members. My name is Rahama Wright and I'm the founder of Shea Yellin, a DC-based shea butter brand. And I'm also the curator of the DC pop-up, which creates retail events on behalf of women and minority makers in DC. Uh, my business, I am proud to say, is a CBE certified business. And today I want to test about, testify about how DSLBD plays a significant role in advocating for small businesses like mine 
And they also provide opportunities that would be much harder for me to tap into without the behind the scenes work of DSLBD. I'll point to a very quick example. Uh, the Golden Triangle bid reached out to me to create a pop-up as part of their Grow Golden program to reactivate retail and provide opportunities for small businesses in downtown DC. And now I'm in a position to help 30 other local brands get their products into a retail space and help them to increase sales over the summertime and hopefully well into the holiday season. Uh, furthermore, I recently received a $640,000 grant from, De from DEMPED to create a manufacturing facility for beauty entrepreneurs in DC in Ward 7. And the advice and support I've received from DSLBD, I can truly say in the words of Maya Angelou, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Uh, the vision behind my beauty maker space is to support other early stage entrepreneurs and create jobs in a very nascent but growing DC beauty industry. Without DSLBD and Director Whitfield and her team working behind the scenes to make these connections for small businesses, I am certain we would continue to be left out of important conversations as we are all trying to build back better and recover from the impacts of COVID-19. I cannot express enough the need for a whole of government approach to supporting SMEs in DC. DSLBD cannot do it alone. And one of the suggestions that I have is that there are stronger relationships between agencies like DOBS and DEMPED and clear collaborations that leverage the best of DC has to offer to support small businesses and make this city truly a business for SME, uh, a city for SMEs. I also want to just lastly recommend that the DC um, Council increase the budget for DSLBD. And I would like to say, why not increase it by $5 million so that our, there are more opportunities for grant funding and access to blended financing for SMEs in the district, and also for the need to provide more resources for technical assistance. So I will stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's right. Um, we always appreciate those specifics. Um, next, we have Deborah Jones, who's the executive director from the Ward 7 Business Partnership. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Pinto, committee and staff. My name is Deborah Jones, and I am the executive director of the Deanwood Heights Main Streets, Inc., now trading as Ward 7 Business Partnership. I have a few brief comments to make and I have submitted a full statement for the record. On behalf of our board of directors and the small businesses that benefit from our Main Street programming, we want to say thank you for our FY 2022 Main Street and Clean Team funding and we appreciate that you were able to hold the amount at the same level as was available for FY 2021. Annual funding from DSLBD allows our organization to continue to provide technical assistance, including grant preparation and coaching, storefront improvements and clean team services to our small businesses. We also want to thank the Stellar team at DSLBD for their assistance and support as we worked our way through the difficulties of FY 2020. In FY 2020, as it all became an emergency situation, our Main Street organizations were instructed to change our budgets to repurpose event funding to supply subgrants to our businesses. Now, as we help our small businesses with this post-emergency period of preservation and recovery, the Main Street organizations need the same kind of operational support we provided small businesses. And an increased amount of unrestricted funding will help with the opportunities we missed in 2020 to raise additional funding for our organizations to operate. We support the request of all of our colleagues for additional Main Street funding, cost of living funding, and service expansion increases for the clean teams. Thank you, thank you DSLBD, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Next, we will have Alex Kreffitz, Main Street Manager of the Chevy Chase Main Street and District Bridges. Thank you very much, Council Member Pinto and all. 
Um, designated last year, the Chevy Chase Main Street supports approximately 60 small businesses and its broader community in Chevy Chase along Connecticut Avenue between Livingston Street and the Chevy Chase Circle. It is one of six DC Main Street programs managed by District Bridges. Um, while Chevy Chase is one of the city's newest main streets, it has a long history of serving both nearby and far reaching communities. Particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, the corridor serves an important role, providing goods and services to residents throughout Northwest DC as one of the primary walking distance destinations to an area that sees limited public transportation service. Beyond its nearby customers, historic locations such as DC's only nonprofit movie theater at the Avalon and signature retail locations like the beloved children's toy store, Child's Play, draw visitors from throughout the DMV and across the, the district's border. In response to the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Chevy Chase Main Street has helped small businesses by providing over $35,000 in small business grant funds, serving as a conduit between businesses, the local ANC and political leaders, as well as the broader community, and assisting businesses with reopening while insurance compliance with the city's updated rules and public health informed guidelines. Today, I am requesting that the district allocate an additional $50,000 to the Chevy Chase Main Street so that we can expand our support to address the particular challenges facing neighborhood businesses as they struggle to reopen and recover. In addition to the many supports we already provide, these funds are urgently needed for projects such as expanding our small business grant program, making use of outdoor public space to host COVID-19 health compliant events and programs to support Chevy Chase businesses, to increase the walkability of the corridor, particularly around pedestrian and bicycle safety crossing the three lanes of vehicle traffic to access the Chevy Chase Circle, and to connect the Main Street and businesses to customers around the Main Street, as well as customers from across the Maryland DC border, whose walking distance commercial needs are served by the Main Street. Without this additional investment by the district in our Main Street corridor, the Chevy Chase neighborhood is at risk of additional vacancies, loss of goods and services, and inadequate infrastructure for visitors to safely visit the corridor. As one of the city's prominent uh, entry points, we hope that the Chevy Chase Main Street can continue to grow and serve both the people living there right now and, and grow to serve future generations that will see it as a crossing way between the district and Maryland. The Main Street is thankful for DSLBD's Main Street grants, as well as the support of Council Member Che and the entire council support of small businesses. With additional support, we aim to maintain the current small business community while working on targeted engagement to cultivate new businesses and enrich the entire area. Thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Kravitz, and for all that you do for our local small businesses. Um, last up on this panel, we will have Gigi Ak Akhlilu, Main Street Manager from U Street Main Street and District Bridges. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member Pinto, members of the committee and staff. I'm Gigi Akhlilu, Neighborhood Program Manager to U Street Main Street, also known as USMS. Designated in fiscal year 2019, we're in the midst of our second year in operations. We continue to appreciate the opportunity that Mayor Bowser and the DC Council created to support a community-based economic development along the historical U Street corridor. USMS is one of the six DC Main Street grant managed by the DC-based nonprofit District Bridges. In response to the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, USMS helped small businesses in the following ways. Assisted 28 individual businesses supported through a total of $78,000 in the USMS funded grants in the past 15 months USMS focused on ensuring equitable access to Main Street supports. For example, the results of these efforts are that nearly 75% of this fiscal year's grants supported women, immigrants, minority, and veteran business owners. Also, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in supporting to business applying for DC and national grants, addressing government licensing and permitting requirements and application disputes, and providing timely and accurate information on new grants, loans, regulatory updates, as well as promotional opportunities. We are anticipating that this level of effort and more will be needed over the coming year to ensure U Street businesses make it through the recovery. I am requesting that district, the district allocate an additional $50,000 in funds to USMS so that we can expand our support to address the particular challenges facing neighborhood businesses as they struggle to reopen and to rebuild. In addition to the many supports that we already provide, additional funds will help us respond to urgent needs such as targeting technical assistance to provide language accessibility through organizations that are culturally sensitive to their stakeholders. Also, one-on-one -on -one outreach to ensure businesses needing strengthening financial systems 
are, mar are matched with organizations that can provide reliable support through ongoing relationships and provide specific new forms of immigrant outreach directly affecting business owners and or employees in the USMS corridor, as many of them are DC residents. And lastly, one-on-one -on -one training and resource pertaining to commercial leases to encourage and empower business owners to negotiate revisions to their existing leases and stay in place through successful lease renewals. Without this additional investment by the district in our Main Street corridor, the U Street neighborhood is at risk of losing not only small and local businesses, but what makes U Street an iconic neighborhood in the nation's capital. Finally, USMS very much appreciates the support provided by DSLBD's DC Main Street grants and the ongoing support of the DC Council to small businesses. With additional support, we will hope to be able to preserve our existing small businesses and support new ones as we thrive past this global crisis. Thank you. And I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Gigi. And thank you to all of our witnesses um, on this panel and who testified today for DSLB. Um, due to time constraints, we're not gonna do a, an additional round of questioning, but really appreciate all of your leadership and partnership and will be extremely instructive for the committee as we move forward and fight for additional funding that we know our small businesses um, across industry types really, really need right now. So thank you all um, and we'll see you soon. We are going to transition now to the Public Service Commission or the PSC. And the mission of the PSC is to serve the public interest by ensuring that financially healthy electric natural gas and telecommunications companies provide safe, reliable, and quality utility services at reasonable rates for District of Columbia residential businesses and government customers. And with that, I'd like to call our next panel of public witnesses. Um, and again, ask if you're not speaking, if you can mute yourself. And we will be hearing today from Mark Rodifer, the Sierra Club DC chapter. Go ahead whenever you're ready, Mark. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Councilmember Pinto. Um, and thank you to the entire committee for holding this hearing today on the Public Service Commission budget. Uh, my name is Mark Rodifer, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Sierra Club. Our top priority is combating climate change. We're a formal party to several cases before the commission where we advocate to uphold the district's climate commitments as the commission is statutorily required to do under the 2018 clean energy law uh, that went through this very committee. In 2018, the commission allowed the Canadian fracked gas supplier Altagas to purchase our local gas utility on the condition that it evolved its business model to support and serve the district's 2050 climate commitments by providing innovative new services and products instead of only relying on selling gas. We understand that part of the commission's responsibility is to ensure financially healthy utilities, not, not for the benefit of the company's shareholders, but to ensure that district residents have reliable service. We believe the role of the commission is not to deny any utility from operating a business, but instead to ensure that the utility business model is consistent with DC's climate commitments. The financial health of a utility should not be at odds with DC's climate commitments. In fact, the utility should be financially healthy because they are meeting DC's climate commitments. And the commission's job is to ensure that that happens. When the company that Alta, the, the company that Alta Gas bought in 2018 is named WGL, which stands for Washington Gas Light. When the company was founded in 1848, its business was providing street lighting with gas. But WGL evolved its business from providing lighting to providing heat for buildings. And it can evolve its business again, continuing to provide building heat through sustainable means, like clean energy micro district heating systems using geothermal energy, industrial scale heat pump networks, and wastewater heat extraction systems. Other utility regulators have approved similar plans. Massachusetts approved an application from the Eversource gas utility to build a network of geothermal heating and cooling systems that will cost homeowners $20 a month or $5 a month for low income households. There is no fuel cost other than the, the small amount of electricity used to power the heat pumps. And this protects ratepayers from severe fluctuations in fossil fuel prices. We understand that DC's gas utility and its Canadian fracked gas parent company have never undertaken such endeavors and would prefer to continue selling fossil fuels. Because of this resistance, it is essential that the commission take proactive leadership in this area. Uh, the, in another area, the Sierra Club was pleased that the commission opened formal case 1167 to guide the utilities towards compliance with DC's climate commitments. 
To ensure DC's climate commitments are met, the commission's budget should include funding for an independent consultant to evaluate any plans from the utilities to ensure they are consistent with DC's climate commitments and to allow the consultant to provide its own proposals to ensure our climate commitments are met. We cannot rely on the utilities alone to plan for meeting our climate commitments. Um, Alta Gas is trying to depreciate its fossil fuel infrastructure spending until 2085, fully 35 years after DC is supposed to reach carbon neutrality. The commission must not allow depreciation of any fossil fuel asset past 2050. Forcing DC ratepayers to bear the cost of imprudent and risky gas investments past 2050 is akin to forcing someone to take out a 30 year mortgage on a home that will likely cease to exist in 15 years. Um, so thank you, uh, Councilmember Pinto, and also to Councilmember McDuffie, who is not here right now for the opportunity to testify today. The Sierra Club appreciates the small steps taken by the commission to date to meet its climate mandate. We believe stronger and more proactive leadership is needed, and we ask this committee to provide the oversight needed to ensure that the district benefits from a proactive public service commission. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Rodifer, for your testimony and your continued leadership in this space. As you note, it's one thing to have goals, but another thing to make sure that those goals are implemented and actionable along the way. Um, so given that this is a budget oversight hearing um, and through your advocacy, we know you're very familiar with the mission of the PSC. If you had control over the PSC budget, what would you be prioritizing? Uh, well, uh, the, the one thing that uh, we think is very important is, is something that um, that I mentioned, which is that the, the Public Service Commission has this formal case um, where it says, you know, the utilities can submit plans for um, how they want to meet DC's climate commitments. Uh, and that's fine. But really, I mean, we can't rely on the utilities alone to do it, especially Alta Gas. They, they put forward what they called a climate business plan, which was a fanciful and unrealistic plan that would cost billions and billions of dollars on top of the billions they want to invest uh, in continued fossil fuel infrastructure. And it wouldn't really do much for climate uh, to move us towards our climate commitments. So, so, you know, asking them to submit a plan like that that's totally unrealistic uh, isn't really going to get us where we need to go. So. So, so, so what we want, we, we think the commission needs to hire an independent consultant, both to evaluate whatever plans from the gas and electric utilities there are, but also to propose its own plans and to use the clean energy DC plan as sort of the roadmap to say, okay, we have the, the outline of how DC wants to achieve carbon neutrality. In addition to clean energy DC, carbon free DC uh, uh, will be released by DOE. I'm not exactly sure when, but at some point in the future, they're still working on that. But using those as the roadmaps and the, and the consultant will say, okay, you need to do this, this, and this. And, 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 you know, I don't know what exactly the independent consultant should be. We want them to be totally independent, you know, not the Sierra Club doing it, not the utilities doing it. Um, someone with expertise who is saying, okay, we know what DC wants to do. We need to figure out how to do it. And, and we want them to come up with specific proposals as well. Um, so, so we think that money in the D, in the PSC budget um, for that is very important. I would also add that, um, you know, the, the, since there's this new climate mandate, you know, the, the commission has always sort of looked at it as, okay, we got, we got cost and we got reliability. And those are the two things that we really care about. Uh, and of course, those two things are both very important. And in no way do we mean they shouldn't focus on those. But the climate commitments need to be up there with those, just as important as them. And we think that they should hire, um, they, they need, they need some, some experts on this, some in-house experts. I mentioned this consultant who wouldn't be in-house, but, but some people who this is their job. Uh, I, I think they were trying to hire an environmental economist. I'm not sure where that stands, um, but we think they need experts on this stuff um, beyond uh, what they currently have. When I say this stuff, I mean how we're actually going to do this, especially with the gas utility, because it's, it's much more difficult to do it with the gas utility than it is with the electric utility. Do it, I mean, achieve our climate commitments. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's a really helpful, um, actionable recommendation. So we appreciate that. Um, due to time, we are gonna move on to the next panel, but I wanna thank you again, Mark, for being here. It's pretty remarkable that you are the only public witness who signed up today um, to testify for the Public Service Commission, which I think says a lot to your passion and commitment to this important commission and, and um, effort. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Pinto. We are going to transition now to the Office of the People's Council. Uh, the Office of the People's Council is an independent agency for the District of Columbia, 
and our government. And by law, the office advocates for consumers of natural gas, electric and telephone services. And OPC represents the interests of district utility ratepayers before DC's Public Service Commission, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Federal Communications Commission, and other utility regulatory bodies and the courts. The office is mandated to conduct consumer education and outreach and may represent individual consumers with complaints related to their utility service and bills. So with that said, I will now call our next panel of public witnesses. And once again, ask that participants mute their microphones when they are not speaking. So first we're gonna have Joshua Wayne, public witness, witness Graylin Presbury, the president of the DC Federation of Civic Associations and Hazel Thomas, the Premier Community Development Corporation. And we will begin with Mr. Wayne. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to share uh, my experience with OPC. Um, I started working with them in um, November of last year. I, I unfortunately can't get into a lot of details about the situation because I'm facing uh, on the verge of litigation with a uh, public utility. Um, I've had a uh, unfortunately very challenging and difficult experience that has spanned multiple years. Um, was not getting uh, sort of responses, and and uh, even though they the this utility had previously uh, admitted responsibility for the uh, the situation, by the time I got to OPC, they were trying to distance themselves and, and deny that they had any that they were the accountable party. Um, you know, I, so again, I, I can't get into a lot of details just because of the, the I'm on the verge of litigation. Um, but I did still want to take a few minutes just to share my experience with OPC. Um, I mean, they were truly a lifeline. Unfortunately, they were not able to get the public utility to settle the matter with me, but it was, certainly was not for lack of trying. Uh, they were extremely generous with their time and very caring. It was a very challenging situation. My wife went through an illness in the middle of our whole ordeal with the utility. Um, so it's been it's been a real strain on our family um, and finding them and, and, and gaining their advocacy, particularly Mr. Stephen Dudek and Ms. Velka Valentine um, on their staff were just incredibly supportive. They spent you know hours and hours working on our case and reaching out to the utility. Um, so I, I just wanted to really advocate on their behalf and, and just say what great, you know, what a great service they provide. Um, you know, it was really great customer service. You know, I, I think I, I'm 100% confident that if they could have brought it to full resolution, they would have, but it really was just more of the stubbornness on, on behalf of the utility company. Um, but they just have really just been very, very uh, just nurturing and support for the whole process. So for, for what that's worth, I just really wanted to share share my experience with the agency. Um, just really could not have been a nicer and kinder group of folks and knowledgeable and really just helped me start to navigate where I needed to get to to at least move it to the next step, um, you know, which is where I am right now. So just wanted, wanted to thank them and, and just get that on the record with the city council. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Wayne. That means a lot and certainly goes a long way when you have someone you know is on your side. So thank you for, for coming here today to testify to that. Thank you. Um, next, we have Graylin Presbury, who's the president of the DC Federation of Civic Associations. Go ahead, Mr. Presbury. Good afternoon, Council Member Pinto and committee members. My name is Graylin Presbury and I am the president of the Fairlawn Citizens Association in Ward 8 and the president of the DC Federation of Civic Associations. I'm glad to testify on behalf of the exemplary work of the Office of the People's Council. OPC resolves utility consumer complaints. OPC educates consumers about the district's utility markets. Through its representation, OPC gives consumers a voice in the utility regulatory process. OPC's advocacy has resulted in improved reliability and quality of utility services throughout the district. OPC's advocacy has helped 
the district's consumers save millions of dollars in utility rates and fees. Plus, with the addition in the last two years of advocacy for DC water consumers, OPC's budget should be approved to ensure the agency has the resources to continue its representation of DC's utility consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Presbury. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And next, we will hear from Hazel Thomas from the Premier Community Development Corporation. Good afternoon, uh, Councilmember Pinto, Councilmember McDuffie, uh, and staff. Uh, my name is Hazel Bland Thomas, and I am uh, the board chairperson for Premier Community Development Corporation, and uh, I'm, which works with the community development in Ward Five. However, my comments have relevance to citizens throughout the District of Columbia. Um, obviously, the economic challenge of COVID-19, a COVID-19 pandemic, is not unique to Ward Five. In fact, the ex economic stress has been exacerbated by economic stress exacerbated by the pandemic may be less visible on neighborhoods like off of Connecticut Avenue, more so than in Ward 7 and 8. But everyone has been deeply hurt by COVID-19 and everybody is hurting now. I respectfully request that the uh, Office of the People, that the District Council provide adequate funding for the Office of the People's Council to carry out its mission for representation and advocacy. Because consumer prices are strike, uh, spiking wildly, the need for OPC's advocacy and assistance is greater now than ever. In fact, the People's Council has done an extraordinary job advocating for the residents of the District of Columbia since 1975. In fact, uh, their advocacy record dates back all the way to 1926. Um, you, I would say that <clears throat> I would say that coupled with its traditional responsibilities since 19 since 2018, OPC has been a consumer advocate for the clients of DC Water Authority. And following the council's passage of the DC Consumer Protection Amendment of 2018, the Office of the People's Council has been an advocacy role was expanded to take care of clients with regards to water. And even with these additional responsibilities, they have provided their legendary high quality service, which has been even more of a challenge during this pandemic. I would like to say that um, now is not the time to constrict OPC's budget, but to increase it. Consumers need it now more than ever before Due to no effort of no cause of their own, uh, families have incomes have dried up and they have no more to no one to turn to but the Office of the People's Council, which they know will do their utmost to help them out of their utility crisis. I hope you will recognize that we're now just beginning to see the light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel. And we need the Office of the People's Council to help us, all income levels, all quadrants of the city, to help us to that tunnel. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them now or in writing later. Thank you for this moment um, and uh, to, uh, to address the council. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Thomas, and thank you to all of the witnesses for testifying. Um, on the I, have submitted, I have submitted written testimony as well. Okay, well, no, not a problem. Thank you. Um, and all the witnesses should make sure they submit their uh, testimony to the committee as well. Um, we are going to move on to the, the final panel, but thank you. Thank you. We lost Mr. Wayne, um, but thank you to all of these panelists for testifying. Um, so this is our final um, testimony of the day that we're going to hear on the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration, or ABRA. Um, ABRA supports the public's health, safety, and welfare through the control and regulation of the sale and distribution of our alcoholic beverages. 
In October 2021, Avra began overseeing the district's medical marijuana program administration and implementing the council's mandate to establish a social equity scoring structure into the medical cannabis program. During the pandemic, Abra has introduced several innovative programs to help businesses, including our streeteries carry out delivery programs for on-premises licenses. Abra was a critical member of the Mayor's Reopen DC task force, um, and we're really appreciative for their partnership throughout this pandemic. So we are going to call our last group of public witnesses. We have KJ Hughes, um, and Eric Spencer from the DC Caucus for Returning Citizens. Oh, and I see we have been rejoined by our esteemed chair of the Business Economic Development Committee, Chairman McDuffie. Thank you for giving me this privilege for a short time and I hand the reins back to you. Well, you know what, you, you, you are handling it so well. I, I didn't want to interrupt, interrupt at all. We were on our last panel, so I, I greatly appreciate you step into this chair. I don't know. Have you have you had an opportunity to chair uh, a hearing before this? I did um, one for the chairman for the committee of the whole uh, about a month ago. Okay. Clearly, but this was much more fun. Clearly experiencing this, and so thank you so much for stepping yeah. in, Councilmember Pinto. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, and we're going to turn it over to the next witness that you've already mentioned. Uh, it was KJ Hughes, who I do not actually. See, so I know I do see Eric Spencer. Uh, and so I'm gonna let Eric Spencer begin with this testimony. You have three minutes and good to see you. Chairman McDuffie, members of the committee, the DC Caucus for Returning Citizens is here again today regarding the proposed funding decrease in Mayor, in Mayor Muriel Browser's fiscal year 2022 budget regarding the District of Columbia's medical marijuana program overseen by the Alcohol Beverage Regulation Administration. The decrease in funding of 84,000 is counterproductive when ABRA has a mandate for community outreach regarding the application and licensing process for returning citizens and other district residents harmed by the war on drugs who may be interested in becoming owners and operators in the district's medical marijuana program. As expressed in earl earlier in testimony concerning the DSLBD, the caucus reiterates to this committee that return of citizens living in the district contribute to the tax rate unequivocally. Return of citizens need the additional outreach to enable them to make informed decisions concerning the application process from the beginning to the end, which can be daunting and overwhelming. The mayor's budget reads in pertinent part, strategic objectives describe what the agency will do at a high level to achieve its mission. These are action-based senses that define what an agency does for its customers, whether the customers are residents or other district agencies and how that improves the district. The third, the third strategic objective is engage in community outreach regarding the licensing process. This particular strategic objective is tantamount to the success, to the success of any returning citizen because a cannabis entrepreneur can a, a, a cannabis entrepreneur cannot be watered down or give mere lip service to such a momentous issue. The returning citizen community humbly requests high level service. The caucus has seen how other states have created separate governing bodies for their medical and adult use program. The district has charged ABRA with the sole responsibility of its medical marijuana program as well as oversight over, over alcohol. Thus, the caucus believes that it should dedicate sufficient resources in the form of specific employees whose main focus is to keep the community engaged and informed on the application licensing process for its medical marijuana program. In a previous hearing attended by the caucus involving ABRA, the chairman of this committee questioned the director of ABRA if it were capable of administering and overseeing the medical marijuana program or should a separate entity be created. Until a separate entity, until a separate governing body is created to oversee the district, district's medical marijuana program, the caucus will request that funding be increased so that ABRA can charge several of its team members the task relating solely to meaningful outreach to the return to citizen community on the application and licensing progress from the beginning to the end. The caucus believes that meeting the mayor's strategic objective of community outreach and the application process for licensing coupled with adequate funding in terms of low interest loans and grants, those that would have doubts about returning citizens participation will become lessened. 
in anticipation of the creation of additional licenses being made available for the return of citizens and others harmed directly by the war on drugs and increase in funding to have is warranted. As reiterated in the testimony presented earlier, the Medical Cannabis Amendment Act of 2021 is currently before the council and would increase dispensary licenses to 16. In conclusion, the caucus requests that this committee restore the proposed $84,000 decrease in funding in the mayor's budget proposal and increase funding to provide ABRA with the resources to engage meaningful and substantial, substantive community outreach regarding the application and license process for its medical marijuana program. ABRA is the only governing body that has the capacity and knowledge to aid return to citizens as they navigate the tumultuous waters of the application and license process. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie, for your continued support for the return to citizen community. And thank you, Mr. Spencer, for uh, the witness testimony that you provided uh, throughout today. We really do appreciate your active engagement of the Committee on Business and Economic Development. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses uh, who joined the Committee on Business and Economic Development today to discuss the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget proposed by the mayor, uh, how available funds could be invested to best support businesses and economic development, and what role the committee should continue to play in ensuring funds are properly invested and that we help uh, businesses, workers get back to work and to reopen uh, the city and recover from this pandemic-induced uh, recession. Uh, special thanks to Councilmember Brooke Pinto uh, for chairing this hearing in my absence. I really do appreciate that and all the members who joined our hearing today. As a reminder, those interested in submitting written remarks for the record may do so by 5 p.m. on Monday, June 7, 2021. Submissions should be emailed to the committee at businesseconomicdevelopment at dccouncil.us. This marks the end of today's public hearing. The committee will convene on Monday, June 7, 2021 at 12 p.m for its next budget oversight hearing on the Public Service Commission, the Office of People's Council, and the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration. The time is now 4.05 p.m. and this budget oversight hearing of the committee is adjourned. Thank you.